The Count of Monte Cristo, Alexander Dumas. Chapter 81 The Room of the Retired Baker. The evening of the day on which the Count of Morcerf had left Dandler's house with feelings of shame and anger at the rejection of the projected alliance, M. Andrea Cavalcanti, curled hair, moustaches in perfect order, and white gloves which fitted admirably, had entered the courtyard of the banker's house in Latchaw Seed Anton. He had not been more than ten minutes in the drawing room before he drew Dandler's aside into the recess of a bow windows, and, after an ingenious preamble, related to him all his anxieties and cares since his noble father's departure. He acknowledged the extreme kindness which had been shown him by the banker's family, in which he had been received as a son, and where, besides, his warmest affections had found an object on which to centre in Mademoiselle Dandler's. Dandler's listened with the most profound attention, he had expected this declaration for the last two or three days, and when at last it came his eyes glistened as much as they had lowered on listening to Morserf. He would not, however, yield immediately to the young man's request, but made a few conscientious objections. Are you not rather young, M. Andrea, to think of marrying? I think not, sir, replied M. Cavalcanti, in Italy the nobility generally marry young. Life is so uncertain, that we ought to secure happiness while it is within our reach. Well, sir, said Dandler's, in case your proposals, which do me honour, are accepted by my wife and daughter, by whom shall the preliminary arrangements be settled? So important a negotiation should, I think, be conducted by the respective fathers of the young people. Sir, my father is a man of great foresight and prudence. Thinking that I might wish to settle in France, he left me at his departure, together with the papers establishing my identity, a letter promising, if he approved of my choice. 150,000 livres per annum from the day I was married. So far as I can judge, I suppose this to be a quarter of my father's revenue. I, said Dandler's, have always intended giving my daughter 500,000 francs as her dowry, she is. Besides, my sole heiress. All would then be easily arranged if the baroness and her daughter are willing. We should command an annuity of 175,000 livres. Supposing, also, I should persuade the Marquis to give me my capital, which is not likely but still is possible, we would place these two or three millions in your hands, whose talent might make it realize ten percent, I never give more than four percent, and generally only three and a half, but to my son-in-law I would give five, and we would share the profit. Very good, father-in-law, said Cavalcanti, yielding to his low-born nature, which would escape sometimes through the aristocratic gloss with which he sought to conceal it. Correcting himself immediately, he said, Excuse me, sir, Hope alone makes me almost mad, what will not reality do, but, said Dandler's, who, on his part, did not perceive how soon the conversation, which was at first disinterested, was turning to a business transaction, there is, doubtless, a part of your fortune your father could not refuse you, which, asked the young man, that you inherit from your mother, truly, from my mother, Leonora Corsnari, how much may it amount to, indeed, sir, said Andrea. I assure you I have never given the subject a thought, but I suppose it must have been at least two millions. Dandler's felt as much overcome with joy as the miser who finds a lost treasure, or as the shipwrecked mariner who feels himself on solid ground instead of in the abyss which he expected would swallow him up. Well, sir, said Andrea, bowing to the banker respectfully, may I hope? You may not only hope, said Dandler's, but consider it a settled thing, if no obstacle arises on your part, I am, indeed, rejoiced said Andrea. But, said Dandler's thoughtfully, how is it that your patron, M. de Monte Cristo, did not make his proposal for you? Andrea blushed imperceptibly. I have just left the Count, sir, said he, he is, doubtless, a delightful man but inconceivably peculiar in his ideas. He esteems me highly. He even told me he had not the slightest doubt that my father would give me the capital instead of the interest of my property. He has promised to use his influence to obtain it for me. But he also declared that he never had taken on himself the responsibility of making proposals for another. And he never would. I must, however, do him the justice to add that he assured me if ever he had regretted the repugnance he felt to such a step it was on this occasion, because he thought the projected union would be a happy and suitable one. Besides, if he will do nothing officially, he will answer any questions you propose to him. And now, continued he, with one of his most charming smiles, Having finished talking to the father-in-law, I must address myself to the banker, and what may you have to say to him? Said Dandler's, laughing in his turn, that the day after tomorrow I shall have to draw upon you for about four thousand francs, but the Count, 
expecting my bachelor's revenue could not suffice for the coming month's outlay, has offered me a draft for 20,000 francs. It bears his signature, as you see, which is all sufficient. Bring me a million such as that, said Dantlers, I shall be well pleased, putting the draft in his pocket. Fix your own hour for tomorrow, and my cashier shall call on you with a check for 80,000 francs. At 10 o'clock then, if you please, I should like it early, as I am going into the country tomorrow. Very well, at 10 o'clock, you are still at the Hotel des Princes? Yes, the following morning, with the banker's usual punctuality. The 80,000 francs were placed in the young man's hands as he was on the point of starting, after having left 200 francs for Cadreus. He went out chiefly to avoid this dangerous enemy, and returned as late as possible in the evening. But scarcely had he stepped out of his carriage when the porter met him with a parcel in his hand. Sir, said he, that man has been here, what man? said Andrea carelessly, apparently forgetting him whom he but too well recollected. Him to whom your excellency pays that little annuity, oh! said Andrea, my father's old servant. Well, you gave him the two hundred francs I had left for him? Yes, your excellency. Andrea had expressed a wish to be thus addressed. But, continued the porter, he would not take them. Andrea turned pale, but as it was dark his pallor was not perceptible. What? He would not take them? said he with slight emotion. No, he wished to speak to your excellency. I told him you were gone out, and after some dispute he believed me and gave me this letter, which he had brought with him already sealed. Give it me, said Andrea, and he read by the light of his carriage lamp, You know where I live, I expect you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Andrea examined it carefully, to ascertain if the letter had been opened, or if any indiscreet eyes had seen its contents. But it was so carefully folded, that no one could have read it, and the seal was perfect. Very well, said he. Poor man, he is a worthy creature. He left the porter to ponder on these words, not knowing which most to admire the master or the servant. Take out the horses quickly, and come up to me, said Andrea to his groom. In two seconds the young man had reached his room and burnt Cadreus's letter. The servant entered just as he had finished. You are about my height, Pierre, said he, I have that honor, your excellency. You had a new livery yesterday, yes, sir. I have an engagement with a pretty little girl for this evening, and do not wish to be known. Lend me your livery till tomorrow. I may sleep, perhaps at an inn. Pierre obeyed. Five minutes after, Andrea left the hotel, completely disguised, took a cabriolet, and ordered the driver to take him to the Cheval Rouge, at Picpus. The next morning he left that inn as he had left the Hotel des Princes, without being noticed, walked down the Faubourg Street Antoine, along the boulevard to Rumanil Montant, and stopping at the door of the third house on the left looked for some one of whom to make inquiry in the porter's absence. For whom are you looking, my fine fellow? asked the fruitress on the opposite side. Monsieur Palatin, if you please, my good woman, replied Andrea. A retired baker? asked the fruitress. Exactly. He lives at the end of the yard, on the left, on the third story. Andrea went as she directed him, and on the third floor he found a hare's paw, which, by the hasty ringing of the bell, it was evident he pulled with considerable ill temper. A moment after Cadreus's face appeared at the grating in the door. Ah, you are punctual said he, as he drew back the door. Confound you and your punctuality, said Andrea, throwing himself into a chair in a manner which implied that he would rather have flung it at the head of his host. Come, come, my little fellow, don't be angry. See, I have thought about you, look at the good breakfast we are going to have, nothing but what you are fond of. Andrea, indeed, inhaled the scent of something cooking which was not unwelcome to him, hungry as he was. It was that mixture of fat and garlic peculiar to provincial kitchens of an inferior order, added to that of dried fish, and above all, pungent smell of musk and cloves. These odors escaped from two deep dishes which were covered and placed on a stove, and from a copper pan placed in an old iron pot. In an adjoining room Andrea saw also a tolerably clean table prepared for two, two bottles of wine sealed, the one with green, the other with yellow, a supply of brandy in a decanter, and a measure of fruit in a cabbage leaf cleverly arranged on an earthenware plate. What do you think of it, my little fellow? said Cadreus. Eh, that smells good. You know I used to be a famous cook. Do you recollect how you used to lick your fingers? You were among the first who tasted any of my dishes, and I think you relished them tolerably. While speaking, Cadreus went on peeling a fresh supply of onions. But, said Andrea, ill-temperedly, by my faith, if it was only to breakfast with you, that you disturbed me, I wish the devil had taken you, my boy, 
said Kadra Us sententiously, one can talk while eating. And then, you ungrateful being, you are not pleased to see an old friend? I am weeping with joy. He was truly crying, but it would have been difficult to say whether joy or the onions produced the greatest effect on the lacrimal glands of the old innkeeper of the Pont du Gard. Hold your tongue, hypocrite, said Andrea, you love me. Yes, I do, or may the devil take me. I know it is a weakness, said Kadra Us, but it overpowers me, and yet it has not prevented your sending for me to play me some trick. Come, said Kadra Us, wiping his large knife on his apron, if I did not like you, do you think I should endure the wretched life you lead me? Think for a moment. You have your servant's clothes on, you therefore keep a servant, I have none, and am obliged to prepare my own meals. You abuse my cookery because you dine at the table d'hote of the Hotel des Princes, or the Café de Paris. Well, I too could keep a servant, I too could have a Tilbury, I too could dine where I like, but why do I not? Because I would not annoy my little Benedetto. Come, just acknowledge that I could, eh? This address was accompanied by a look which was by no means difficult to understand. Well, said Andrea, admitting your love, why do you want me to breakfast with you? That I may have the pleasure of seeing you, my little fellow. What is the use of seeing me after we have made all our arrangements, eh, dear friend? said Kadra Us, are wills ever made without codicils? But you first came to breakfast, did you not? Well, sit down, and let us begin with these pilchards, and this fresh butter, which I have put on some vine leaves to please you, wicked one. Ah, yes, you look at my room, my four straw chairs, I images, three francs each. But what do you expect? This is not the Hotel des Princes, come, you are growing discontented, you are no longer happy, you who only wish to live like a retired baker. Kadra Ous sighed. Well, what have you to say? You have seen your dream realized, I can still say it is a dream, a retired baker, my poor Benedetto, is rich, he has an annuity, well, you have an annuity, I have, yes, since I bring you your two hundred francs. Kadra Ous shrugged his shoulders. It is humiliating, said he, thus to receive money given grudgingly, an uncertain supply which may soon fail. You see I am obliged to economize, in case your prosperity should cease. Well, my friend, fortune is inconstant, as the chaplain of the regiment said. I know your prosperity is great, you rascal, you are to marry the daughter of Danglas. What? Of Danglas? Yes, to be sure, must I say Baron Danglas? I might as well say Count Benedetto. He was an old friend of mine and if he had not so bad a memory he ought to invite me to your wedding, seeing he came to mine. Yes, yes to mine, gad, he was not so proud then. He was an underclerk to the good M. Moral. I have dined many times with him and the Count of Morcerf, so you see I have some high connections and were I to cultivate them a little, we might meet in the same drawing rooms. Come, your jealousy represents everything to you in the wrong light. That is all very fine, Benedetto my own, but I know what I am saying. Perhaps I may one day put on my best coat, and presenting myself at the great gate, introduce myself. Meanwhile let us sit down and eat. Kadra Us set the example and attacked the breakfast with good appetite, praising each dish he set before his visitor. The latter seemed to have resigned himself, he drew the corks, and partook largely of the fish with the garlic and fat. Ah, mate, said Kadra Us, you are getting on better terms with your old landlord. Faith, yes, replied Andrea, whose hunger prevailed over every other feeling, so you like it, you rogue? so much that I wonder how a man who can cook thus can complain of hard living. Do you see, said Kadra Us, all my happiness is marred by one thought. What is that? That I am dependent on another, I who have always gained my own livelihood honestly. Do not let that disturb you, I have enough for two. No, truly, you may believe me if you will, at the end of every month I am tormented by remorse. Good Kadra Us, so much so, that yesterday I would not take the two hundred francs. Yes, you wished to speak to me. But was it indeed remorse, tell me? True remorse, and, besides, an idea had struck me. Andrea shuddered, he always did so at Kadra Us's ideas. It is miserable, do you see, always to wait till the end of the month. Oh, said Andrea philosophically, determined to watch his companion narrowly, does not life pass in waiting? Do I, for instance, fare better? Well, I wait patiently, do I not? Yes, because instead of expecting two hundred wretched francs, you expect five or six thousand, perhaps ten, perhaps even twelve, for you take care not to let anyone know the utmost. Down there, 
You always had little presents and Christmas boxes which you tried to hide from your poor friend Kadraus. Fortunately he is a cunning fellow, that friend Kadraus. The you are beginning again to ramble, to talk again and again of the past. But what is the use of teasing me with going all over that again? Ah, you are only one and twenty, and can forget the past, I am fifty, and am obliged to recollect it. But let us return to business, yes, I was going to say, if I were in your place dash, well, I would realize dash, how would you realize, I would ask for six months in advance, under pretense of being able to purchase a farm, then with my six months I would decamp, well, well, said Andrea, that isn't a bad idea, my dear friend, said Kadraus, eat of my bread, and take my advice, you will be none the worse off, physically or morally, but, said Andrea, why do you not act on the advice you gave me? Why do you not realize a six months, a year's advance even, and retire to Brussels? Instead of living the retired baker, you might live as a bankrupt, using his privileges, that would be very good, but how the devil would you have me retire on twelve hundred francs? Ah, Cadraus, said Andrea, how covetous you are. Two months ago you were dying with hunger. The appetite grows by what it feeds on, said Cadraus, grinning and showing his teeth like a monkey laughing or a tiger growling. And, added he, biting off with his large white teeth an enormous mouthful of bread, I have formed a plan. Kadraus's plans alarmed Andrea still more than his ideas, ideas were but the germ. The plan was reality. Let me see your plan, I dare say it is a pretty one, why not? Who formed the plan by which we left the establishment of M- Eh? Was it not I? And it was no bad one I believe, since here we are, I do not say, replied Andrea, that you never make a good one, but let us see your plan, well, pursued Kadraus, can you without expending one sou, put me in the way of getting fifteen thousand francs? No, fifteen thousand are not enough, I cannot again become an honest man with less than thirty thousand francs, no, replied Andrea, dryly, no, I cannot, I do not think you understand me, replied Kadraus, calmly, I said without your laying out a sou, do you want me to commit a robbery? to spoil all my good fortune, and yours with mine, and both of us to be dragged down there again? It would make very little difference to me, said Kadraus, if I were retaken, I am a poor creature to live alone, and sometimes pine for my old comrades, not like you, heartless creature, who would be glad never to see them again. Andrea did more than tremble this time, he turned pale, come, Kadraus, no nonsense, said he, don't alarm yourself, my little Benedetto, but just point out to me some means of gaining those thirty thousand francs without your assistance, and I will contrive it. Well, I'll see, I'll try to contrive some way, said Andrea. Meanwhile you will raise my monthly allowance to five hundred francs, my little fellow. I have a fancy, and mean to get a housekeeper. Well, you shall have your five hundred francs, said Andrea, but it is very hard for me, my poor Kadraus, you take it advantage dash. Bah, said Kadraus when you have access to countless stores. One would have said Andrea anticipated his companion's words, so did his eye flash like lightning, but it was but for a moment. True, he replied, and my protector is very kind. That dear protector, said Kadraus, and how much does he give you monthly? Five thousand francs, as many thousands as you give me hundreds. Truly, it is only bastards who are thus fortunate. Five thousand francs per month. What the devil can you do with all that? Oh, it is no trouble to spend that, and I am like you, I want capital, capital, yes, I understand, everyone would like capital, well, and I shall get it, who will give it to you, your prince, yes, my prince, but unfortunately I must wait, you must wait for what? asked Kadraus, for his death, the death of your prince, yes, how so, because he has made his will in my favor, indeed, on my honor, for how much, for five hundred thousand, only that? it's little enough. But so it is. No it cannot be. Are you my friend, Kadraus? Yes, in life or death. Well, I will tell you a secret. What is it? But remember dash, ah, party, mute as a carp. Well, I think, Andrea stopped and looked around. You think? Do not fear, party, we are alone. I think I have discovered my father, your true father? Yes, not old Cavalcanti. No, for he has gone again, the true one, as you say and that further is dash, well, Kadraus, it is Monte Cristo, ah, yes, you understand, that explains all, he cannot acknowledge me openly, it appears, but he does it through M. Cavalcanti, and gives him fifty thousand francs for it, fifty thousand francs for being your father, 
I would have done it for half that, for twenty thousand, a fifteen thousand, why did you not think of me, ungrateful man? Did I know anything about it, when it was all done when I was down there, R, truly? And you say that by his will dash, he leaves me five hundred thousand levers, are you sure of it? He showed it me. But that is not all, there is a codicil, as I said just now, probably. And in that codicil he acknowledges me, oh, the good father, the brave father, the very honest father, said Kadraus, twirling a plate in the air between his two hands. Now say if I conceal anything from you, no, and your confidence makes you honorable in my opinion, and your princely father, is he rich, very rich? Yes, he is that, he does not himself know the amount of his fortune. Is it possible? It is evident enough to me, who am always at his house. The other day a banker's clerk brought him fifty thousand francs in a portfolio about the size of your plate. Yesterday his banker brought him a hundred thousand francs in gold. Kadraus was filled with wonder, the young man's words sounded to him like metal, and he thought he could hear the rushing of cascades of Louis. And you go into that house? cried he briskly, when I like. Kadraus was thoughtful for a moment. It was easy to perceive he was revolving some unfortunate idea in his mind. Then suddenly, how I should like to see all that, cried he, how beautiful it must be. It is, in fact, magnificent said Andrea, and does he not live in the champs Elys? eh, yes, number thirty, ah, said Cadraus, number thirty, yes, a fine house standing alone, between a courtyard and a garden, you must know it, possibly, but it is not the exterior I care for, it is the interior, what beautiful furniture there must be in it, have you ever seen the Tuileries, no, well, it surpasses that, it must be worth one's while to stoop, Andrea, when that good M. Monte Cristo lets fall his purse, it is not worth while to wait for that, said Andrea, money is as plentiful in that house as fruit in an orchard. But you should take me there one day with you, how can I? On what plea, you are right, but you have made my mouth water. I must absolutely see it, I shall find a way, no nonsense, Cadraus, I will offer myself as floor polisher. The rooms are all carpeted, well, then, I must be contented to imagine it, that is the best plan, believe me, try, at least to give me an idea of what it is, how can I, nothing is is yeah. Is it large, middling, how is it arranged, faith, I should require pen, ink, and paper to make a plan, they are all here, said Cadraus, briskly. He fetched from an old secretary a sheet of white paper and pen and ink. Here, said Cadraus, draw me all that on the paper, my boy. Andrea took the pen with an imperceptible smile and began. The house, as I said, is between the court and the garden. In this way, do you see? Andrea drew the garden, the court in the house. High walls? Not more than eight or ten feet. That is not prudent, said Cadraus. In the court are orange trees in pots, turf, and clumps of flowers. And no steel traps? No. The stables? Are on either side of the gate, which you see there. And Andrea continued his plan. Let us see the ground floor, said Cadraus. On the ground floor, dining room, two drawing rooms, billiard room staircase in the hall, and a little back staircase, windows, magnificent windows, so beautiful, so large, that I believe a man of your size should pass through each frame, why the devil have they any stairs with such windows, luxury has everything, but shutters, yes, but they are never used, that Count of Monte Cristo is an original, who loves to look at the sky even at night, and where do the servants sleep, oh, they have a house to themselves, picture to yourself a pretty coach house at the right hand side where the ladders are kept. Well, over that coach house are the servants' rooms, with bells corresponding with the different apartments. Ah, Diabol, bells did you say? What do you mean? Oh, nothing. I only say they cost a load of money to hang, and what is the use of them, I should like to know. There used to be a dog let loose in the yard at night, but it has been taken to the house at Ortwil, to that you went to, you know. Yes, I was saying to him only yesterday. You are imprudent, Monsieur Count, for when you go to Ortwell and take your servants the house is left unprotected. Well, said he, what next? Well, next, some day you will be robbed. What did he answer? He quietly said, what do I care if I am, Andrea? He has some secretary with a spring, how do you know? Yes, which catches the thief in a trap and plays a tune. I was told there was such at the last exhibition. He has simply a mahogany secretary, in which the key is always kept and he is not robbed, no, his servants are all devoted to him, there ought to be some money in that secretary, there may be, no one knows what there is, and where is it, on the first floor, 
Sketch me the plan of that floor, as you have done of the grand floor, my boy. That is very simple. Andrea took the pen. On the first story, do you see, there is the ante-room and the drawing room, to the right of the drawing room, a library and a study, to the left, a bedroom and a dressing room. The famous secretary is in the dressing room. Is there a window in the dressing room? Two, one here and one there. Andrea sketched two windows in the room, which formed an angle on the plan, and appeared as a small square added to the rectangle of the bedroom. Cadraus became thoughtful. Does he often go to Autoil? Added he, two or three times a week. Tomorrow, for instance, he is going to spend the day and night there, are you sure of it? He has invited me to dine there. There's a life for you, said Cadraus, a town house and a country house. That is what it is to be rich, and shall you dine there? Probably, when you dine there, do you sleep there? If I like, I am at home there. Cadraus looked at the young man, as if to get at the truth from the bottom of his heart. But Andrea drew a cigar case from his pocket, took a Havana, quietly lit it, and began smoking. When do you want your twelve hundred francs? Said he to Cadraus. Now, if you have them. Andrea took five and twenty louis from his pocket, yellow boys? Said Cadraus. No. I thank you, oh, you despise them, on the contrary, I esteem them, I will not have them, you can change them, idiot, gold is worth five sous, exactly, and he who changes them will follow friend Cadraus, lay hands on him, and demand what farmers pay him their rent in gold, no nonsense, my good fellow, silver simply, round coins with the head of some monarch or other on them, anybody may possess a five franc piece, but do you suppose I carry five hundred francs about with me? I should want a porter, well, leave them with your porter, he is to be trusted. I will call for them, today, no, tomorrow, I shall not have time today, well, tomorrow I will leave them when I go to Ortville, may I depend on it, certainly, because I shall secure my housekeeper on the strength of it, now see here, will that be all? Eh? And will you not torment me any more? Never. Cadraus had become so gloomy that Andrea feared he should be obliged to notice the change. He redoubled his gaiety and carelessness. How sprightly you are, said Cadraus, one would say you were already in possession of your property. No, unfortunately, but when I do obtain a dash, well, I shall remember old friends, I can tell you that, yes, since you have such a good memory, what do you want? It looks as if you were trying to fleece me, I? What an idea. I, who am going to give you another piece of good advice, what is it? To leave behind you the diamond you have on your finger. We shall both get into trouble. You will ruin both yourself and me by your folly, how so? Said Andrea, how? You put on a livery, you disguise yourself as a servant, and yet keep a diamond on your finger worth four or five thousand francs, you guess well, I know something of diamonds, I have had some, you do well to boast of it, said Andrea, who, without becoming angry, as Cadraus feared, at this new extortion, quietly resigned the ring. Cadraus looked so closely at it that Andrea well knew that he was examining to see if all the edges were perfect. It is a false diamond, said Cadraus. You are joking now, replied Andrea. Do not be angry, we can try it. Cadraus went to the window, touched the glass with it, and found it would cut. Confitia, said Cadraus, putting the diamond on his little finger. I was mistaken, but those thieves of jewelers imitate so well that it is no longer worthwhile to rob a jeweler's shop. It is another branch of industry, paralyzed. Have you finished? Said Andrea. Do you want anything more? Will you have my waistcoat or my hat? Make free. Now you have begun. No, you are, after all, a good companion. I will not detain you, and will try to cure myself of my ambition. But take care the same thing does not happen to you in selling the diamond you feared with the gold. I shall not sell it. Do not fear. Not at least till the day after tomorrow, thought the young man. Happy rogue, said Cadraus. You are going to find your servants, your horses, your carriage, and your betrothed. Yes, said Andrea. Well, I hope you will make a handsome wedding present the day you marry Mademoiselle Danglas. I have already told you it is a fancy you have taken in your head. What fortune has she? But I tell you dash, a million? Andrea shrugged his shoulders. Let it be a million, said Cadraus. You can never have so much as I wish you. Thank you, said the young man. Oh, I wish it you with all my heart added Cadraus with his hoarse laugh. Stop, let me show you the way. It is not worthwhile. Yes, it is. Why? Because there is a little secret, a precaution I thought it desirable to take. One of Hurit and Fitch's locks, revised and improved by Gaspard Cadraus, I will manufacture you a similar one when you are a capitalist. Thank you, said Andrea, 
I will let you know a week beforehand. They parted. Kadraus remained on the landing until he had not only seen Andrea go down the three stories, but also cross the court. Then he returned hastily, shut his door carefully, and began to study, like a clever architect, the plan Andrea had left him. Dear Benedetto, said he, I think he will not be sorry to inherit his fortune, and he who hastens the day when he can touch his five hundred thousand will not be his worst friend. Chapter 82 The Burglary The day following that on which the conversation we have related took place, the Count of Monte Cristo set out for Ortwil, accompanied by Ali and several attendants, and also taking with him some horses whose qualities he was desirous of ascertaining. He was induced to undertake this journey, of which the day before he had not even thought and which had not occurred to Andrea either, by the arrival of Batasio from Normandy with intelligence respecting the house and sloop. The house was ready, and the sloop which had arrived a week before lay at anchor in a small creek with her crew of six men who had observed all the requisite formalities and were ready again to put to sea. The Count praised Batasio's zeal, and ordered him to prepare for a speedy departure, as his stay in France would not be prolonged more than a month. Now, said he, I may require to go in one night from Paris to Treport, let eight fresh horses be in readiness on the road, which will enable me to go fifty leagues in ten hours. Your Highness had already expressed that wish, said Batasio, and the horses are ready. I have bought them and stationed them myself at the most desirable posts, that is, in villages, where no one generally stops. That's well, said Monte Cristo, I remain here a day or two, arrange accordingly. As Batasio was leaving the room to give the requisite orders, Baptistin opened the door. He held a letter on a silver waiter. What are you doing here? Asked the Count, seeing him covered with dust. I did not send for you, I think. Baptistin, without answering, approached the Count, and presented the letter. Important and urgent, said he. The Count opened the letter, and read, Dash, M. De Monte Cristo is apprised that this night a man will enter his house in the Champs Elysees with the intention of carrying off some papers supposed to be in the secretary in the dressing room. The Count's well known courage will render unnecessary the aid of the police, whose interference might seriously affect him who sends this advice. The Count, by any opening from the bedroom, or by concealing himself in the dressing room, would be able to defend his property himself many attendants or apparent precautions would prevent the villain from the attempt, and M. de Monte Cristo would lose the opportunity of discovering an enemy whom chance has revealed to him who now sends this warning to the Count, a warning he might not be able to send another time, if this first attempt should fail and another be made. The Count's first idea was that this was an artifice, a gross deception, to draw his attention from a minor danger in order to expose him to a greater. He was on the point of sending the letter to the commissary of police, notwithstanding the advice of his anonymous friend, or perhaps because of that advice, when suddenly the idea occurred to him that it might be some personal enemy, whom he alone should recognize and over whom, if such were the case, he alone would gain any advantage, as Fisco had done over the more who would have killed him. We know the Count's vigorous and daring mind, denying anything to be impossible, with that energy which marks the great man. From his past life, from his resolution to shrink from nothing, the Count had acquired an inconceivable relish for the contests in which he had engaged, sometimes against nature, that is to say, against God, and sometimes against the world, that is, against the devil. The Genoese conspirator, they do not want my papers, said Monte Cristo. They want to kill me, they are no robbers, but assassins. I will not allow the Prefect of Police to interfere with my private affairs. I am rich enough, forsooth, to distribute his authority on this occasion. The Count recalled Baptistin who had left the room after delivering the letter. Return to Paris, said he, assemble the servants who remain there. I want all my household at Ordwill, but will no one remain in the house, my lord? Asked Baptistin. Yes, the porter. My lord will remember that the lodge is at a distance from the house. Well, the house might be stripped without his hearing the least noise. By whom? By thieves. You are a fool, M. Baptistin. Thieves might strip the house, it would annoy me less than to be disobeyed. Baptistin bowed, you understand me? said the Count. Bring your comrades here, one and all, but let everything remain as usual, only close the shutters of the ground floor, and those of the second floor, you know they are never closed. Go. The Count signified his intention of dining alone, and that no one but Ali should attend him. Having dined with his usual tranquility and moderation, the Count, making a signal to Ali to follow him, went out by the side gate and on reaching the boys de Boulogne and, apparently without design towards Paris and at twilight, found himself opposite his house in the Champs-Élysées. All was dark, one solitary, 
feeble light was burning in the porter's lodge, about forty paces distant from the house, as Baptistin had said. Monte Cristo leaned against a tree, and with that scrutinizing glance which was so rarely deceived, looked up and down the avenue, examined the passers-by, and carefully looked down the neighboring streets, to see that no one was concealed. Ten minutes passed thus, and he was convinced that no one was watching him. He hastened to the side door with Ali, entered hurriedly, and by the servant's staircase, of which he had the key, gained his bedroom without opening or disarranging a single curtain, without even the porter having the slightest suspicion that the house, which he supposed empty, contained its chief occupant. Arrived in his bedroom, the Count motioned to Ali to stop, then he passed into the dressing room, which he examined. Everything appeared as usual, the precious secretary in its place, and the key in the secretary. He double-locked it, took the key, returned to the bedroom door, removed the double staple of the bolt, and went in. Meanwhile Ali had procured the arms the Count required, namely, a short carbine and a pair of double-barreled pistols, with which as sure an aim might be taken as with a single-barreled one. Thus armed, the Count held the lives of five men in his hands. It was about half-past nine. The Count and Ali ate in haste a crust of bread and drank a glass of Spanish wine, then Monte Cristo slipped aside one of the movable panels, which enabled him to see into the adjoining room. He had within his reach his pistols and carbine, and Ali, standing near him, held one of the small Arabian hatchets, whose form has not varied since the Crusades. Through one of the windows of the bedroom, on a line with that in the dressing room, the Count could see into the street. Two hours passed thus. It was intensely dark, still Ali, thanks to his wild nature, and the Count, thanks doubtless to his long confinement, could distinguish in the darkness the slightest movement of the trees. The little light in the lodge had long been extinct. It might be expected that the attack, if indeed an attack was projected, would be made from the staircase of the ground floor, and not from a window, in Monte Cristo's opinion, the villain sought his life, not his money. It would be his bedroom they would attack, they must reach it by the back staircase, or by the window in the dressing room. The clock of the Invalides struck a quarter to twelve, the west wind bore on its moistened gusts the doleful vibration of the three strokes. As the last stroke died away, the Count thought he heard a slight noise in the dressing room. This first sound, or rather this first grinding, was followed by a second, then a third, at the fourth, the Count knew what to expect. A firm and well-practiced hand was engaged in cutting the four sides of a pane of glass with a diamond. The Count felt his heart beat more rapidly. Inured as men may be to danger, forewarned as they may be of peril, they understand, by the fluttering of the heart and the shuddering of the frame, the enormous difference between a dream and a reality, between the project and the execution. However, Monte Cristo only made a sign to a prize alley, who, understanding that danger was approaching from the other side, drew nearer to his master. Monte Cristo was eager to ascertain the strength and number of his enemies. The window whence the noise proceeded was opposite the opening by which the Count could see into the dressing room. He fixed his eyes on that window, he distinguished a shadow in the darkness, then one of the panes became quite opaque, as if a sheet of paper were stuck on the outside, then the square cracked without falling. Through the opening an arm was passed to find the fastening, then a second. The window turned on its hinges, and a man entered. He was alone. That's a daring rascal, whispered the Count. At that moment Ali touched him slightly on the shoulder. He turned, Ali pointed to the window of the room in which they were, facing the street. I see, said he, there are two of them, one does the work while the other stands guard. He made a sign to Ali not to lose sight of the man in the street, and turned to the one in the dressing room. The glass cutter had entered, and was feeling his way, his arms stretched out before him. At last he appeared to have made himself familiar with his surroundings. There were two doors. He bolted them both. When he drew near to the bedroom door, Monte Cristo expected that he was coming in, and raised one of his pistols, but he simply heard the sound of the bolts sliding in their copper rings. It was only a precaution. The nocturnal visitor, ignorant of the fact that the Count had removed the staples, might now think himself at home, and pursue his purpose with full security. Alone and free to act as he wished, the man then drew from his pocket something which the Count could not discern, placed it on a stand, then went straight to the secretary, felt the lock, and contrary to his expectation found that the key was missing. But the glass cutter was a prudent man who had provided for all emergencies. The Count soon heard the rattling of a bunch of skeleton keys, such as the locksmith brings when called to force a lock, and which thieves call nightingales, doubtless from the music of their nightly song when they grind against the bolt. Ah, ha, whispered Monte Cristo with a smile of disappointment, he is only a thief. 
but the man in the dark could not find the right key. He reached the instrument he had placed on the stand, touched a spring, and immediately a pale light, just bright enough to render objects distinct, was reflected on his hands and countenance. By heavens, exclaimed Monte Cristo, starting back, it is Dash. Ali raised his hatchet. Don't stir, whispered Monte Cristo, and put down your hatchet, we shall require no arms. Then he added some words in a low tone, for the exclamation which surprise had drawn from the Count, faint as it had been, had startled the man who remained in the pose of the old knife grinder. It was an order the Count had just given, for immediately Ali went noiselessly, and returned, bearing a black dress and a three-cornered hat. Meanwhile Monte Cristo had rapidly taken off his greatcoat, waistcoat, and shirt, and one might distinguish by the glimmering through the open panel that he wore a pliant tunic of steel mail, of which the last in France, where daggers are no longer dreaded, was worn by King Louis XVI, who feared the dagger at his breast, and whose head was cleft with a hatchet. The tunic soon disappeared under a long cassock, as did his hair under a priest's wig. The three-cornered hat over this effectually transformed the Count into an abbey. The man, hearing nothing more, stood erect, and while Monte Cristo was completing his disguise had advanced straight to the secretary, whose lock was beginning to crack under his nightingale. Try again, whispered the Count, who depended on the secret spring which was unknown to the picklock, clever as he might be. Try again, you have a few minutes' work there. And he advanced to the window. The man whom he had seen seated on a fence had got down, and was still pacing the street, but, strange as it appeared, he cared not for those who might pass from the avenue of the Champs-Élysées or by the Faubourg Street or nor, his attention was engrossed with what was passing at the Count's, and his only aim appeared to be to discern every movement in the dressing-room. Monte Cristo suddenly struck his finger on his forehead and smile passed over his lips, then drawing near to Ali, he whispered, Dash, remain here, concealed in the dark, and whatever noise you hear, whatever passes, only come in or show yourself if I call you. Ali bowed in token of strict obedience. Monte Cristo then drew a lighted taper from a closet, and when the thief was deeply engaged with his lock, silently opened the door, taking care that the light should shine directly on his face. The door opened so quietly that the thief heard no sound, but, to his astonishment, the room was suddenly illuminated. He turned, Ah, good evening, my dear M. Cadraus, said Monte Cristo, what are you doing here, at such an hour, the Abbe Ibsoni? exclaimed Cadraus, and, not knowing how this strange apparition could have entered when he had bolted the doors, he let fall his bunch of keys, and remained motionless and stupefied. The Count placed himself between Cadraus and the window, thus cutting off from the thief his only chance of retreat. The Abbe Ibsoni, repeated Cadraus, fixing his haggard gaze on the Count. Yes, undoubtedly, the Abbe Ibsoni himself, replied Monte Cristo. And I am very glad you recognize me, dear M. Cadraus, it proves you have a good memory, for it must be about ten years since we last met. This calmness of Ibsoni, combined with his irony and boldness, staggered Cadraus, the Abbey, the Abbey, murmured he, clenching his fists, and his teeth chattering, so you would rob the Count of Monte Cristo? Continued the false Abbey, Reverend Sir, murmured Cadraus, seeking to regain the window, which the Count pitilessly blocked, Reverend Sir, I don't know, believe me, I take my oath dash, a pane of glass out, continued the Count, a dark lantern, a bunch of false keys, a secretary half forced, it is tolerably evident dash, Cadraus was choking, he looked around for some corner to hide in, some way of escape, come, come, continued the Count, I see you are still the same, an assassin, reverend sir, since you know everything, you know it was not I, it was Lacaconte, that was proved at the trial, since I was only condemned to the galleys, is your time, then, expired, since I find you in a fair way to return there, no, reverend sir, I have been liberated by someone, that someone has done society a great kindness, ah, said Cadraus, I had promised Ash, and you are breaking your promise. Interrupted Monte Cristo, alas, yes, said Cadraus very uneasily, a bad relapse, that will lead you, if I mistake not, to the place to grieve. So much the worse, so much the worse, die Avalo, as they say in my country, reverend sir, I am impelled Dash, every criminal says the same thing, poverty Dash, sure, said Bsoni disdainfully, poverty may make a man beg, steal a loaf of bread at a baker's door, did not cause him to open a secretary in a house supposed to be inhabited. And when the jeweler Johannes had just paid you forty thousand francs for the diamond I had given you, and you killed him to get the diamond and the money both, was that also poverty, pardon, 
Reverend Sir, said Kadraus, you have saved my life once, save me again, that is but poor encouragement. Are you alone, Reverend Sir, or have you the soldiers ready to seize me? I am alone, said the Abbey, and I will again have pity on you, and will let you escape, at the risk of the fresh miseries my weakness may lead to, if you tell me the truth. Ah, Reverend Sir, cried Kadraus, clasping his hands, and drawing nearer to Monte Cristo, I may indeed say you are my deliverer, you mean to say you have been freed from confinement? Yes, that is true, Reverend Sir, who was your liberator, an Englishman, what was his name? Lord Wilmore, I know him, I shall know if you lie. Ah, Reverend Sir, I tell you the simple truth, was this Englishman protecting you? No, not me, but a young Corsican, my companion. What was this young Corsican's name? Benedetto, is that his Christian name? He had no other, he was a foundling. Then this young man escaped with you? He did. In what way? We were working at Street Mandria, near Toulon. Do you know Street Mandria? I do. In the hour of rest, between noon and one o'clock dash, galley slaves having a nap after dinner. We may well pity the poor fellows, said the abbey. Nay, said Cadraus, one can't always work, one is not a dog. So much the better for the dogs, said Monte Cristo, while the rest slept. Then, we went away a short distance, we severed our fetters with a file the Englishman had given us, and swam away. And what is become of this Benedetto? I don't know. You ought to know. No, in truth, we parted at high ears. And, to give more weight to his protestation, Cadraus advanced another step towards the abbey, who remained motionless in his place, as calm as ever, and pursuing his interrogation. You lie, said the abbe Bsoni, the tone of irresistible authority. Reverend sir, you lie. This man is still your friend, and you, perhaps, make use of him as your accomplice. Oh, Reverend sir, since you left Toulon what have you lived on? Answer me, on what I could get. You lie, repeated the abbe a third time, the still more imperative tone. Cadraus, terrified, looked at the count. You have lived on the money he has given you, true, said Cadraus. Benedetto has become the son of a great lord. How can he be the son of a great lord, a natural son? And what is the great lord's name? The Count of Monte Cristo, the very same in whose house we are, Benedetto the Count's son? replied Monte Cristo, astonished in his turn. Well, I should think so, since the Count has found him a false father, since the Count gives him four thousand francs a month, and leaves him five hundred thousand francs in his will. Ah, yes, said the factitious Sabi, who began to understand, and what name does the young man bear meanwhile? Andrea Cavalcanti, is it, then, that young man whom my friend the Count of Monte Cristo has received into his house, and who is going to marry Mademoiselle Dantles? Exactly. And you suffer that, you wretch, you, who know his life and his crime. Why should I stand in a comrade's way? Said Cadraus, you are right, it is not you who should apprise M. Dandlers, it is I, do not do so, reverend sir, why not? Because you would bring us to ruin, and you think that to save such villains as you I will become an abettor of their plot, an accomplice in their crimes? Reverend sir, said Cadraus, drawing still nearer, I will expose all, to whom, to M. Dandlers, by heaven cried Cadraus, drawing from his waistcoat an open knife, and striking the count in the breast, you shall disclose nothing, reverend sir. To Cadraus's great astonishment, the knife, instead of piercing the count's breast, flew back blunted. At the same moment the count seized with his left hand the assassin's wrist, and wrung it with such strength that the knife fell from his stiffened fingers, and Cadraus uttered a cry of pain. But the count, disregarding his cry, continued to wring the bandit's wrist, until, his arm being dislocated, he fell first on his knees, then flat on the floor. The Count then placed his foot on his head, saying, I know not what restrains me from crushing thy skull, rascal. Ah, mercy, mercy! cried Cadraus. The Count withdrew his foot. Rise! said he. Cadraus rose. What a wrist you have, reverend sir! said Cadraus, stroking his arm, all bruised by the fleshy pincers which had held it. What a wrist! Silence! God gives me strength to overcome a wild beast like you, in the name of that God I act, remember that, wretch, and to spare thee at this moment is still serving him, oh, said Cadraus, groaning with pain, take this pen and paper, and write what I dictate, I don't know how to write, reverend sir, you lie, take this pen, and write, Cadraus, awed by the superior power of the abbey, sat down and wrote, dash, sir, the man whom you are receiving at your house, and to whom you intend to marry your daughter, 
is a felon who escaped with me from confinement at Toulon. He was number 59, and I number 58. He was called Benedetto, but he is ignorant of his real name. Having never known his parents, sign it. Continued the Count. But would you ruin me? If I sought your ruin, fool, I should drag you to the first guardhouse. Besides, when that note is delivered, in all probability you will have no more to fear. Sign it, then. Cadreus signed it. The address, to Monsieur the Baron d'Anglers, banker, Rue de la Chaucide Antin. Cadreus wrote the address. The Abbe took the note. Now, said he, that suffices, be gone. Which way? The way you came. You wish me to get out at that window? You got in very well. Oh, you have some design against me, reverend sir, idiot. What design can I have? Why, then, not let me out by the door. What would be the advantage of waking the porter? Dash. Ah, reverend sir, tell me, do you wish me dead? I wish what God wills. But swear that you will not strike me as I go down, cowardly fool. What do you intend doing with me? I ask you what can I do? I have tried to make you a happy man, and you have turned out a murderer. Oh, monsieur, said Cadreus, make one more attempt, try me once more. I will, said the Count. Listen, you know if I may be relied on. Yes, said Cadreus, if you arrive safely at home dash. What have I to fear, except from you, if you reach your home safely, leave Paris, leave France, and wherever you may be, so long as you conduct yourself well, I will send you a small annuity, for, if you return home safely, then dash, then? Asked Cadreus, shuddering, then I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you too, as true as I am a Christian, stammered Cadreus, you will make me die of fright, now be gone, said the Count, pointing to the window, Cadreus, scarcely yet relying on this promise, put his legs out of the window and stood on the ladder. Now go down, said the Abbey, folding his arms. Understanding he had nothing more to fear from him, Cadreus began to go down. Then the Count brought the taper to the window, that it might be seen in the champs Elise eh, that a man was getting out of the window while another held a light. What are you doing, reverend sir? Suppose a watchman should pass? And he blew out the light. He then descended, but it was only when he felt his foot touch the ground that he was satisfied of his safety. Monte Cristo returned to his bedroom, and, glancing rapidly from the garden to the street, he saw first Cadreus, who after walking to the end of the garden, fixed his ladder against the wall at a different part from where he came in. The Count then looking over into the street, saw the man who appeared to be waiting run in the same direction, and place himself against the angle of the wall where Cadreus would come over. Cadreus climbed the ladder slowly, looked over the coping to see if the street was quiet. No one could be seen or heard. The clock of the Invalide struck one. Then Cadreus sat astride the coping, and drawing up his ladder passed it over the wall, then he began to descend, or rather to slide down by the two sternkins, which he did with an ease which proved how accustomed he was to the exercise. But, once started, he could not stop. In vain did he see a man start from the shadow when he was halfway down, in vain did he see an arm raised as he touched the ground. Before he could defend himself that arm struck him so violently in the back that he let go the ladder, crying, help. A second blow struck him almost immediately in the side, and he fell, calling, help, murder. Then, as he rolled on the ground, his adversary seized him by the hair, and struck him a third blow in the chest. This time Cadreus endeavored to call again, but he could only utter a groan, and he shuddered as the blood flowed from his three wounds. The assassin, finding that he no longer cried out, lifted his head up by the hair, his eyes were closed, and the mouth was distorted. The murderer, supposing him dead, let fall his head and disappeared. Then Cadreus, feeling that he was leaving him, raised himself on his elbow, and with a dying voice cried with great effort, Murder! I am dying! Help! Reverend sir, help! This mournful appeal pierced the darkness. The door of the back staircase opened, then the side gate of the garden, and Ali and his master were on the spot with lights. Chapter 83 The Hand of God Cadreus continued to call piteously, Help! Reverend sir, help! What is the matter? Asked Monte Cristo, Help! cried Cadreus, I am murdered, we are here, take courage, Ah, it's all over. You are come too late, you are come to see me die. What blows, what blood? He fainted. Ali and his master conveyed the wounded man into a room. Monte Cristo motioned to Ali to undress him, and he then examined his dreadful wounds. My God! He exclaimed, thy vengeance is sometimes delayed, but only that it may fall the more effectually. Ali looked at his master for further instructions. 
Bring here immediately the king's attorney, M. de Vilfert, who lives in the Faubourg Street on Or. As you pass the lodge, wake the porter, and send him for a surgeon. Ali obeyed, leaving the abbey alone with Cadreus, who had not yet revived. When the wretched man again opened his eyes, the Count looked at him with a mournful expression of pity, and his lips moved as if in prayer. A surgeon, reverend sir, a surgeon, said Cadreus. I have sent for one, replied the abbey, I know he cannot save my life, but he may strengthen me to give my evidence. Against whom? Against my murderer. Did you recognize him? Yes, it was Benedetto, the young Corsican, himself, your comrade? Yes. After giving me the plan of this house, doubtless hoping I should kill the Count and he thus become his heir, or that the Count would kill me and I should be out of his way, he will aid me, and has murdered me. I have also sent for the procurer. He will not come in time. I feel my life fast ebbing. Wait a moment, said Monte Cristo. He left the room, and returned in five minutes with a file. The dying man's eyes were all the time riveted on the door, through which he hoped succor would arrive. Hasten, reverend sir, hasten. I shall faint again. Monte Cristo approached, and dropped on his purple lips three or four drops of the contents of the file. Cadreus drew a deep breath. Oh, said he, that is life to me, more, more, two drops more would kill you, replied the abbey. Oh, send for some one to whom I can denounce the wretch. Shall I write your deposition? You can sign it. Yes, yes, said Cadreus, and his eyes glistened at the thought of this posthumous revenge. Monte Cristo wrote, Dash, I die, murdered by the Corsican Benedetto, my comrade in the galleys at Toulouse, number 59. Quick, quick, said Cadreus, or I shall be unable to sign it. Monte Cristo gave the pen to Cadreus, collected all his strength, signed it, and fell back on his bed, saying, You will relate all the rest, reverend sir, you will say he calls himself Andrea Cavalcanti. He lodges at the Hotel des Princes. Oh, I am dying. He again fainted. The abbe made him smell the contents of the file, and he again opened his eyes. His desire for revenge had not forsaken him. Ah, you will tell all I have said, will you not, reverend sir? Yes, and much more. What more will you say? I will say he had doubtless given you the plan of this house, in the hope the Count would kill you. I will say, likewise, he had apprised the Count, by a note, of your intention, and, the Count being absent, I read the note and set up to await you, and he will be guillotined, will be not? said Cadreus. Promise me that, and I will die with that hope, I will say, continued the Count, that he followed and watched you the whole time, and when he saw you leave the house, ran to the angle of the wall to conceal himself. Did you see all that? Remember my words, if you return home safely, I shall believe God has forgiven you, and I will forgive you also, and you did not warn me, cried Cadreus, raising himself on his elbows. You knew I should be killed on leaving this house, and did not warn me, no, for I saw God's justice placed in the hands of Benedetto, and should have thought it sacrilege to oppose the designs of Providence, God's justice. Speak not of it, reverend sir. If God were just, you know how many would be punished who now escape, patience, said the abbey, in a tone which made the dying man shudder, have patience. Cadreus looked at him with amazement. Besides, said the abbey, God is merciful to all, as he has been to you, he is first a father, then a judge, do you then believe in God? said Cadreus, had I been so unhappy as not to believe in him until now, said Monte Cristo, I must believe on seeing you. Cadreus raised his clenched hands towards heaven, listen, said the abbey, extending his hand over the wounded man, as if to command him to believe, this is what the God in whom, on your deathbed, you refuse to believe, has done for you. He gave you health, strength, regular employment, even friends, a life, in fact, which a man might enjoy with a calm conscience. Instead of improving these gifts, rarely granted so abundantly, this has been your course, you have given yourself up to sloth and drunkenness, and in a fit of intoxication have ruined your best friend, help, cried Cadreus, I require a surgeon, not a priest, perhaps I am not mortally wounded, I may not die, perhaps they can yet save my life, your wounds are so far mortal that, without the three drops I gave you, you would now be dead, listen, then, ah, murmured Cadreus, what a strange priest you are, you drive the dying to despair, instead of consoling them, listen, continued the abbey, when you had betrayed your friend God began not to strike, but to warn you. Poverty overtook you. You had already passed half your life in coveting that which you might have honorably acquired, and already you contemplated crime under the excuse of want, when God worked a miracle in your behalf, sending you, 
by my hands, a fortune, brilliant, indeed, for you, who had never possessed any. But this unexpected, unhoped for, unheard of fortune sufficed you no longer when you once possessed it, you wished to double it, and how, by a murder. You succeeded, and then God snatched it from you, and brought you to justice. It was not I who wished to kill the Jew, said Cadarous, it was Lacaconte. Yes, said Monte Cristo, and God, I cannot say injustice, for his justice would have slain you, but God, in his mercy, spared your life, pardi, to transport me for life, how merciful. You thought it a mercy then, miserable wretch. The coward who feared death rejoiced at perpetual disgrace, for like all galley slaves, you said, I may escape from prison, I cannot from the grave. And you said truly, the way was opened for you unexpectedly. An Englishman visited Delon, who had vowed to rescue two men from infamy, and his choice fell on you and your companion. You received a second fortune, money and tranquility were restored to you, and you, who had been condemned to a felon's life, might live as other men. Then, wretched creature, then you tempted God a third time. I have not enough, you said, when you had more than you before possessed, and you committed a third crime, without reason, without excuse. God is wearied. He has punished you. Cadraus was fast sinking. Give me drink, said he, I thirst, I burn. Monte Cristo gave him a glass of water. And yet that villain, Benedetto, will escape, no one, I tell you, will escape, Benedetto will be punished, then, you, too, will be punished, for you did not do your duty as a priest, you should have prevented Benedetto from killing me, I, said the Count, with a smile which petrified the dying man, when you had just broken your knife against the coat of mail which protected my breast, yet perhaps if I had found you humble and penitent, I might have prevented Benedetto from killing you, but I found you proud and bloodthirsty, and I left you in the hands of God, I do not believe there is a God, howled Cadraus, you do not believe it, you lie, you lie, silence, said the Abbey, you will force the last drop of blood from your veins, what, you do not believe in God when he is striking you dead, you will not believe in him, who requires but a prayer, a word, a tear, and he will forgive, God, who might have directed the assassin's dagger so as to end your career in a moment, has given you this quarter of an hour for repentance. Reflect, then, wretched man, and repent. No, said Cadraus, no, I will not repent. There is no God, there is no providence, all comes by chance. Dash, there is a providence, there is a God, said Monte Cristo, of whom you are a striking proof, as you lie in utter despair, denying him, while I stand before you, rich, happy, safe and entreating that God in whom you endeavor not to believe while in your heart you still believe in him. But who are you, then? asked Cadraus, fixing his dying eyes on the Count. Look well at me, said Monte Cristo, putting the light near his face. Well, the Abbey, the Abbey Ibsoni. Monte Cristo took off the wig which disfigured him, and let fall his black hair, which added so much to the beauty of his pallid features. Oh? said Cadraus, thunderstruck, but for that black hair, I should say you were the Englishman, Lord Wilmore. I am neither the Abbe Bsoni nor Lord Wilmore, said Monte Cristo, think again, do you not recollect me? Those was a magic effect in the Count's words, which once more revived the exhausted powers of the miserable man. Yes, indeed, said he, I think I have seen you and known you formerly, yes, Cadraus, you have seen me, you knew me once, who, then, are you? And why, if you knew me, do you let me die? Because nothing can save you, your wounds are mortal. Had it been possible to save you, I should have considered it another proof of God's mercy, and I would again have endeavored to restore you, I swear by my father's tomb, by your father's tomb, said Cadraus, supported by a supernatural power, and half raising himself to see more distinctly the man who had just taken the oath which all men hold sacred, who, then, are you? The Count had watched the approach of death. He knew this was the last struggle. He approached the dying man, and, Leaning over him with a calm and melancholy look, he whispered, I am, I am, and his almost closed lips uttered a name so low that the Count himself appeared afraid to hear it. Cadraus, who had raised himself on his knees, and stretched out his arm, tried to draw back, then clasping his hands, and raising them with a desperate effort, O oh my God, my God! said he, pardon me for having denied thee, thou dost exist, thou art indeed man's father in heaven, and his judge on earth. My God! My Lord, I have long despised thee. Pardon me, my God, receive me, O oh my Lord. Cadraus sighed deeply, and fell back with a groan. The blood no longer flowed from his wounds. 
He was dead, one, said the Count mysteriously, his eyes fixed on the corpse, disfigured by so awful a death. Ten minutes afterwards the surgeon and the procurer arrived, the one accompanied by the porter, the other by Ali, and were received by the Abbe Bsoni, who was praying by the side of the corpse. Chapter 84 Beecham. The daring attempt to rob the Count was the tropic of conversation throughout Paris for the next fortnight. The dying man had signed a deposition declaring Benedetto to be the assassin. The police had orders to make the strictest search for the murderer. Cadreuse's knife, dark lantern, bunch of keys, and clothing, excepting the waistcoat, which could not be found, were deposited at the registry. The corpse was conveyed to the morgue. The Count told everyone that this adventure had happened during his absence at Orteville, and that he only knew what was related by the Abbe Bsoni, who that evening, by mere chance, had requested to pass the night in his house, to examine some valuable books in his library. But Tassio alone turned pale whenever Benedetto's name was mentioned in his presence, but there was no reason why anyone should notice his doing so. Vilfert, being called on to prove the crime, was preparing his brief with the same ardour that he was accustomed to exercise when required to speak in criminal cases. But three weeks had already passed, and the most diligent search had been unsuccessful, the attempted robbery and the murder of the robber by his comrade were almost forgotten in anticipation of the approaching marriage of Mademoiselle d'Angles to the Count d'Andrea Cavalcanti. It was expected that this wedding would shortly take place, as the young man was received at the bankers as the betrothed. Letters had been dispatched to M. Cavalcanti, as the Count's father, who highly approved of the union, regretted his inability to leave Parma at that time, and promised a wedding gift of a hundred and fifty thousand livres. It was agreed that the three millions should be entrusted to Danglars to invest. Some persons had warned the young man of the circumstances of his future father-in-law, who had of late sustained repeated losses, but with sublime disinterestedness and confidence the young man refused to listen, or to express a single doubt to the Baron. The Baron adored Count Andrea Cavalcanti, not so Mademoiselle Eugenie Danglars. With an instinctive hatred of matrimony, she suffered Andrea's attentions in order to get rid of more serf, but when Andrea urged his suit, she betrayed an entire dislike to him. The Baron might possibly have perceived it, but, attributing it to a caprice, feigned ignorance, the delay demanded by Beecham had nearly expired. Morcerf appreciated the advice of Monte Cristo to let things die away of their own accord. No one had taken up the remark about the general, and no one had recognized in the officer who betrayed the castle of Yanina the noble count in the House of Peers. Albert, however felt no less insulted, the few lines which had irritated him were certainly intended as an insult. Besides, the manner in which Beecham had closed the conference left a bitter recollection in his heart. He cherished the thought of the duel, hoping to conceal its true cause even from his seconds. Beecham had not been seen since the day he visited Albert, and those of whom the latter inquired always told him he was out on a journey which would detain him some days. Where he was no one knew. One morning Albert was awakened by his valet de chamber, who announced Beecham. Albert rubbed his eyes, ordered his servant to introduce him into the small smoking room on the ground floor, dressed himself quickly, and went down. He found Beecham pacing the room, on perceiving him Beecham stopped. Your arrival here, without waiting my visit at your house today, looks well, sir, said Albert. Tell me, may I shake hands with you, saying, Beecham, acknowledge you have injured me, and retain my friendship, or must I simply propose to you a choice of arms, Albert, said Beecham with a look of sorrow which stupefied the young man, let us first sit down and talk, rather, sir, before we sit down, I must demand your answer, Albert, said the journalist, these are questions which it is difficult to answer, I will facilitate it by repeating the question, will you, or will you not, retract, more serve, it is not enough to answer yes or no to questions which concern the honour, the social interest, and the life of such a man as Lieutenant General the Count of Morserf, peer of France, what must then be done? what I have done, Albert. I reasoned thus, money, time, and fatigue are nothing compared with the reputation and interests of a whole family, probabilities will not suffice, only facts will justify a deadly combat with a friend. If I strike with a sword, or discharge the contents of a pistol at man with whom, for three years, I have been on terms of intimacy, I must, at least, know why I do so, I must meet him with a heart at ease, and that quiet conscience which a man needs when his own arm must save his life, well, said Morserf, impatiently, what does all this mean, it means that I have just returned from Yanina, from Yanina, yes, impossible, here is my passport, examine the visa, Geneva, Milan, Venice, Trieste, Delvino, Yanina, will you believe the government of a republic, a kingdom, 
and an empire? Albert cast his eyes on the passport, then raised them in astonishment to Beecham. You have been to a Nina? said he. Albert, had you been a stranger, a foreigner, a simple lord, like that Englishman who came to demand satisfaction three or four months since, and whom I killed to get rid of, I should not have taken this trouble, but I thought this mark of consideration due to you. I took a week to go, another to return, four days of quarantine, and forty-eight hours to stay there, that makes three weeks. I returned last night, and here I am, what circumlocution? How long you are before you tell me what I most wish to know, because, in truth, Albert Dash, you hesitate, yes, I fear, you fear to acknowledge that your correspondent has deceived you? Oh, no self-love, Beecham. Acknowledge it, Beecham, your courage cannot be doubted, not so, murmured the journalist, on the contrary Dash, Albert turned frightfully pale, he endeavored to speak, but the words died on his lips. My friend, said Beecham, in the most affectionate tone, I should gladly make an apology, but, alas, Dash. But what? The paragraph was correct, my friend, what? That French officer Dash, yes, Fernand, yes, the traitor who surrendered the castle of the man in whose service he was Dash, pardon me, my friend, that man was your father. Albert advanced furiously towards Beecham, but the latter restrained him more by a mild look than by his extended hand, my friend, said he, here is a proof of it. Albert opened the paper, it was an attestation of four notable inhabitants of Yanina proving that Colonel Finan Mundigo, in the service of Ali Tapolini, had surrendered the castle for two million crowns. The signatures were perfectly legal. Albert tottered and fell overpowered in a chair. It could no longer be doubted, the family name was fully given. After a moment's mournful silence, his heart overflowed, and he gave way to a flood of tears. Beecham, who had watched with sincere pity the young man's paroxysm of grief, approached him. Now, Albert, said he, you understand me do you not? I wish to see all, and to judge of everything for myself, hoping the explanation would be in your father's favor, and that I might do him justice. But, on the contrary, the particulars which are given prove that Finand Mundigo, raised by Ali Pasha to the rank of Governor-General, is no other than Count Finand of Morserf. Then, recollecting the honor you had done me, in admitting me to your friendship, I hastened to you. Albert, still extended on the chair, covered his face with both hands, as if to prevent the light from reaching him. I hasten to you, continued Beecham, to tell you, Albert, that in this changing age, the faults of a father cannot revert upon his children. Few have passed through this revolutionary period, in the midst of which we were born, without some stain of infamy or blood to soil the uniform of the soldier, or the gown of the magistrate. Now I have these proofs, Albert, and I am in your confidence, no human power can force me to a duel which your own conscience would reproach you with as criminal but I come to offer you what you can no longer demand of me. Do you wish these proofs, these attestations, which I alone possess, to be destroyed? Do you wish this frightful secret to remain with us? Confided to me, it shall never escape my lips, say, Albert, my friend, do you wish it? Albert threw himself on Beecham's neck. Ah, noble fellow! cried he, take these, said Beecham, presenting the papers to Albert. Albert seized them with a convulsive hand, tore them in pieces, and trembling lest the least vestige should escape and one day appear to confront him. He approached the wax light, always kept burning for cigars, and burned every fragment. Dear, excellent friend, murmured Albert, still burning the papers, let all be forgotten as a sorrowful dream, said Beecham, let it vanish as the last sparks from the blackened paper, and disappear as the smoke from those silent ashes. Yes, yes, said Albert, and may there remain only the eternal friendship which I promised to my deliverer which shall be transmitted to our children's children, and shall always remind me that I owe my life and the honor of my name to you, for had this been known, oh, Beecham, I should have destroyed myself, or, no, my poor mother. I could not have killed her by the same blow, I should have fled from my country, dear Albert, said Beecham. But this sudden and factitious joy soon forsook the young man, and was succeeded by a still greater grief. Well, said Beecham, what still oppresses you, my friend? I am broken-hearted, said Albert. Listen, Beecham. I cannot thus, in a moment relinquish the respect, the confidence, and pride with which a father's untarnished name inspires a son. Oh, Beecham, Beecham, how shall I now approach mine? Shall I draw back my forehead from his embrace, or withhold my hand from his? I am the most wretched of men. Ah, my mother, my poor mother, said Albert, gazing through his tears at his mother's portrait, if you know this, how much must you suffer? Come, said Beecham, 
taking both his hands, take courage, my friend. But how came that first note to be inserted in your journal? Some unknown enemy, an invisible foe, has done this. The more must you fortify yourself, Albert. Let no trace of emotion be visible on your countenance, bear your grief as the cloud bears within it ruin and death, a fatal secret, known only when the storm bursts. Go, my friend, reserve your strength for the moment when the crash shall come, you think, then, all is not over yet? said Albert, horror-stricken, I think nothing, my friend, but all things are possible. By the way Dash, what? said Albert, seeing that Beecham hesitated, are you going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? Why do you ask me now? Because the rupture or fulfillment of this engagement is connected with the person of whom we were speaking, huh? said Albert, whose brow reddened, you think M. Dandler's dash, I ask you only how your engagement stands? Bray put no construction on my words I do not mean they should convey, and give them no undue weight, no, said Albert. The engagement is broken off, well, said Beecham. Then, seeing the young man was about to relapse into melancholy, let us go out. Albert, said he, a ride in the wood in the phaeton, or on horseback, will refresh you, we will then return to breakfast, and you shall attend to your affairs, and I to mine, willingly, said Albert, but let us walk. I think a little exertion would do me good. The two friends walked out on the fortress. When arrived at the Madeleine, since we are out, said Beecham, let us call on M. de Monte Cristo, he is admirably adapted to revive one's spirits, because he never interrogates and in my opinion those who ask no questions are the best comforters, gladly, said Albert, I love him, let us call, chapter 85 The Journey, Monte Cristo uttered a joyful exclamation on seeing the young men together, ah, ha, ah, said he, I hope all is over, explained and settled, yes, said Beecham, the absurd reports have died away, and should they be renewed, I would be the first to oppose them, so let us speak no more of it, Albert will tell you, replied the Count that I gave him the same advice. Look, added he, I am finishing the most execrable morning's work, what is it? said Albert, arranging your papers, apparently, my papers, thank God, no, my papers are all in capital order, because I have none, but M. Cavalcantes, M. Cavalcantes? asked Beecham, yes, do you not know that this is a young man whom the Count is introducing? said Morcerf, let us not misunderstand each other replied Monte Cristo, I introduce no one, and certainly not M. Cavalcanti, and who, said Albert with a forced smile, is to marry Mademoiselle Danglars instead of me, which grieves me cruelly, what? Cavalcanti is going to marry Mademoiselle Danglars? asked Beecham, certainly, do you come from the end of the world? said Monte Cristo, you, a journalist, the husband of renown? It is the talk of all Paris, and you, Count, have made this match? asked Beecham, I? Silence, purveyor of gossip, do not spread that report. I make a match? No, you do not know me, I have done all in my power to oppose it. Ah, I understand, said Beecham, on our friend Albert's account. On my account? said the young man, oh, no, indeed, the Count will do me the justice to assert that I have, on the contrary, always entreated him to break off my engagement, and happily it is ended. The Count pretends I have not him to thank, so be it. I will erect an old Tadeo Ignoto. Listen, said Monte Cristo, I have had little to do with it, for I am at variance both with the father-in-law and the young man, there is only Mademoiselle Eugenie, who appears but little charmed with the thoughts of matrimony, and who, seeing how little I was disposed to persuade her to renounce her dear liberty, retains any affection for me, and do you say this wedding is at hand, oh, yes, in spite of all I could say. I do not know the young man, he is said to be of good family and rich, but I never trust to vague assertions. I have warned them. Dandlers of it till I am tired, but he is fascinated with his Lacanis. I have even informed him of a circumstance I consider very serious. The young man was either charmed by his nurse, stolen by gypsies, or lost by his tutor, I scarcely know which. But I do know his further lost sight of him for more than ten years, what he did during these ten years, God only knows. Well, all that was useless. They have commissioned me to write to the Major to demand papers, and here they are. I send them, but like Pilate, washing my hands, and what does Mademoiselle Darmely say to you for robbing her of her pupil? Oh, well, I don't know, but I understand that she is going to Italy. Madame Danglars asked me for letters of recommendation for the impresari, I gave her a few lines for the director of the Val Theatre, who is under some obligation to me. But what is the matter, Albert? You look dull, 
Are you, after all, unconsciously in love with Mademoiselle Eugenie? I am not aware of it, said Albert, smiling sorrowfully. Beecham turned to look at some paintings. But, continued Monte Cristo, you are not in your usual spirits. I have a dreadful headache, said Albert. Well, my dear Viscount, said Monte Cristo, I have an infallible remedy to propose to you. What is that? asked the young man. A change, indeed? said Albert. Yes, and as I am just now excessively annoyed, I shall go from home. Shall we go together, you annoyed, Count? said Beecham. And by what? Ah, you think very lightly of it. I should like to see you with a brief preparing in your house. What brief? The one M. De Vilford is preparing against my amiable assassin. Some brigand escaped from the gallows apparently. True, said Beecham. I saw it in the paper. Who is this Cadraus? Some provincial, it appears. M. De Vilford heard of him at Marseille, and M. Dandler's recollects having seen him. Consequently, the procurer is very active in the affair, and the prefect of police very much interested, and, thanks to that interest, for which I am very grateful, they send me all the robbers of Paris and the neighborhood, under pretense of their being Cadreuse's murderers, so that in three months, if this continue, every robber and assassin in France will have the plan of my house at his finger's end. I am resolved to desert them and go to some remote corner of the earth, and shall be happy if you will accompany me, Viscount, willingly, then it is settled, yes, but where, I have told you, where the air is pure, where every sound soothes, where one is sure to be humbled, however proud may be his nature. I love that humiliation, I, who am master of the universe, as was Augustus, but where are you really going, to see, Viscount, you know I am a sailor. I was rocked when an infant in the arms of old ocean, and on the bosom of the beautiful Amphitrite, I have sported with the green mantle of the one and the azure robe of the other, I love the sea as a mistress, and by and if I do not often see her, let us go, Count, to see, yes, you accept my proposal, I do, well, Viscount, there will be in my courtyard this evening a good travelling Britska, with four post horses, in which one may rest as in a bed. M. Beecham, it holds four very well, will you accompany us, thank you, I have just returned from sea. What? You have been to sea? Yes, I have just made a little excursion to the Borromean Islands, Lake Maggie or, what of that? Come with us, said Albert, no, dear Morsef, you know I only refuse when the thing is impossible. Besides, it is important, added he in a low tone, that I should remain in Paris just now to watch the paper. Ah, you are a good and an excellent friend, said Albert, yes, you are right, watch, watch, teach him and try to discover the enemy who made this disclosure. Albert and Beecham parted, the last pressure of their hands expressing what their tongues could not before a stranger. Beecham is a worthy fellow, said Monte Cristo, when the journalist was gone, is he not, Albert? Yes, and a sincere friend, I love him devotedly. But now we are alone, although it is immaterial to me, where are we going? Into Normandy, if you like. Delightful, shall we be quite retired? Have no society, no neighbors? Our companions will be riding horses, dogs to hunt with, and a fishing boat. Exactly what I wish for, I will apprise my mother of my intention, and return to you. But shall you be allowed to go into Normandy? I may go where I please. Yes, I am aware you may go alone, since I once met you in Italy, to accompany the mysterious Monte Cristo. You forget, Count, that I have often told you of the deep interest my mother takes in you. Woman is fickle, said Francis I. Woman is like a wave of the sea said Shakespeare, both the great king and the great poet ought to have known woman's nature well, woman's, yes, my mother is not woman, but a woman, as I am only a humble foreigner, you must pardon me if I do not understand all the subtle refinements of your language, what I mean to say is, that my mother is not quick to give her confidence, but when she does she never changes, ah, yes, indeed, said Monte Cristo with a sigh, and do you think she is in the least interested in me, I repeat it, you must really be a very strange and superior man for my mother is so absorbed by the interest you have excited, that when I am with her she speaks of no one else, and does she try to make you dislike me? On the contrary, she often says, Morsef, I believe the Count has a noble nature, try to gain his esteem, indeed? said Monte Cristo, sighing, you see, then, said Albert, that instead of opposing, she will encourage me, adieu, then, until five o'clock, be punctual, and we shall arrive at twelve or one, at Treport, yes, or in the neighborhood. But can we travel forty-eight leagues in eight hours? Easily, said Monte Cristo. You are certainly a prodigy. You will soon not only surpass the railway, which would not be very difficult in France, 
but even the telegraph, but, Viscount, since we cannot perform the journey in less than seven or eight hours, do not keep me waiting, do not fear, I have little to prepare. Monte Cristo smiled as he nodded to Albert, then remained a moment absorbed in deep meditation. But passing his hand across his forehead as if to dispel his reverie, he rang the bell twice and Batasio entered. Batasio, said he, I intend going this evening to Normandy, instead of tomorrow or the next day. You will have sufficient time before five o'clock, dispatch a messenger to apprise the grooms at the first station. M. De Morcerf will accompany me. But Hasio obeyed and dispatched a courier to Pontoise to say the travelling carriage would arrive at six o'clock. From Pontoise another express was sent to the next stage, and in six hours all the horses stationed on the road were ready. Before his departure, the Count went to Hayday's apartments, told her his intention, and resigned everything to her care. Albert was punctual. The journey soon became interesting from its rapidity, of which Morcerf had formed no previous idea. Truly, said Monte Cristo, with your post horses going at the rate of two leagues an hour, and that absurd law that one traveller shall not pass another without permission, so that an invalid or ill-tempered traveller may detain those who are well and active, it is impossible to move. I escape this annoyance by travelling with my own postillion and horses, do I not, Ali? The Count put his head out of the window and whistled, and the horses appeared to fly. The carriage rolled with a thundering noise over the pavement, and everyone turned to notice the dazzling meteor. Ali, smiling, repeated the sound, grasped the reins with a firm hand, and spurred his horses, whose beautiful manes floated in the breeze. This child of the desert was in his element, and with his black face and sparkling eyes appeared, in the cloud of dust he raised, like the genius of the Samoom and the god of the hurricane. I never knew till now the delight of speed, said Morcerf, and the last cloud disappeared from his brow, but where the devil do you get such horses? Are they made to order? Precisely, said the Count. Six years since I bought a horse in Hungary remarkable for its swiftness. The thirty-two that we shall use tonight are its progeny, they are all entirely black, with the exception of a star upon the forehead, that is perfectly admirable, but what do you do, Count, with all these horses, you see, I travel with them. But you are not always travelling, when I no longer acquire them, Batasio will sell them, and he expects to realise thirty or forty thousand francs by the sale but no monarch in Europe will be wealthy enough to purchase them, then he will sell them to some eastern vizier, who will empty his coffers to purchase them, and refill them by applying the bastinado to his subjects, Count, may I suggest one idea to you, certainly, it is that, next to you, Batasio must be the richest gentleman in Europe, you are mistaken, Viscount, I believe he has not a franc in his possession, then he must be a wonder, my dear Count, if you tell me many more marvellous things, I warn you I shall not believe them, I countenance nothing that is marvellous, M. Albert. Tell me, why does a steward rob his master, because, I suppose, it is his nature to do so, for the love of robbing, you are mistaken, it is because he has a wife and family, and ambitious desires for himself and them. Also because he is not sure of always retaining his situation, and wishes to provide for the future. Now, M. Batasio is alone in the world, he uses my property without accounting for the use he makes of it. He is sure never to leave my service, why? Because I should never get a better, probabilities are deceptive, but I deal in certainties, he is the best servant over whom one has the power of life and death, do you possess that right over Batasio? Yes. There are words which close a conversation with an iron door, such was the Count's yes. The whole journey was performed with equal rapidity, the thirty-two horses, dispersed over seven stages, brought them to their destination in eight hours. At midnight they arrived at the gate of a beautiful park. The porter was in attendance, he had been apprised by the groom of the last stage of the Count's approach. At half-past two in the morning Morcerf was conducted to his apartments, where a bath and supper were prepared. The servant who had travelled at the back of the carriage waited on him, Baptistin, who rode in front, attended the Count. Albert bathed, took his supper, and went to bed. All night he was lulled by the melancholy noise of the surf. On rising, he went to his window which opened on a terrace, having the sea in front, and at the back a pretty park bounded by a small forest. In a creek lay a little sloop, with a narrow keel and high masts, bearing on its flag the Monte Cristo arms which were a mountain on a sea azure, with a cross gules on the shield. Around the schooner lay a number of small fishing boats belonging to the fishermen of the neighbouring village, like humble subjects awaiting orders from their queen. There, as in every spot where Monte Cristo stopped, if but for two days, luxury abounded and life went on with the utmost ease, 
Albert found in his anteroom two guns, with all the accoutrements for hunting, a lofty room on the ground floor containing all the ingenious instruments the English, eminent in piscatory pursuits, since they are patient and sluggish, have invented for fishing. The day passed in pursuing those exercises in which Monte Cristo excelled. They killed a dozen pheasants in the park, as many trout in the stream, dined in a summer house overlooking the ocean, and took tea in the library. Towards the evening of the third day, Albert, completely exhausted with the exercise which invigorated Monte Cristo, was sleeping in an armchair near the window, while the Count was designing with his architect the plan of a conservatory in his house, when the sound of a horse at full speed on the high road made Albert look up. He was disagreeably surprised to see his own valet de chamber, whom he had not brought, that he might not inconvenience Monte Cristo. Florentin here, cried he, starting up, is my mother ill? And he hastened to the door. Monte Cristo watched and saw him approach the valley, who drew a small sealed parcel from his pocket, containing a newspaper and a letter. From whom is this? said he eagerly. From M. Beecham, replied Florentin. Did he send you? Yes, sir, he sent for me to his house, gave me money for my journey, cured a horse, and made me promise not to stop till I had reached you, I have come in fifteen hours. Albert opened the letter with fear, uttered a shriek on reading the first line, and seized the paper. His sight was dimmed, his legs sank under him, and he would have fallen had not Florentin supported him. Poor young man, said Monte Cristo in a low voice, it is then true that the sin of the further shall fall on the children to the third and fourth generation. Meanwhile Albert had revived, and, continuing to read, he threw back his head, saying, Florentin, is your horse fit to return immediately? It is a poor lame post horse. In what state was the house when you left? All was quiet, but on returning from M. Beecham's, I found Madame in tears, she had sent for me to know when you would return. I told her my orders from M. Beecham, she first extended her arms to prevent me, but after a moment's reflection, yes, go, Florentin, said she, and may he come quickly, yes, my mother, said Albert, I will return, and woe to the infamous wretch. But first of all I must get there, he went back to the room where he had left Monte Cristo. Five minutes had sufficed to make a complete transformation in his appearance. His voice had become rough and hoarse, his face was furrowed with wrinkles, his eyes burned under the blue veined lids, and he tottered like a drunken man. Count, said he, I thank you for your hospitality, which I would gladly have enjoyed longer, but I must return to Paris. What has happened? A great misfortune, more important to me than life. Don't question me, I beg of you, but lend me a horse. My stables are at your command, Viscount but you will kill yourself by riding on horseback. Take a post-chaise or a carriage. No, it would delay me, and I need the fatigue you warn me of. It will do me good. Albert reeled as if he had been shot, and fell on a chair near the door. Monte Cristo did not see this second manifestation of physical exhaustion. He was at the window, calling, Ali, a horse for M. De more, sir, quick. He is in a hurry. These words restored Albert. He darted from the room, followed by the Count. Thank you cried he, throwing himself on his horse. Return as soon as you can, Florentin. Must I use any password to procure a horse? Only dismount, another will be immediately saddled. Albert hesitated a moment. You may think my departure strange and foolish, said the young man, you do not know how a paragraph in a newspaper may exasperate one. Read that, said he, when I am gone, that you may not be witness of my anger. While the Count picked up the paper he put spurs to his horse leapt in astonishment at such an unusual stimulus, and shot away with the rapidity of an arrow. The Count watched him with a feeling of compassion, and when he had completely disappeared, read as follows, dash, the French officer in the service of Ali Pasha of Yanina alluded to three weeks since in the impartial, who not only surrendered the castle of Yanina, but sold his benefactor to the Turks, styled himself truly at that time Fernand, as our esteemed contemporary states but he has since added to his Christian name a title of nobility and a family name. He now calls himself the Count of Morcerf, and ranks among the peers. Thus the terrible secret, which Beecham had so generously destroyed, appeared again like an armed phantom, and another paper, deriving its information from some malicious source, had published two days after Albert's departure for Normandy the few lines which had rendered the unfortunate young man almost crazy. Chapter 86 The Trial at eight o'clock in the morning Albert had arrived at Beecham's door. The valet de chamber had received orders to usher him in at once. Beecham was in his bath. Here I am, said Albert. Well, my poor friend, replied Beecham, I expected you. 
I need not say I think you are too faithful and too kind to have spoken of that painful circumstance. Your having sent for me is another proof of your affection. So, without losing time, tell me, have you the slightest idea whence this terrible blow proceeds? I think I have some clue. But first tell me all the particulars of this shameful plot. Beecham proceeded to relate to the young man, who was overwhelmed with shame and grief, the following facts. Two days previously, the article had appeared in another paper besides the impartial, and, what was more serious, one that was well known as a government paper. Beecham was breakfasting when he read the paragraph. He sent immediately for a cabriolet, and hastened to the publisher's office. Although professing diametrically opposite principles from those of the editor of the other paper, Beecham, as it sometimes, we may say often, happens, was his intimate friend. The editor was reading, with apparent delight, a leading article in the same paper on beet sugar, probably a composition of his own, ah, pardy, said Beecham, with the paper in your hand, my friend, I need not tell you the cause of my visit, are you interested in the sugar question? asked the editor of the ministerial paper, no, replied Beecham, I have not considered the question, a totally different subject interests me, what is it, the article relative to Morsef, indeed, is it not a curious affair, so curious, that I think you are running a great risk of a prosecution for defamation of character, not at all, we have received with the information all the requisite proofs, and we are quite sure M. de Morsef will not raise his voice against us, besides, it is rendering a service to one's country to denounce these wretched criminals who are unworthy of the honor bestowed on them. Beecham was thunderstruck. Who, then, has so correctly informed you? Asked he, for my paper, which gave the first information on the subject, has been obliged to stop for want of proof, and yet we are more interested than you in exposing M. de Morcerf, as he is a peer of France, and we are of the opposition. Oh, that is very simple, we have not sought to scandalize. This news was brought to us. A man arrived yesterday from Yanina, bringing a formidable array of documents, and when we hesitated to publish the accusatory article, he told us it should be inserted in some other paper. Beecham understood that nothing remained but to submit, and left the office to dispatch a courier to Morsef. But he had been unable to send to Albert the following particulars, as the events had transpired after the messenger's departure, namely, that the same day a great agitation was manifest in the House of Peers among the usually calm members of that dignified assembly. Everyone had arrived almost before the usual hour, and was conversing on a melancholy event which was to attract the attention of the public towards one of their most illustrious colleagues. Some were perusing the article, others making comments and recalling circumstances which substantiated the charges still more. The Count of Morcerf was no favorite with his colleagues. Like all upstarts, he had had recourse to a great deal of haughtiness to maintain his position. The true nobility laughed at him, the talented repelled him and the Honourable instinctively despised him. He was, in fact, in the unhappy position of the victim marked for sacrifice, the finger of God once pointed at him, everyone was prepared to raise the hue and cry. The Count of Morcerf alone was ignorant of the news. He did not take in the paper containing the defamatory article, and had passed the morning in writing letters and in trying a horse. He arrived at his usual hour, with a proud look and insolent demeanour, he alighted, passed through the corridors, and entered the house without observing the hesitation of the doorkeepers or the coolness of his colleagues. Business had already been going on for half an hour when he entered. Everyone held the accusing paper, but, as usual, no one liked to take upon himself the responsibility of the attack. At length an honorable peer, Morserf's acknowledged enemy, ascended the tribune with a solemnity which announced that the expected moment had arrived. There was an impressive silence. More surf alone knew not why such profound attention was given to a narrator who was not always listened to with so much complacency. The Count did not notice the introduction, in which the speaker announced that his communication would be of that vital importance that it demanded the undivided attention of the house, but at the mention of Yanina and Colonel Fernand, he turned so frightfully pale that every member shuddered and fixed his eyes upon him. Moral wounds have this peculiarity, they may be hidden, but they never close, always painful always ready to bleed when touched, they remain fresh and open in the heart. The article having been read during the painful hush that followed, a universal shudder pervaded the assembly. And immediately the closest attention was given to the orator as he resumed his remarks. He stated his scruples and the difficulties of the case, it was the honor of M. de Morcerf, and that of the whole house, he proposed to defend, by provoking a debate on personal questions, which are always such painful themes of discussion. He concluded by calling for an investigation, which might dispose of the calumnious report before it had time to spread, 
and restore M. de Morcerf to the position he had long held in public opinion. Morcerf was so completely overwhelmed by this great and unexpected calamity that he could scarcely stammer a few words as he looked around on the assembly. This timidity, which might proceed from the astonishment of innocence as well as the shame of guilt, conciliated some in his favor, for men who are truly generous are always ready to compassionate when the misfortune of their enemy surpasses the limits of their hatred. The president put it to the vote, and it was decided that the investigation should take place. The count was asked what time he required to prepare his defense. Morcerf's courage had revived when he found himself alive after this horrible blow. My lords, answered he, it is not by time I could repel the attack made on me by enemies unknown to me, and, doubtless, hidden in obscurity, it is immediately, and by a thunderbolt, that I must repel the flash of lightning which, for a moment, startled me. Oh, that I could, instead of taking up this defense, shed my last drop of blood to prove to my noble colleagues that I am their equal in worth. These words made a favorable impression on behalf of the accused. I demand, then, that the examination shall take place as soon as possible, and I will furnish the house with all necessary information. What day do you fix? Asked the president. Today I am at your service, replied the count. The president rang the bell. Does the house approve that the examination should take place today? Yes, was the unanimous answer. A committee of twelve members was chosen to examine the proofs brought forward by Morserf. The investigation would begin at eight o'clock that evening in the committee room, and if postponement were necessary, the proceedings would be resumed each evening at the same hour. Morser asked leave to retire. He had to collect the documents he had long been preparing against this storm, which his sagacity had foreseen. Albert listened, trembling now with hope, then with anger, and then again with shame, for from Beecham's confidence he knew his father was guilty, and he asked himself how, since he was guilty, he could prove his innocence. Beecham hesitated to continue his narrative. What next? asked Albert. What next? My friend, you impose a painful task on me. Must you know all? Absolutely, and rather from your lips than another's. Muster up all your courage, then, for never have you required it more. Albert passed his hand over his forehead, as if to try his strength, as a man who is preparing to defend his life proves his shield and bends his sword. He thought himself strong enough, for he mistook fever for energy. Go on, said he. The evening arrived, all Paris was in expectation. Many said your father had only to show himself to crush the charge against him, many others said he would not appear, while some asserted that they had seen him start for Brussels, and others went to the police office to inquire if he had taken out a passport. I used all my influence with one of the committee, a young peer of my acquaintance, to get admission to one of the galleries. He called for me at seven o'clock, and, before anyone had arrived, asked one of the doorkeepers to place me in a box. I was concealed by a column, and might witness the whole of the terrible scene which was about to take place. At eight o'clock all were in their places, and Dem. De Morserf entered at the last stroke. He held some papers in his hand, his countenance was calm, and his step firm, and he was dressed with great care in his military uniform, which was buttoned completely up to the chin. His presence produced a good effect. The committee was made up of liberals several of whom came forward to shake hands with him. Albert felt his heart bursting at these particulars. But gratitude mingled with his sorrow. He would gladly have embraced those who had given his father this proof of esteem at a moment when his honor was so powerfully attacked. At this moment one of the doorkeepers brought in a letter for the president. You are at liberty to speak, M. De Morserf, said the president, as he unsealed the letter, and the count began his defense, I assure you, Albert, in a most eloquent and skillful manner. He produced documents proving that the vizier of Yanina had up to the last moment honored him with his entire confidence, since he had interested him with a negotiation of life and death with the emperor. He produced the ring, his mark of authority, with which Ali Pasha generally sealed his letters, and which the latter had given him, that he might, on his return at any hour of the day or night, gain access to the presence, even in the harem. Unfortunately, the negotiation failed, and when he returned to defend his benefactor, he was dead. But, said the count, so great was Ali Pasha's confidence, that on his deathbed he resigned his favorite mistress and her daughter to my care. Albert started on hearing these words, the history of Hadil recurred to him, and he remembered what she had said of that message and the ring, and the manner in which she had been sold and made a slave. And what effect did this discourse produce? Anxiously inquired Albert. I acknowledge it affected me, and, indeed, all the committee also, said Beecham. Meanwhile, the president carelessly opened the letter which had been brought to him, 
But the first lines roused his attention, he read them again and again, and fixing his eyes on M. De Morcerf, Count, said he, you have said that the vizier of Yainina confided his wife and daughter to your care, yes, sir, replied Morcerf, but in that, like all the rest, misfortune pursued me. On my return, Vasiliki and her daughter Hadi had disappeared, did you know them? My intimacy with the Pasha and his unlimited confidence had gained me an introduction to them, and I had seen them above twenty times. Have you any idea what became of them? Yes, sir, I heard they had fallen victims to their sorrow, and, perhaps, to their poverty. I was not rich, my life was in constant danger, I could not seek them, to my great regret. The President frowned imperceptibly. Gentlemen, said he, you have heard the Comte de Morcerf's defense. Can you, sir? produce any witnesses to the truth of what you have asserted, alas, no, monsieur, replied the count, all those who surrounded the vizier, or who knew me at his court, are either dead or gone away, I know not where, I believe that I alone, of all my countrymen, survived that dreadful war, I have only the letters of Ali Tapolini, which I have placed before you, the ring, the token of his goodwill, which is here, and, lastly, the most convincing proof I can offer, after an anonymous attack, and that is the absence of any witness against my veracity and the purity of my military life. A murmur of approbation ran through the assembly, and at this moment, Albert, of nothing more transpired, your father's cause had been gained. It only remained to put it to the vote, when the president resumed, gentlemen and you, monsieur, you will not be displeased, I presume, to listen to one who calls himself a very important witness, and who has just presented himself. He is, doubtless, come to prove the perfect innocence of our colleague. Here is a letter I have just received on the subject, shall it be read, or shall it be passed over? And shall we take no notice of this incident? M. De Morcerf turned pale, and clenched his hands on the papers he held. The committee decided to hear the letter, the Count was thoughtful and silent. The President read, dash, Mr. President, I can furnish the committee of inquiry into the conduct of the Lieutenant General the Count of Morcerf in Epirus and in Macedonia with important particulars. The President paused the count turned pale. The president looked at his auditors. Proceed, was heard on all sides. The president resumed, dash, I was on the spot at the death of Ali Pasha. I was present during his last moments. I know what is become of Vasiliki and Hayde. I am at the command of the committee, and even claim the honor of being heard. I shall be in the lobby when this note is delivered to you, and who is this witness, or rather this enemy? Asked the count, in a tone in which there was a visible alteration. We shall know, sir, replied the president. Is the committee willing to hear this witness? Yes, yes, they all said at once. The doorkeeper was called. Is there anyone in the lobby? Said the president. Yes, sir, who is it, a woman, accompanied by a servant? Everyone looked at his neighbor. Bring her in, said the president. Five minutes after the doorkeeper again appeared, all eyes were fixed on the door, and I, said Beecham, shared the general expectation and anxiety. Behind the doorkeeper walked a woman enveloped in a large veil, which completely concealed her. It was evident, from her figure and the perfumes she had about her, that she was young and fastidious in her tastes, but that was all. The president requested her to throw aside her veil, and it was then seen that she was dressed in the Grecian costume, and was remarkably beautiful. Ah, said Albert, it was she, who, Hayde, who told you that, alas, I get it. But go on, Beecham. You see I am calm and strong and yet we must be drawing near the disclosure, M. De Morcerf, continued Beecham, looked at this woman with surprise and terror. Her lips were about to pass his sentence of life or death. To the committee the adventure was so extraordinary and curious, that the interest they had felt for the Count's safety became now quite a secondary matter. The President himself advanced to place a seat for the young lady, but she declined availing herself of it. As for the Count, he had fallen on his chair, it was evident that his legs refused to support him. Madame, said the President, you have engaged to furnish the committee with some important particulars respecting the affair at Yanina, and you have stated that you were an eyewitness of the event. I was, indeed, said the stranger, with a tone of sweet melancholy, and with a sonorous voice peculiar to the East. But allow me to say that you must have been very young then, I was four years old, but as those events deeply concerned me, not a single detail has escaped my memory. In what manner could these events concern you? And who are you, that they should have made so deep an impression on you, on them depended my further's life, replied she. I am Hayde, the daughter of Ali Tepolini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vasiliki, his beloved wife. 
the blush of mingled pride and modesty which suddenly suffused the cheeks of the young woman, the brilliancy of her eye, and her highly important communication, produced an indescribable effect on the assembly. As for the Count, he could not have been more overwhelmed if a thunderbolt had fallen at his feet and opened an immense gulf before him. Madame, replied the President, bowing with profound respect, allow me to ask one question, it shall be the last, can you prove the authenticity of what you have now stated, I can, sir, said Hayden, drawing from under her veil a satin satchel highly perfumed, for here is the register of my birth, signed by my father and his principal officers, and that of my baptism, my father having consented to my being brought up in my mother's faith, this latter has been sealed by the grand primate of Macedonia and Epirus, and lastly, and perhaps the most important, the record of the sale of my person and that of my mother to the Armenian merchant Elka, by the French officer, who, in his infamous bargain with the Porti, had reserved as his part of the booty the wife and daughter of his benefactor, whom he sold for the sum of four hundred thousand francs. A greenish pallor spread over the Count's cheeks, and his eyes became bloodshot at these terrible imputations, which were listened to by the assembly with ominous silence. Heyday, still calm, but with a calmness more dreadful than the anger of another would have been, handed to the president the record of her sale, written in Arabic. It had been supposed some of the papers might be in the Arabian, Ramaic, or Turkish language, and the interpreter of the house was in attendance. One of the noble peers, who was familiar with the Arabic language, having studied it during the famous Egyptian campaign, followed with his eye as the translator read aloud, dash, I, Elka, a slave merchant, and purveyor of the harem of his highness, acknowledge having received for transmission to the sublime emperor, from the French lord, the Count of Monte Cristo, an emerald valued at eight hundred thousand francs, as the ransom of a young Christian slave of eleven years of age, named Hayde, the acknowledged daughter of the late Lord Ali Tepalini, Pasha of Yanina, and of Vasiliki, his favourite, she having been sold to me seven years previously, with her mother, who had died on arriving at Constantinople, by a French colonel in the service of the vizier Ali Tepalini, named Finand Mundigo. The above-mentioned purchase was made on His Highness's account, whose mandate I had, for the sum of four hundred thousand francs, given at Constantinople, by authority of His Highness, in the year one thousand two hundred and forty-seven of the Hagia era, signed Elka, that this record should have all due authority, it shall bear the imperial seal, which the vendor is bound to have affixed to it. Near the merchant's signature there was, indeed, the seal of the sublime emperor. A dreadful silence followed the reading of this document, the Count could only stare, at his gaze, fixed as if unconsciously on Hayden, seemed one of fire and blood. Madame, said the President, may reference be made to the Count of Monte Cristo, who is now, I believe, in Paris, sir, replied Hayden. The Count of Monte Cristo, my foster father, has been in Normandy the last three days, who, then, has counseled you to take this step, one for which the court is deeply indebted to you, and which is perfectly natural, considering your birth and your misfortunes, sir, replied Hayde. I have been led to take this step from a feeling of respect and grief. Although a Christian, may God forgive me, I have always sought to revenge my illustrious father. Since I set my foot in France, and knew the traitor lived in Paris, I have watched carefully. I live retired in the house of my noble protector, but I do it from choice. I love retirement and silence, because I can live with my thoughts and recollections of past days. But the Count of Monte Cristo surrounds me with every paternal care and I am ignorant of nothing which passes in the world. I learn all in the silence of my apartments, for instance, I see all the newspapers, every periodical, as well as every new piece of music, and by thus watching the course of the life of others, I learned what had transpired this morning in the House of Peers, and what was to take place this evening, then I wrote. Then, remarked the President, the Count of Monte Cristo knows nothing of your present proceedings, he is quite unaware of them, and I have but one fear is that he should disapprove of what I have done. But it is a glorious day for me, continued the young girl, raising her ardent gaze to heaven, that on which I find at last an opportunity of avenging my father. The Count had not uttered one word the whole of this time. His colleagues looked at him, and doubtless pitied his prospects, blighted under the perfumed breath of a woman. His misery was depicted in sinister lines on his countenance. M. De Morcerf, said the President, do you recognize this lady as the daughter of Ali Tepalini? Pasha of Yanina, no, said Morcerf, attempting to rise, it is a base plot, contrived by my enemies. Hayday, whose eyes had been fixed on the door, as if expecting someone, turned hastily, and, seeing the Count standing, shrieked, you do not know me, said she. Well, 
I fortunately recognize you. You are Finan Mundigo, the French officer who led the troops of my noble father. It is you who surrendered the castle of Yanina. It is you who, sent by him to Constantinople, to treat with the Emperor for the life or death of your benefactor, brought back a false mandate granting full pardon. It is you who, with that mandate, obtained the Pasha's ring, which gave you authority over Selim, the firekeeper. It is you who stabbed Selim. It is you who sold us, my mother and me, to the merchant, Elko. Assassin, 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 you have still on your brow your master's blood. Look, gentlemen, all. These words had been pronounced with such enthusiasm and evident truth, that every eye was fixed on the Count's forehead, and he himself passed his hand across it, as if he felt Ali's blood still lingering there. You positively recognize M. de Morcerf as the officer, Fernand Mundigo, indeed I do, cried Hayde. Oh, my mother, it was you who said, you were free, you had a beloved father, you were destined to be almost a queen. Look well at that man, it is he who raised your father's head on the point of a spear, it is he who sold us, it is he who forsook us. Look well at his right hand, on which he has a large wound, if you forgot his features, you would know him by that hand, into which fell, one by one, the gold pieces of the merchant Elka. I know him. Ah, let him say now if he does not recognize me. Each word fell like a dagger on Morsurf, and deprived him of a portion of his energy, as she uttered the last, he hid his mutilated hand hastily in his bosom, and fell back on his seat, overwhelmed by wretchedness and despair. This scene completely changed the opinion of the assembly respecting the accused Count, Count of Morsurf, said the President, do not allow yourself to be cast down, answer. The justice of the court is supreme and impartial as that of God, it will not suffer you to be trampled on by your enemies without giving you an opportunity of defending yourself. Shall further inquiries be made? Shall two members of the house be sent to Yanina? Speak. Morsurf did not reply. Then all the members looked at each other with terror. They knew the Count's energetic and violent temper, it must be, indeed, a dreadful blow which would deprive him of courage to defend himself. They expected that his stupefied silence would be followed by a fiery outburst. Well, asked the President, what is your decision? I have no reply to make, said the Count in a low tone. Has the daughter of Ali Tepolini spoken the truth? said the President. Is she, then, the terrible witness to whose charge you dare not plead not guilty? Have you really committed the crimes of which you are accused? The Count looked around him with an expression which might have softened tigers, but which could not disarm his judges. Then he raised his eyes towards the ceiling, but withdrew then, immediately, as if he feared the roof would open and reveal to his distressed view that second tribunal called heaven, and that other judge named God. Then, with a hasty movement, he tore open his coat, which seemed to stifle him, and flew from the room like a madman. His footstep was heard one moment in the corridor, then the rattling of his carriage wheels as he was driven rapidly away. Gentlemen, said the President, when silence was restored, is the Count of Morserf convicted of felony? treason, and conduct unbecoming a member of this house, yes, replied all the members of the committee of inquiry with a unanimous voice, Hayde had remained until the close of the meeting. She heard the Count's sentence pronounced without betraying an expression of joy or pity, then drawing her veil over her face she bowed majestically to the councillors, and left with that dignified step which Virgil attributes to his goddesses, chapter 87 The Challenge. Then, continued Beecham, I took advantage of the silence and the darkness to leave the house without being seen. The usher who had introduced me was waiting for me at the door, and he conducted me through the corridors to a private entrance opening into the Rue de Vegarard. I left with mingled feelings of sorrow and delight. Excuse me, Albert, sorrow on your account, and delight with that noble girl, thus pursuing paternal vengeance. Yes, Albert, from whatever source the blow may have proceeded, it may be from an enemy, but that enemy is only the agent of providence. Albert held his head between his hands, he raised his face, red with shame and bathed in tears, and seizing Beecham's arm, my friend, said he, my life is ended. I cannot calmly say with you, Providence has struck the blow, but I must discover who pursues me with this hatred, and when I have found him I shall kill him, or he will kill me. I rely on your friendship to assist me, Beecham, if contempt has not banished it from your heart. Contempt, my friend? How does this misfortune affect you? No. Happily that unjust prejudice is forgotten which made the son responsible for the father's actions. Review your life, Albert, although it is only just beginning. Did a lovely summer's day ever dawn with greater purity than has marked the commencement of your career? No, Albert, take my advice. You are young and rich, leave Paris, 
All is soon forgotten in this great Babylon of excitement and changing tastes. You will return after three or four years with a Russian princess for a bride, and no one will think more of what occurred yesterday than if it had happened sixteen years ago. Thank you, my dear Beecham, thank you for the excellent feeling which prompts your advice. But it cannot be. I have told you my wish, or rather my determination. You understand that, interested as I am in this affair, I cannot see it in the same light as you do. What appears to you to emanate from a celestial source, seems to me to proceed from one far less pure. Providence appears to me to have no share in this affair, and happily so, for instead of the invisible, impalpable agent of celestial rewards and punishments, I shall find one both palpable and visible, on whom I shall revenge myself, I assure you, for all I have suffered during the last month. Now, I repeat, Beecham, I wish to return to human and material existence, and if you are still the friend you profess to be, help me to discover the hand that struck the blow, be it so, said Beecham, if you must have me descend to earth. I submit, and if you will seek your enemy, I will assist you, and I will engage to find him, my honor being almost as deeply interested as yours. Well, then, you understand, Beecham, that we begin our search immediately. Each moment's delay is an eternity for me. The calumniator is not yet punished, and he may hope that he will not be, but, on my honor, if he thinks so, he deceives himself. Well, listen, Morsef, ah, Beecham, I see you know something already. You will restore me to life, I do not say there is any truth in what I am going to tell you, but it is, at least, a ray of light in a dark night, by following it we may, perhaps, discover something more certain, tell me, satisfy my impatience, well, I will tell you what I did not like to mention on my return from Yeanina, say on, I went, of course, to the chief banker of the town to make inquiries, at the first word, before I had even mentioned your father's name Dash, ah, said he, I guess what brings you here, how, and why, because a fortnight since I was questioned on the same subject, by whom, by a Paris banker, my correspondent, whose name is Dash, Dandlers, he, cried Albert, yes, it is indeed he who has so long pursued my father with jealous hatred. He, the man who would be popular, cannot forgive the Count of Morcerf for being created a peer, and this marriage broken off without a reason being assigned, yes, it is all from the same cause, make inquiries, Albert but do not be angry without reason, make inquiries, and if it be true dash, oh, yes, if it be true, cried the young man, he shall pay me all I have suffered, beware, more serve, he is already an old man, I will respect his age as he has respected the honor of my family, if my father had offended him, why did he not attack him personally, oh, no, he was afraid to encounter him face to face, I do not condemn you, Albert, I only restrain you, act prudently, oh, do not fear, besides, you will accompany me. Each em, solemn transactions should be sanctioned by a witness. Before this day closes, if M. Dandlers is guilty, he shall cease to live, or I shall die. Pardy, each em, mine shall be a splendid funeral. When such resolutions are made, Albert, they should be promptly executed. Do you wish to go to M. Dandlers? Let us go immediately. They sent for a cabriolet. On entering the banker's mansion, they perceived the Phaeton and servant of M. Andrea Cavalcanti. Ah, parbley, that's good, said Albert, with a gloomy tone. If M. Dandlers will not fight with me, I will kill his son-in-law, Cavalcanti will certainly fight. The servant announced the young man, but the banker, recollecting what had transpired the day before, did not wish him admitted. It was, however, too late, Albert had followed the footman, and, hearing the order given, forced the door open and followed by Beecham found himself in the banker's study. Sir, cried the latter, am I no longer at liberty to receive whom I choose in my house? You appear to forget yourself sadly. No, sir, said Albert, coldly, there are circumstances in which one cannot, except through cowardice, I offer you that refuge, refuse to admit certain persons at least. What is your errand, then, with me, sir? I mean, said Albert, drawing near, and without apparently noticing Cavalcanti, stood with his back towards the fireplace, I mean to propose a meeting in some retired corner where no one will interrupt us for ten minutes, that will be sufficient, where two men having met, one of them will remain on the ground. Dandlers turned pale, Cavalcanti moved a step forward, and Albert turned towards him. And you, too, said he, come, if you like, monsieur, you have a claim, being almost one of the family, and I will give as many rendezvous of that kind as I can find persons willing to accept them. 
Cavalcanti looked at Dantlers with a stupefied air, and the latter, making an effort, arose and stepped between the two young men. Albert's attack on Andrea had placed him on a different footing, and he hoped this visit had another cause than that he had at first supposed. Indeed, sir, said he to Albert, if you are come to quarrel with this gentleman because I have preferred him to you, I shall resign the case to the king's attorney. You mistake, sir, said Morserf with a gloomy smile, I am not referring in the least to matrimony, and I only addressed myself to M. Cavalcanti because he appeared disposed to interfere between us. In one respect you are right, for I am ready to quarrel with everyone today. But you have the first claim, M. Dandlers, sir, replied Dandlers, pale with anger and fear, I warn you. When I have the misfortune to meet with a mad dog, I kill it, and far from thinking myself guilty of a crime, I believe I do society a kindness. Now, if you are mad and try to bite me, I will kill you without pity. Is it my fault that your father has dishonored himself? Yes, miserable wretch, cried Morserf. It is your fault. Dandlers retreated a few steps. My fault? said he, you must be mad. What do I know of the Grecian affair? Have I travelled in that country? Did I advise your father to sell the castle of Yanina, to betray Dash, silence? said Albert, with a thundering voice. No, it is not you who have directly made this exposure and brought this sorrow on us, but you hypocritically provoked it. I? Yes, you. How came it known? I suppose you read it in the paper in the account from Yanina, who wrote to Yanina, to Yanina? Yes. Who wrote for particulars concerning my father? I imagine any one may write to Yanina. But one person only wrote. One only? Yes, and that was you. I, doubtless, wrote. It appears to me that when about to marry your daughter to a young man, it is right to make some inquiries respecting his family. It is not only a right, to duty, you wrote, sir, knowing what answer you would receive. I, indeed. I assure you, cried Dantlers, with a confidence and security proceeding less from fear than from the interest he really felt for the young man. I solemnly declare to you, that I should never have thought of writing to Yanina. Did I know anything of Ali Pasha's misfortunes, who, then, urged you to write? Tell me, Pardi, it was the most simple thing in the world. I was speaking of your father's past history. I said the origin of his fortune remained obscure. The person to whom I addressed my scruples asked me where your father had acquired his property. I answered, in Greece, then, said he, write to Yanina, and who thus advised you? no other than your friend, Monte Cristo. The Count of Monte Cristo told you to write to Yanina? Yes, and I wrote, and will show you my correspondence, if you like. Albert and Beecham looked at each other. Sir, said Beecham, who had not yet spoken, you appear to accuse the Count, who is absent from Paris at this moment, and cannot justify himself. I accuse no one, sir, said Dantlers, I relate, and I will repeat before the Count what I have said to you. Does the Count know what answer you received? Yes. I showed it to him. Did he know my father's Christian name was Fernand, and his family name Mundigo? Yes, I had told him that long since, and I did only what any other would have done in my circumstances, and perhaps less. When, the day after the arrival of this answer, your father came by the advice of Monte Cristo to ask my daughter's hand for you, I decidedly refused him, but without any explanation or exposure. In short, why should I have any more to do with the affair? How did the honor or disgrace of M? De Morserf affect me? It neither increased nor decreased my income. Albert felt the blood mounting to his brow, there was no doubt upon the subject. Dandlers defended himself with the baseness, but at the same time with the assurance, of a man who speaks the truth, at least in part, if not wholly, not for conscience' sake, but through fear. Besides, what was Morserf seeking? It was not whether Dandlers or Monte Cristo was more or less guilty, it was a man who would answer for the offence, whether trifling or serious. It was a man who would fight, and it was evident Dantlers would not fight. And, in addition to this, everything forgotten or unperceived before presented itself now to his recollection. Monte Cristo knew everything, as he had bought the daughter of Ali Pasha, and, knowing everything, he had advised Dantlers to write to Yanina. The answer known. He had yielded to Albert's wish to be introduced to Hayday, and allowed the conversation to turn on the death of Ali, and had not opposed Hayday's recital, but having, doubtless, warned the young girl, in the few Ramaic words he spoke to her, not to implicate Morserf's father. Besides, had he not begged of Morserf not to mention his father's name before Hayday? Lastly, he had taken Albert to Normandy when he knew the final blow was near. There could be no doubt that all had been calculated and previously arranged, Monte Cristo then was in league with his father's enemies. 
Albert took Beecham aside, and communicated these ideas to him. You are right, said the latter, M. Dandlers has only been a secondary agent in this sad affair, and it is of M. de Monte Cristo that you must demand an explanation. Albert turned. Sir, said he to Dandlers, understand that I do not take a final leave of you, I must ascertain if your insinuations are just, and I'm going now to inquire of the Count of Monte Cristo. He bowed to the banker, and went out with Beecham, without appearing to notice Cavalcanti. Dandlers accompanied him to the door, where he again assured Albert that no motive of personal hatred had influenced him against the Count of Morsef. Chapter 88 The Insult At the banker's door Beecham stopped Morsef. Listen, said he, just now I told you it was of M. De Monte Cristo you must demand an explanation. Yes, and we are going to his house. Reflect, Morsef, one moment before you go. On what shall I reflect? On the importance of the step you are taking. Is it more serious than going to M. Danglers? Yes, M. Dandlers is a money lover, and those who love money, you know, think too much of what they risk to be easily induced to fight a duel. The other is, on the contrary, to all appearance a true nobleman, but do you not fear to find him a bully? I only fear one thing, namely, to find a man who will not fight. Do not be alarmed, said Beecham, he will meet you. My only fear is that he will be too strong for you, my friend, said Morsef, with a sweet smile. It is what I wish. The happiest thing that could occur to me, would be to die in my father's stead, but it would save us all, your mother would die of grief, my poor mother, said Albert, passing his hand across his eyes, I know she would, but better so than die of shame, are you quite decided, Albert, yes, let us go, but do you think we shall find the Count at home, he intended returning some hours after me, and doubtless he is now at home, they ordered the driver to take them to number 30 Champs Elise, eh, Beecham wished to go in alone, Albert observed that as this was an unusual circumstance he might be allowed to deviate from the usual etiquette in affairs of honor. The cause which the young man espoused was one so sacred that Beecham had only to comply with all his wishes, he yielded and contented himself with following Morsef. Albert sprang from the porter's lodge to the steps. He was received by Baptistin. The Count had, indeed, just arrived, but he was in his bath, and had forbidden that any one should be admitted. But after his bath, asked Morsef. My master will go to dinner, and after dinner, he will sleep an hour, then, he is going to the opera, are you sure of it? asked Albert. Quite, sir, my master has ordered his horses at eight o'clock precisely. Very good, replied Albert, that is all I wish to know. Then, turning towards Beecham, if you have anything to attend to, Beecham, do it directly, if you have any appointment for this evening, defer it till tomorrow. I depend on you to accompany me to the opera, and if you can bring Chattery Nord with you. Beecham availed himself of Albert's permission, and left him, promising to call for him at a quarter before eight. On his return home, Albert expressed his wish to France de Bray, and Morrill, to see them at the opera that evening. Then he went to see his mother, who since the events of the day before had refused to see anyone, and had kept her room. He found her in bed, overwhelmed with grief at this public humiliation. The sight of Albert produced the effect which might naturally be expected on Mercedes. She pressed her son's hand and sobbed aloud, but her tears relieved her. Albert stood one moment speechless by the side of his mother's bed. It was evident from his pale face and knit brows that his resolution to revenge himself was growing weaker. My dear mother, said he, do you know if M. de Morcerf has any enemy? Mercedes started, she noticed that the young man did not say my father. My son, she said, persons in the Count's situation have many secret enemies. Those who are known are not the most dangerous, I know it, an appeal to your penetration. You are of so superior a mind, nothing escapes you, why do you say so, because, for instance, you noticed on the evening of the ball we gave, that M. de Monte Cristo would eat nothing in our house. Mercedes raised herself on her feverish arm. M. de Monte Cristo. She exclaimed, and how is he connected with the question you asked me, you know, mother, M. De Monte Cristo is almost an Oriental, and it is customary with the Orientals to secure full liberty for revenge by not eating or drinking in the houses of their enemies, do you say M. De Monte Cristo is our enemy? replied Mercedes, coming paler than the sheet which covered her. Who told you so? Why, you are mad, Albert. M. De Monte Cristo has only shown us kindness. M. De Monte Cristo saved your life, you yourself presented him to us. Oh, I entreat you. My son, if you had entertained such an idea, dispel it, and my counsel to you, nay, my prayer, 
is to retain his friendship. Mother, replied the young man, you have especial reasons for telling me to conciliate that man. I, said Mercedes, blushing as rapidly as she had turned pale, and again becoming paler than ever. Yes, doubtless, and is it not that he may never do us any harm? Mercedes shuddered, and, fixing on her son a scrutinizing gaze, you speak strangely, said she to Albert, and you appear to have some singular prejudices. What has the Count done? Three days since you were with him in Normandy, only three days since we looked on him as our best friend. An ironical smile passed over Albert's lips. Mercedes saw it and with a double instinct of woman and mother guessed all, but as she was prudent and strong-minded she concealed both her sorrows and her fears. Albert was silent, an instant after, the Countess resumed, you came to inquire after my health, I will candidly acknowledge that I am not well. You should install yourself here, and cheer my solitude. I do not wish to be left alone, mother, said the young man, you know how gladly I would obey your wish, but an urgent and important affair obliges me to leave you for the whole evening. Well, replied Mercedes, sighing, oh, Albert, I will not make you a slave to your filial piety. Albert pretended he did not hear, bowed to his mother, and quitted her. Scarcely had he shut her door, when Mercedes called a confidential servant, and ordered him to follow Albert wherever he should go that evening, and to come and tell her immediately what he observed. Then she rang for her lady's maid, and, weak as she was, she dressed, in order to be ready for whatever might happen. The footman's mission was an easy one. Albert went to his room, and dressed with unusual care. At ten minutes to eight Beecham arrived, he had seen Chattery Nord, who had promised to be in the orchestra before the curtain was raised. Both got into Albert's coupe, and, as the young man had no reason to conceal where he was going, he called aloud, to the opera. In his impatience he arrived before the beginning of the performance. Chattery Nord was at his post, apprised by Beecham of the circumstances. He required no explanation from Albert. The conduct of the son in seeking to avenge his father was so natural that Chattery Nord did not seek to dissuade him, and was content with renewing his assurances of devotion. Debray was not yet come, but Albert knew that he seldom lost a scene at the opera. Albert wandered about the theatre until the curtain was drawn up. He hoped to meet with M. de Monte Cristo either in the lobby or on the stairs. The bell summoned him to his seat, and he entered the orchestra with Chattery and Norden Beecham. But his eyes scarcely quitted the box between the columns, which remained obstinately closed during the whole of the first act. At last, as Albert was looking at his watch for about the hundredth time, at the beginning of the second act the door opened, and Monte Cristo entered, dressed in black, and, leaning over the front of the box, looked around the pit. Morrell followed him, and looked also for his sister and brother-in-law. He soon discovered them in another box, and kissed his hand to them. The Count, in his survey of the pit, encountered a pale face and threatening eyes, which evidently sought to gain his attention. He recognized Albert, but thought it better not to notice him, as he looked so angry and discomposed. Without communicating his thoughts to his companion, he sat down, drew out his opera glass, and looked another way. Although apparently not noticing Albert, he did not, however, lose sight of him, and when the curtain fell at the end of the second act, he saw him leave the orchestra with his two friends. Then his head was seen passing at the back of the boxes, and the Count knew that the approaching storm was intended to fall on him. He was at the moment conversing cheerfully with Morrill, but he was well prepared for what might happen. The door opened, and Monte Cristo, turning round, saw Albert, pale and trembling, followed by Beecham and Chattery Nord. Well, cried he, with that benevolent politeness which distinguished his salutation from the common civilities of the world, my cavalier has attained his object. Good evening, M. De Morcerf. The countenance of this man, who possessed such extraordinary control over his feelings, expressed the most perfect cordiality. Morrill only then recollected the letter he had received from the Viscount, in which, without assigning any reason, he begged him to go to the opera. But he understood that something terrible was brooding. We are not come here, sir, to exchange hypocritical expressions of politeness, or false professions of friendship, said Albert, but to demand an explanation. The young man's trembling voice was scarcely audible. An explanation at the opera? said the Count, with that calm tone and penetrating eye which characterize the man who knows his cause is good. Little acquainted as I am with the habits of Parisians, I should not have thought this the place for such a demand. Still, if people will shut themselves up, said Albert, and cannot be seen because they are bathing, dining, or asleep, we must avail ourselves of the opportunity whenever they are to be seen. I am not difficult of access, sir for yesterday, if my memory does not deceive me, you were at my house, yesterday I was at your house, 
Sir, said the young man, because then I knew not who you were. In pronouncing these words Albert had raised his voice so as to be heard by those in the adjoining boxes and in the lobby. Thus the attention of many was attracted by this altercation. Where are you come from, sir? You do not appear to be in the possession of your senses, provided I understand your perfidy, sir, and succeed in making you understand that I will be revenged, I shall be reasonable enough, said Albert furiously. I do not understand you, sir, replied Monte Cristo, and if I did, your tone is too high. I am at home here, and I alone have a right to raise my voice above another's. Leave the box, sir. Monte Cristo pointed towards the door with the most commanding dignity. Ah, I shall know how to make you leave your home, replied Albert, clasping in his convulsed grasp the glove, which Monte Cristo did not lose sight of. Well, well, said Monte Cristo quietly, I see you wish to quarrel with me, but I would give you one piece of advice, which you will do well to keep in mind. It is in poor taste to make a display of a challenge. Display is not becoming to everyone, M. De Morcerf. At this name a murmur of astonishment passed around the group of spectators of this scene. They had talked of no one but Morcerf the whole day. Albert understood the illusion in a moment, and was about to throw his glove at the Count, when Morrel seized his hand, while Beecham and Chattery Nord, fearing the scene would surpass the limits of a challenge, held him back. But Monte Cristo, without rising, and leaning forward in his chair, merely stretched out his arm and, taking the damp, crushed glove from the clenched hand of the young man, Sir, said he in a solemn tone, I consider your glove thrown, and will return it to you wrapped around a bullet. Now leave me or I will summon my servants to throw you out at the door. Wild, almost unconscious, and with eyes inflamed, Albert stepped back, and Morrel closed the door. Monte Cristo took up his glass again as if nothing had happened, his face was like marble, and his heart was like bronze. Morrel whispered, What have you done to him, I? Nothing, at least personally, said Monte Cristo, but there must be some cause for this strange scene. The Count of Morcerf's adventure exasperates the young man. Have you anything to do with it? It was through Haydé that the chamber was informed of his father's treason, indeed, said Morrel. I had been told, I would not credit it, that the Grecian slave I have seen with you here in this very box was the daughter of Ali Pasha, it is true, nevertheless, then, said Morrel. I understand it all, and this scene was premeditated, how so, yes. Albert wrote to request me to come to the opera, doubtless that I might be a witness to the insult he meant to offer you, probably, said Monte Cristo with his imperturbable tranquility. But what shall you do with him, with whom, with Albert, what shall I do with Albert? As certainly, Maximilian, as I now press your hand, I shall kill him before ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Moral, in his turn, took Monte Cristo's hand in both of his and he shuddered to feel how cold and steady it was. Ah, Count, said he, his father loves him so much. Do not speak to me of that, said Monte Cristo, with the first movement of anger he had betrayed, I will make him suffer. Moral, amazed, let fall Monte Cristo's hand. Count, Count, said he, dear Maximilian, interrupted the Count, listen how adorably Duprez is singing that line, dash, O oh Matilda, I dold I was the first to discover Duprez at Naples and the first to applaud him. Bravo, bravo. Morrel saw it was useless to say more, and refrained. The curtain, which had risen at the close of the scene with Albert, again fell, and a rap was heard at the door. Come in, said Monte Cristo with a voice that betrayed not the least emotion, and immediately Beecham appeared. Good evening, M. Beecham, said Monte Cristo, as if this was the first time he had seen the journalist that evening. Be seated, Beecham bowed, and, sitting down, Sir, said he, I just now accompanied them. De Morcerf, as you saw. And that means, replied Monte Cristo, laughing, that you had, probably, just dined together. I am happy to see, M. Beecham, that you are more sober than he was, sir, said M. Beecham, Albert was wrong, I acknowledge, to betray so much anger, and I come, on my own account, to apologize for him. And having done so, entirely on my own account, be it understood, I would add that I believe you too gentlemanly to refuse giving him some explanation concerning your connection with Yanina. Then I will add two words about the young Greek girl. Monte Cristo motioned him to be silent. Come, said he, laughing, there are all my hopes about to be destroyed, how so? Asked Beecham, doubtless you wish to make me appear a very eccentric character. I am, in your opinion, a Lara, a Manfred, a Lord Ruthven, then, just as I am arriving at the climax, you defeat your own end, and seek to make an ordinary man of me. 
You bring me down to your own level, demand explanations. Indeed, M. Beecham, it is quite laughable. Yet, replied Beecham haughtily, there are occasions when probity commands dash. M. Beecham, interposed this strange man. The Count of Monte Cristo bows to none but the Count of Monte Cristo himself. Say no more, I entreat you. I do what I please, M. Beecham, and it is always well done, sir, replied the young man. Honest men are not to be paid with such coin. I require honorable guarantees, I am, sir, a living guarantee, replied Monte Cristo, motionless, but with a threatening look, we have both blood in our veins which we wish to shed, that is our mutual guarantee. Tell the Viscount so, and that tomorrow, before ten o'clock, I shall see what color his is, then I have only to make arrangements for the duel, said Beecham. It is quite immaterial to me, said Monte Cristo, and it was very unnecessary to disturb me at the opera for such a trifle. In France people fight with the sword or pistol, in the colonies with the carbine, in Arabia with the dagger. Tell your client that, although I am the insulted party, in order to carry out my eccentricity, I leave him the choice of arms, and will accept without discussion, without dispute, anything, even combat by drawing lots, which is always stupid, but with me different from other people, as I am sure to gain, sure to gain. Repeated Beecham, looking with amazement at the Count, certainly, said Monte Cristo, slightly shrugging his shoulders, otherwise I would not fight with M. De Morcerf. I shall kill him, I cannot help it. Only by a single line this evening at my house let me know the arms and the hour, I do not like to be kept waiting, pistols, then, at eight o'clock, in the boys de Vincennes, said Beecham, quite disconcerted, not knowing if he was dealing with an arrogant braggadocio or a supernatural being, very well, sir, said Monte Cristo. Now all that is settled, do let me see the performance, Tell your friend Albert not to come any more this evening, he will hurt himself with all his ill-chosen barbarisms, let him go home and go to sleep. Beecham left the box, perfectly amazed. Now, said Monte Cristo, turning towards Morrel, I may depend upon you, may I not? Certainly, said Morrel, I am at your service, Count, still dash, what? It is desirable I should know the real cause, that is to say, you would rather not? No, the young man himself is acting blindfolded and knows not the true cause, which is known only to God and to me. But I give you my word, Moral, that God, who does know it, be on our side. Enough, said Moral, who is your second witness. I know no one in Paris, Moral, on whom I could confer that honor besides you and your brother Emmanuel. Do you think Emmanuel would oblige me? I will answer for him, Count. Well? That is all I require. Tomorrow morning, at seven o'clock, you will be with me, will you not? We will. Hush. The curtain is rising. Listen. I never lose a note of this opera if I can avoid it. The music of William Tell is so sweet. Chapter 89 A Nocturnal Interview. Monte Cristo waited, according to his usual custom, until Duprez had sung his famous Suives Moy, then he rose and went out. Morrel took leave of him at the door, renewing his promise to be with him the next morning at seven o'clock, and to bring Emmanuel. Then he stepped into his coupe, calm and smiling, and was at home in five minutes. No one who knew the Count could mistake his expression when, on entering, he said, Ali, bring me my pistols with the ivory cross. Ali brought the box to his master, who examined the weapons with a solicitude very natural to a man who is about to entrust his life to a little powder and shot. These were pistols of an especial pattern, which Monte Cristo had had made for target practice in his own room. A cap was sufficient to drive out the bullet, and from the adjoining room no one would have suspected that the Count was, as sportsmen would say, keeping his hand in. He was just taking one up and looking for the point to aim at on a little iron plate which served him as a target, when his study door opened, and Baptistin entered. Before he had spoken a word, Count saw in the next room a veiled woman, who had followed closely after Baptistin, and now, seeing the Count with a pistol in his hand and swords on the table, rushed in. Baptistin looked at his master, who made a sign to him, and he went out, closing the door after him. Who are you, madam? said the Count to the veiled woman. The stranger cast one look around her, to be certain that they were quite alone, then bending as if she would have knelt, and joining her hands, she said with an accent of despair, Edmund, you will not kill my son? The Count retreated a step, uttered a slight exclamation, and let fall the pistol he held. What name did you pronounce then, Madame de Morcerf? said he. Yours, cried she, throwing back her veil, yours, which I alone, perhaps, have not forgotten. Edmund. It is not Madame de Morcerf who is come to you, it is Mercedes. Mercedes is dead. Madame, said Monte Cristo, I know no one now that name, 
Mercedes lives, sir, and she remembers, for she alone recognized you when she saw you, and even before she saw you, by your voice, Edmund, by the simple sound of your voice, and from that moment she has followed your steps, watched you, feared you, and she needs not to inquire what hand has dealt the blow which now strikes M. De Morcerf, Finand. Do you mean? replied Monte Cristo, with bitter irony, since we are recalling names, let us remember them all. Monte Cristo had pronounced the name of Fernand with such an expression of hatred that Mercedes felt a thrill of horror run through every vein. You see, Edmund, I am not mistaken, and have cause to say, spare my son, and who told you, Madame, that I have any hostile intentions against your son, no one, in truth, the mother has twofold sight. I guessed all, I followed him this evening to the opera, and, concealed in a parquet box, have seen all, if you have seen all, Madame. You know that the son of Finand has publicly insulted me, said Monte Cristo with awful calmness. Oh, for pity's sake, you have seen that he would have thrown his glove in my face if Moral, one of my friends, had not stopped him. Listen to me, my son has also guessed who you are. He attributes his father's misfortunes to you. Madame, you are mistaken, they are not misfortunes, it is a punishment. It is not I who strike him. De more, sir, it is Providence which punishes him. And why do you represent Providence? cried Mercedes. Why do you remember when it forgets? What are Yanina and its vizier to you, Edmund? What injury has Finand Mundigo done you in betraying Ali Tepolini? Ah, madame, replied Monte Cristo, all this is an affair between the French captain and the daughter of Vasiliki. It does not concern me, you are right, and if I have sworn to revenge myself, it is not on the French captain, or the Count of Morcerf, but on the fisherman Finand, the husband of Mercedes the Catalane. Ah, sir, cried the countess, how terrible a vengeance for a fault which fatality made me commit, for I am the only culprit, Edmund, and if you owe revenge to anyone, it is to me, who had not fortitude to bear your absence and my solitude, but, exclaimed Monte Cristo, why was I absent? And why were you alone? Because you had been arrested, Edmund, and were a prisoner. And why was I arrested? Why was I a prisoner? I do not know, said Mercedes. You do not? Madame, at least, I hope not. But I will tell you. I was arrested and became a prisoner because, under the arbor of La Reserve, the day before I was to marry you, a man named Dandlers wrote this letter, which the fisherman Fernand himself posted. Monte Cristo went to a secretary, opened a drawer by a spring, from which he took a paper which had lost its original color, and the ink of which had become of a rusty hue, this he placed in the hands of Mercedes. It was Dandlers' letter to the king's attorney, which the Count of Monte Cristo, disguised as a clerk from the house of Thompson and French, had taken from the file against Edmund Dantes, on the day he had paid the two hundred thousand francs to M. de Beauville. Mercedes read with terror the following lines, dash, the king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, second in command on board the Ferrara, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferro, is the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmund Dantes, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in possession of either father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dantes on board the Ferran. How dreadful! said Mercedes, passing her hand across her brow, moist with perspiration, and that letter dash, I bought it for two hundred thousand francs. Madame, said Monte Cristo, but that is a trifle since it enables me to justify myself to you, and the result of that letter dash, you well know, madame, was my arrest, but you do not know how long that arrest lasted. You do not know that I remained for fourteen years within a quarter of a league of you, in a dungeon in the Chateau d'If. You do not know that every day of those fourteen years I renewed the vow of vengeance which I had made the first day, and yet I was not aware that you had married Fernand, my calumniator, and that my father had died of hunger, can it be? cried Mercedes, shuddering. That is what I heard on leaving my prison fourteen years after I had entered it, and that is why, on account of the living Mercedes and my deceased father, I have sworn to revenge myself on Finand, and, I have revenged myself, and you are sure the unhappy Finand did that? I am satisfied. Madame, but he did what I have told you. Besides, that is not much more odious than that a Frenchman by adoption should pass over to the English, that a Spaniard by birth should have fought against the Spaniards that a stipendiary of Ali should have betrayed and murdered Ali. Compared with such things, what is the letter you have just read, a lover's deception, 
which the woman who has married that man ought certainly to forgive, but not so the lover who is to have married her. Well, the French did not avenge themselves on the traitor, the Spaniards did not shoot the traitor, Ali in his tomb left the traitor unpunished, but I, betrayed, sacrificed, buried, have risen from my tomb, by the grace of God, to punish that man. He sends me for that purpose, and here I am. The poor woman's head and arms fell, her legs bent under her, and she fell on her knees. Forgive, Edmund, forgive for my sake, who love you still. The dignity of the wife checked the fervor of the lover and the mother. Her forehead almost touched the carpet, when the count sprang forward and raised her. Then seated on a chair, she looked at the manly countenance of Monte Cristo, on which grief and hatred still impressed a threatening expression. Not crush that accursed race? murmured he, abandon my purpose at the moment of its accomplishment? Impossible. Madame, impossible. Edmund, said the poor mother, who tried every means, when I call you Edmund, why do you not call me Mercedes, Mercedes? repeated Monte Cristo, Mercedes. Well yes, you are right, that name has still its charms, and this is the first time for a long period that I have pronounced it so distinctly. Oh, Mercedes, I have uttered your name with a sigh of melancholy, with a groan of sorrow, with the last effort of despair, I have uttered it when frozen with cold, crouched on the straw in my dungeon, I have uttered it, consumed with heat, rolling on the stone floor of my prison. Mercedes, I must revenge myself, for I suffered fourteen years, fourteen years I wept, I cursed, now I tell you, Mercedes, I must revenge myself. The Count, fearing to yield to the entreaties of her he had so ardently loved, called his sufferings to the assistance of his hatred. Revenge yourself, then, Edmund, cried the poor mother, but let your vengeance fall on the culprits, on him, on me, but not on my son. It is written in the good book, said Monte Cristo, that the sins of the fathers shall fall upon their children to the third and fourth generation. Since God himself dictated those words to his prophet, why should I seek to make myself better than God? Edmund, continued Mercedes, with her arms extended towards the Count, since I first knew you, I have adored your name, have respected your memory. Edmund, my friend, do not compel me to tarnish that noble and pure image reflected incessantly on the mirror of my heart. Edmund, if you knew all the prayers I have addressed to God for you while I thought you were living and since I have thought you must be dead. Yes, dead, alas. I imagined your dead body buried at the foot of some gloomy tower, or cast to the bottom of a pit by hateful jailers, and I wept. What could I do for you, Edmund? Besides pray and weep. Listen, for ten years I dreamed each night the same dream. I had been told that you had endeavored to escape, that you had taken the place of another prisoner, that you had slipped into the winding sheet of a dead body that you had been thrown alive from the top of the Chateau d'If, and that the cry you uttered as you dashed upon the rocks first revealed to your jailers that they were your murderers. Well, Edmund, I swear to you, by the head of that son for whom I entreat your pity, Edmund, for ten years I saw every night every detail of that frightful tragedy, and for ten years I heard every night the cry which awoke me, shuddering and cold. And I, too, Edmund, oh! Believe me, guilty as I was, oh, yes, I, too, have suffered much. Have you known what it is to have your father starve to death in your absence? cried Monte Cristo, thrusting his hands into his hair. Have you seen the woman you loved giving her hand to your rival, while you were perishing at the bottom of a dungeon? No, interrupted Mercedes, but I have seen him whom I loved on the point of murdering my son. Mercedes uttered these words with such deep anguish, with an accent of such intense despair, that Monte Cristo could not restrain a sob. The lion was daunted, the avenger was conquered. What do you ask of me? said he, your son's life? Well, he shall live. Mercedes uttered the cry which made the tears start from Monte Cristo's eyes, but these tears disappeared almost instantaneously, for, doubtless, God had sent some angel to collect them, far more precious were they in his eyes than the richest pearls of Gazarat and Offer, oh, said she, seizing the Count's hand and raising it to her lips, oh, thank you, thank you, Edmund. Now you are exactly what I dreamt you were, the man I always loved. Oh, now I may say so, so much the better, replied Monte Cristo, as that poor Edmund will not have long to be loved by you. Death is about to return to the tomb, the phantom to retire in darkness, what do you say, Edmund? I say, since you command me, Mercedes, I must die, die? And why so? Who talks of dying? Whence have you these ideas of death? You do not suppose that, publicly outraged in the face of a whole theatre, in the presence of your friends and those of your son, challenged by a boy who will glory in my forgiveness as if it were a victory, you do not suppose that I can for one moment wish to live. 
What I most loved after you, Mercedes, was myself, my dignity, and that strength which rendered me superior to other men, that strength was my life. With one word you have crushed it, and I die. But the duel will not take place, Edmund, since you forgive, it will take place, said Monte Cristo, in a most solemn tone, but instead of your son's blood to stain the ground, mine will flow. Mercedes shrieked, and sprang towards Monte Cristo, but, suddenly stopping, Edmund, said she, there is a God above us, since you live and since I have seen you again, I trust to him from my heart. While waiting his assistance I trust to your word, you have said that my son should live, have you not? Yes. Madame, he shall live, said Monte Cristo, surprised that without more emotion Mercedes had accepted the heroic sacrifice he made for her. Mercedes extended her hand to the Count. Edmund, said she, and her eyes were wet with tears while looking at him to whom she spoke, how noble it is of you how great the action you have just performed, how sublime to have taken pity on a poor woman who appealed to you with every chance against her, alas, I am grown old with grief more than with years, and cannot now remind my Edmund by a smile, or by a look, of that Mercedes whom he once spent so many hours in contemplating. Ah, believe me, Edmund, as I told you, I too have suffered much, I repeat, it is melancholy to pass one's life without having one joy to recall, without preserving a single hope, but that proves that all is not yet over. No, it is not finished, I feel it by what remains in my heart. Oh, I repeat it, Edmund, what you have just done is beautiful, it is grand, it is sublime. Do you say so now, Mercedes? Then what would you say if you knew the extent of the sacrifice I make to you? Suppose that the Supreme Being, after having created the world and fertilized chaos, had paused in the work to spare an angel the tears that might one day flow for mortal sins from her immortal eyes, Suppose that when everything was in readiness and the moment had come for God to look upon his work and see that it was good, suppose he had snuffed out the sun and tossed the world back into eternal night, then, even then, Mercedes, I could not imagine what I lose in sacrificing my life at this moment. Mercedes looked at the Count in a way which expressed at the same time her astonishment, her admiration, and her gratitude. Monte Cristo pressed his forehead on his burning hands, as if his brain could no longer bear alone the weight of its thoughts. Edmund said Mercedes, I have but one word more to say to you. The Count smiled bitterly. Edmund, continued she, you will see that if my face is pale, if my eyes are dull, if my beauty is gone, if Mercedes, in short, no longer resembles her former self in her features, you will see that her heart is still the same. Adieu, then, Edmund, I have nothing more to ask of heaven, I have seen you again, and have found you as noble and as great as formerly you were. Adieu, Edmund, adieu and thank you, but the Count did not answer. Mercedes opened the door of the study and had disappeared before he had recovered from the painful and profound reverie into which his thwarted vengeance had plunged him. The clock of the Invalide struck one when the carriage which conveyed Madame de Morcerf away rolled on the pavement of the Champs-Élysées, and made Monte Cristo raise his head. What a fool I was, said he, not to tear my heart out on the day when I resolved to avenge myself. Chapter 90 The Meeting After Mercedes had left Monte Cristo, he fell into profound gloom. Around him and within him the flight of thought seemed to have stopped, his energetic mind slumbered, as the body does after extreme fatigue. What? said he to himself, while the lamp and the wax lights were nearly burnt out, and the servants were waiting impatiently in the ante-room. What? This edifice which I have been so long preparing, which I have reared with so much care and toil, is to be crushed by a single touch, a word, a breath. Yes, this self, of whom I thought so much of whom I was so proud, who had appeared so worthless in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If, and whom I had succeeded in making so great, will be but a lump of clay tomorrow. Alas, it is not the death of the body I regret, for is not the destruction of the vital principle, the repose to which everything is tending, to which every unhappy being aspires, is not this the repose of matter after which I so long sighed, and which I was seeking to attain by the painful process of starvation when Fairy appeared in my dungeon? What is death for me? one step farther into rest, two, perhaps, into silence. No, it is not existence, then, that I regret, but the ruin of projects so slowly carried out, so laboriously framed. Providence is now opposed to them, when I most thought it would be propitious. It is not God's will that they should be accomplished. This burden, almost as heavy as a world, which I had raised, and I had thought to bear to the end, was too great for my strength, and I was compelled to lay it down in the middle of my career. Oh, shall I then, again become a fatalist, whom fourteen years of despair and ten of hope had rendered a believer in providence? And all this, 
All this, because my heart, which I thought dead, was only sleeping, because it has awakened and has begun to beat again, because I have yielded to the pain of the emotion excited in my breast by a woman's voice. Yet, continued the Count, becoming each moment more absorbed in the anticipation of the dreadful sacrifice for the morrow, which Mercedes had accepted, yet, it is impossible that so noble-minded a woman should thus through selfishness consent to my death when I am in the prime of life and strength, it is impossible that she can carry to such a point maternal love, or rather delirium. There are virtues which become crimes by exaggeration. No, she must have conceived some pathetic scene, she will come and throw herself between us, and what would be sublime here will there appear ridiculous. The blush of pride mounted to the Count's forehead as this thought passed through his mind. Ridiculous! repeated he, and the ridicule will fall on me. I ridiculous? No, I would rather die, by thus exaggerating to his own mind the anticipated ill fortune of the next day, to which he had condemned himself by promising Mercedes to spare her son, the Count at last exclaimed, folly, 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 to carry generosity so far as to put myself up as a mark for that young man to aim at. He will never believe that my death was suicide, and yet it is important for the honour of my memory, and this surely is not vanity but a justifiable pride, it is important the world should know that I have consented, by my free will, to stop my arm, already raised to strike, and that with the arm which has been so powerful against others I have struck myself. It must be, it shall be, seizing a pen, he drew a paper from a secret drawer in his desk, and wrote at the bottom of the document, which was no other than his will, made since his arrival in Paris, a sort of codicil, clearly explaining the nature of his death. I do this, oh my God, said he, with his eyes raised to heaven, as much for thy honour as for mine. I have during ten years considered myself the agent of thy vengeance, and other wretches, like Morserf, Dandlers, Vilfert, even Morserf himself, must not imagine that chance has freed them from their enemy. Let them know, on the contrary, that their punishment, which had been decreed by Providence, is only delayed by my present determination, and although they escape it in this world, it awaits them in another, and that they are only exchanging time for eternity. While he was thus agitated by gloomy uncertainties, wretched waking dreams of grief, the first rays of morning pierced his windows, and shone upon the pale blue paper on which he had just inscribed his justification of providence. It was just five o'clock in the morning when a slight noise like a stifled sigh reached his ear. He turned his head, looked around him, and saw no one, but the sound was repeated distinctly enough to convince him of its reality. He arose, and quietly opening the door of the drawing room, saw Hayday who had fallen on a chair, with her arms hanging down and her beautiful head thrown back. She had been standing at the door, to prevent his going out without seeing her, until sleep, which the young cannot resist, had overpowered her frame, wearied as she was with watching. The noise of the door did not awaken her, and Monte Cristo gazed at her with affectionate regret. She remembered that she had a son, said he, and I forgot I had a daughter. Then, shaking his head sorrowfully, poor Hayday, said he, she wished to see me, to speak to me. She was feared or guessed something. Oh, I cannot go without taking leave of her, I cannot die without confiding her to someone. He quietly regained his seat, and wrote under the other lines, dash, I bequeath to Maximilian Morrill, captain of Spahis, and son of my former patron, Pierre Morrill, shipowner at Marseille, the sum of twenty millions, a part of which may be offered to his sister Julia and brother-in-law Emmanuel, if he does not fear this increase of fortune may mar their happiness. These twenty millions are concealed in my grotto at Monte Cristo, of which Batasio knows the secret. If his heart is free, and he will marry Hayde, the daughter of Ali Pasha of Yanina, whom I have brought up with the love of a father, and who has shown the love and tenderness of a daughter for me, he will thus accomplish my last wish. This will has already constituted Hayde heiress of the rest of my fortune, consisting of lands, funds in England, Austria, and Holland, furniture in my different palaces and houses and which without the twenty millions and the legacies to my servants, may still amount to sixty millions. He was finishing the last line when a cry behind him made him start, and the pen fell from his hand. Hey day, said he. Did you read it, oh, my lord, said she, why are you writing thus at such an hour? Why are you bequeathing all your fortune to me? Are you going to leave me? I am going on a journey, dear child, said Monte Cristo, with an expression of infinite tenderness and melancholy and if any misfortune should happen to me. The Count stopped. Well? asked the young girl, with an authoritative tone the Count had never observed before, and which startled him. Well, if any misfortune happened to me, replied Monte Cristo, I wish my daughter to be happy. 
Hadi smiled sorrowfully, and shook her head. Do you think of dying, my lord? said she. The wise man, my child, has said, it is good to think of death. Well, if you die, said she, bequeath your fortune to others, for if you die I shall require nothing, and, taking the paper, she tore it in four pieces, and threw it into the middle of the room. Then, the effort having exhausted her strength, she fell not asleep this time, but fainting on the floor. The Count leaned over her and raised her in his arms, and seeing that sweet pale face, those lovely eyes closed, that beautiful form motionless and to all appearance lifeless. The idea occurred to him for the first time, that perhaps she loved him otherwise than as a daughter loves a father. Alas, murmured he, with intense suffering, I might, then, have been happy yet. Then he carried Hadi to her room, resigned her to the care of her attendants, and returning to his study, which he shut quickly this time, he again copied the destroyed will. As he was finishing, the sound of a cabriolet entering the yard was heard. Monte Cristo approached the window, and saw Maximilian and Emmanuel alight. Good, said he, it was time, and he sealed his will with three seals. A moment afterwards he heard a noise in the drawing room, and went to open the door himself. Morrel was there, he had come twenty minutes before the time appointed. I am perhaps come too soon, Count, said he, but I frankly acknowledge that I have not closed my eyes all night, nor has any one in my house. I need to see you strong in your courageous assurance, to recover myself. Monte Cristo could not resist this proof of affection, he not only extended his hand to the young man, but flew to him with open arms. Moral, said he, it is a happy day for me, to feel that I am beloved by such a man as you. Good morning, Emmanuel, you will come with me then, Maximilian? Did you doubt it? said the young captain. But if I were wrong dash, I watched you during the whole scene of that challenge yesterday, I have been thinking of your firmness all night, and I said to myself that justice must be on your side or man's countenance is no longer to be relied on, but, moral, Albert is your friend, simply an acquaintance, sir, you met on the same day you first saw me, yes, that is true, but I should not have recollected it if you had not reminded me, thank you, moral. Then ringing the bell once, look, said he to Ali, came immediately, take that to my solicitor. It is my will, moral. When I am dead, you will go and examine it, what? said moral, you dead? Yes. Must I not be prepared for everything, dear friend? But what did you do yesterday after you left me? I went to Tortoni's, where, as I expected, I found Beecham and Chattery Nord. I own I was seeking them. Why, when all was arranged, listen, Count, the affair is serious and unavoidable. Did you doubt it? No. The offence was public, and everyone is already talking of it. Well, well, I hope to get an exchange of arms, to substitute the sword for the pistol. The pistol is blind. Have you succeeded? asked Monte Cristo quickly, with an imperceptible gleam of hope. No, for your skill with the sword is so well known. Ah, who has betrayed me, the skillful swordsman whom you have conquered, and you failed? They positively refused. Moral, said the Count, have you ever seen me fire a pistol? Never. Well, we have time, look. Monte Cristo took the pistols he held in his hand when Mercedes entered, and fixing an ace of clubs against the iron plate, with four shots he successively shot off the four sides of the club. At each shot Morrill turned pale. He examined the bullets with which Monte Cristo performed this dexterous feat, and saw that they were no larger than buckshot. It is astonishing, said he. Look, Emmanuel. Then turning towards Monte Cristo, Count, said he, in the name of all that is dear to you, I entreat you not to kill Albert, the unhappy youth has a mother. You are right, said Monte Cristo, and I have none. These words were uttered in a tone which made Moral shudder. You are the offended party, Count, doubtless, what does that imply, that you will fire first, I fire first, oh, I obtained, or rather claimed that, we had conceded enough for them to yield us that, and at what distance, twenty paces. A smile of terrible import passed over the Count's lips. Moral, said he, do not forget what you have just seen, the only chance for Albert's safety, then, will arise from your emotion. I suffer from emotion? said Monte Cristo, or from your generosity, my friend, to so good a marksman as you are, I may say what would appear absurd to another, what is that, break his arm, wound him, but do not kill him, I will tell you, moral, said the Count, that I do not need entreating to spare the life of M. De Morcerf, he shall be so well spared, that he will return quietly with his two friends, while I dash, and you, that will be another thing, I shall be brought home, no, no cried Maximilian, quite unable to restrain his feelings, 
As I told you, my dear Moral, M. De Morcerf will kill me. Moral looked at him in utter amazement. But what has happened, then, since last evening, Count? The same thing that happened to Brutus the night before the Battle of Philippi, I have seen a ghost, and that ghost Dash, told me, Moral, that I had lived long enough. Maximilian and Emmanuel looked at each other. Monte Cristo drew out his watch. Let us go, said he, it is five minutes past seven, and the appointment was for eight o'clock. A carriage was in readiness at the door. Monte Cristo stepped into it with his two friends. He had stopped a moment in the passage to listen at a door, and Maximilian and Emmanuel, who had considerately passed forward a few steps, thought they heard him answer by a sigh to a sob from within. As the clock struck eight they drove up to the place of meeting. We are first, said Morrill, looking out of the window. Excuse me, sir, said Baptistin, who had followed his master with indescribable terror, but I think I see a carriage down there under the trees. Monte Cristo sprang lightly from the carriage, and offered his hand to assist Emmanuel and Maximilian. The latter retained the Count's hand between his. I like said he, to feel a hand like this, when its owner relies on the goodness of his cause, it seems to me, said Emmanuel, that I see two young men down there, who are evidently, waiting. Monte Cristo drew Morrill a step or two behind his brother-in-law. Maximilian, said he, are your affections disengaged? Morrill looked at Monte Cristo with astonishment. I do not seek your confidence, my dear friend. I only ask you a simple question, answer it, that is all I require, I love a young girl, Count. Do you love her much, more than my life, another hope defeated?" said the Count. Then, with a sigh, poor Hayde, murmured he, to tell the truth, Count, if I knew less of you, I should think that you were less brave than you are, because I sigh when thinking of someone I am leaving. Come, Moral, it is not like a soldier to be so bad a judge of courage. Do I regret life? What is it to me, who have passed twenty years between life and death? Moreover, do not alarm yourself, Moral. This weakness, if it is such, is betrayed to you alone. I know the world is a drawing room, from which we must retire politely and honestly, that is, with a bow, and our debts of honor paid, that is to the purpose. Have you brought your arms? I, what for? I hope these gentlemen have theirs, I will inquire, said Moral. Do, but make no treaty, you understand me, you need not fear. Moral advanced towards Beecham and Shattery Nord, who, seeing his intention, came to meet him. The three young men bowed to each other courteously, if not affably. Excuse me, gentlemen, said Morrill, but I do not see M. de Morcerf. He sent us word this morning, replied Chattery Nord, that he would meet us on the ground. Ah, said Morrill. Beecham pulled out his watch. It is only five minutes past eight, said he to Morrill. There is not much time lost yet. Oh, I made no allusion of that kind, replied Morrill. There is a carriage coming, said Chattery Nord. It advanced rapidly along one of the avenues leading towards the open space where they were assembled. You are doubtless provided with pistols, gentlemen. M. De Monte Cristo yields his right of using his. We had anticipated this kindness on the part of the Count, said Beecham, and I have brought some weapons which I bought eight or ten days since, thinking to want them on a similar occasion. They are quite new, and have not yet been used. Will you examine them? Oh, M. Beecham, if you wish me that M. De Morcerf does not know these pistols, you may readily believe that your word will be quite sufficient, gentlemen, said Chattery Nord, it is not Morcerf coming in that carriage, faith, it is France and de Bray. The two young men he announced were indeed approaching. What chance brings you here, gentlemen? said Chattery Nord, shaking hands with each of them. Because, said de Bray, Albert sent this morning to request us to come. Beecham and Chattery Nord exchanged looks of astonishment. I think I understand his reason, said Morrill, what is it, yesterday afternoon I received a letter from M. de Morcerf, begging me to attend the opera, and I, said de Bray, and I also, said France, and we, too, added Beecham and Chattery Nord, having wished you all to witness the challenge, he now wishes you to be present at the combat, exactly so, said the young men, you have probably guessed right, but, after all these arrangements, he does not come himself, said Chattery Nord. Albert is ten minutes after time, there he comes, said Beecham, on horseback, at full gallop, followed by a servant, how imprudent, said Chattery Nord, to come on horseback to fight a duel with pistols, after all the instructions I had given him, and besides, said Beecham, with a collar above his cravat, an open coat and white waistcoat, why has he not painted a spot upon his heart, it would have been more simple, 
Meanwhile Albert had arrived within ten paces of the group formed by the five young men. He jumped from his horse, threw the bridle on his servant's arms, and joined them. He was pale, and his eyes were red and swollen, it was evident that he had not slept. A shade of melancholy gravity overspread his countenance, which was not natural to him. I thank you, gentlemen, said he, for having complied with my request, I feel extremely grateful for this mark of friendship. Morrill had stepped back as more surf approached, and remained at a short distance. And to you also, M. Morrill, my thanks are due. Come, there cannot be too many, sir, said Maximilian, you are not perhaps aware that I am M. De Monte Cristo's friend, I was not sure, but I thought it might be so. So much the better, the more honorable men there are here the better I shall be satisfied, M. Morrill, said Chattery Nord, will you apprise the Count of Monte Cristo that M. De Morcerf is arrived, and we are at his disposal. Morrill was preparing to fulfill his commission. Beecham had meanwhile drawn the box of pistols from the carriage. Stop, gentlemen, said Albert, I have two words to say to the Count of Monte Cristo, in private, asked Morrill. No, sir, before all who are here, Albert's witnesses looked at each other. Franz and Debray exchanged some words in a whisper, and Morrill, rejoiced at this unexpected incident, went to fetch the Count, who was walking in a retired path with Emmanuel. What does he want with me? said Monte Cristo. I do not know, but he wishes to speak to you, R? said Monte Cristo, I trust he is not going to tempt me by some fresh insult, I do not think that such is his intention, said Morrill. The Count advanced, accompanied by Maximilian and Emmanuel. His calm and serene look formed a singular contrast to Albert's grief-stricken face, who approached also, followed by the other four young men. When at three paces distant from each other, Albert and the Count stopped. Approach, gentlemen, said Albert, I wish you not to lose one word of what I am about to have the honor of saying to the Count of Monte Cristo, for it must be repeated by you to all who will listen to it, strange as it may appear to you. Proceed, sir said the Count, Sir, said Albert, at first with a tremulous voice, but which gradually became firmer, I reproached you with exposing the conduct of M. de Morcerf and E. Pyrrhus, for guilty as I knew he was, I thought you had no right to punish him, but I have since learned that you had that right. It is not Fernand Mandigo's treachery towards Ali Pasha which induces me so readily to excuse you, but the treachery of the fisherman Fernand towards you, and the almost unheard of miseries which were its consequences, and I say, and proclaim it publicly, that you were justified in revenging yourself on my father, and I, his son, thank you for not using greater severity. Had a thunderbolt fallen in the midst of the spectators of this unexpected scene, it would not have surprised them more than did Albert's declaration. As for Monte Cristo, his eyes slowly rose towards heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. He could not understand how Albert's fiery nature, of which he had seen so much among the Roman bandits, had suddenly stooped to this humiliation. He recognized the influence of Mercedes, and saw why her noble heart had not opposed the sacrifice she knew beforehand would be useless. Now, sir, said Albert, if you think my apology sufficient, pray give me your hand. Next to the merit of infallibility which you appear to possess, I rank that of candidly acknowledging a fault. But this confession concerns me only. I acted well as a man, but you have acted better than man. An angel alone could have saved one of us from death, but angel came from heaven if not to make us friends, which, alas, fatality renders impossible, at least to make us esteem each other, Monte Cristo, with moistened eye, heaving breast, and lips half open, extended to Albert a hand which the latter pressed with a sentiment resembling respectful fear. Gentlemen, said he, M. de Monte Cristo receives my apology. I had acted hastily towards him. Hasty actions are generally bad ones. Now my fault is repaired. I hope the world will not call me cowardly for acting as my conscience dictated. But if any one should entertain a false opinion of me, added he, drawing himself up as if he would challenge both friends and enemies, I shall endeavor to correct his mistake. What happened during the night? Asked Beecham of Chattery Nord, we appear to make a very sorry figure here. In truth, what Albert has just done is either very despicable or very noble, replied the Baron. What can it mean? Said Debray to France. The Count of Monte Cristo acts dishonorably to M. de Morcerf, and is justified by his son. Had I ten Yaninas in my family, I should only consider myself the more bound to fight ten times. As for Monte Cristo, his head was bent down. His arms were powerless. Bowing under the weight of twenty-four years' reminiscences, he thought not of Albert, of Beecham, of Chattery Nord, or of any of that group, 
but he thought of that courageous woman who had come to plead for her son's life, to whom he had offered his, and who had now saved it by the revelation of a dreadful family secret, capable of destroying forever in that young man's heart every feeling of filial piety. Providence still, murmured he. Now only am I fully convinced of being the emissary of God. Chapter 91 Mother and Son The Count of Monte Cristo bowed to the five young men with a melancholy and dignified smile, and got into his carriage with Maximilian and Emmanuel. Albert, Beecham, and Chattery Nord remained alone. Albert looked at his two friends, not timidly, but in a way that appeared to ask their opinion of what he had just done. Indeed, my dear friend, said Beecham first, who had either the most feeling or the least dissimulation, allow me to congratulate you. This is a very unhoped for conclusion of a very disagreeable affair. Albert remained silent and wrapped in thought. Shattery Nord contented himself with tapping his boot with his flexible cane. Are we not going? said he, after this embarrassing silence. When you please, replied Beecham, allow me only to compliment M. de Morcerf, who has given proof today of rare chivalric generosity. Oh, yes, said Shattery Nord, it is magnificent, continued Beecham to be able to exercise so much self-control, assuredly, as for me, I should have been incapable of it, said Chattery Nord, with most significant coolness, gentlemen, interrupted Albert, I think you did not understand that something very serious had passed between M. de Monte Cristo and myself, possibly, possibly, said Beecham immediately, but every simpleton would not be able to understand your heroism, and sooner or later you will find yourself compelled to explain it to them more energetically than would be convenient to your bodily health and the duration of your life. May I give you a friendly counsel? Set out for Naples, The Hague, or St. Petersburg, calm countries, where the point of honor is better understood than among our hot-headed Parisians. Seek quietude and oblivion, so that you may return peaceably to France after a few years. Am I not right, M. de Chattery Nord? That is quite my opinion, said the gentleman. Nothing induces serious duels so much as a duel forsworn. Thank you, gentlemen, replied Albert, with a smile of indifference. I shall follow your advice, not because you give it, but because I had before intended to quit France. I thank you equally for the service you have rendered me in being my seconds. It is deeply engraved on my heart, and, after what you have just said, I remember that only. Chattery and Norden Beecham looked at each other. The impression was the same on both of them and the tone in which Morcerf had just expressed his thanks was so determined that the position would have become embarrassing for all if the conversation had continued. Goodbye, Albert, said Beecham suddenly, carelessly extending his hand to the young man. The latter did not appear to arouse from his lethargy, in fact, he did not notice the offered hand. Goodbye, said Chattery Nord in his turn, keeping his little cane in his left hand, and saluting with his right. Albert's lips scarcely whispered goodbye, but his look was more explicit. It expressed a whole poem of restrained anger, proud disdain, and generous indignation. He preserved his melancholy and motionless position for some time after his two friends had regained their carriage, then suddenly unfastening his horse from the little tree to which his servant had tied it, he mounted and galloped off in the direction of Paris. In a quarter of an hour he was entering the house in the Rue du Helder. As he alighted, he thought he saw his father's pale face behind the curtain of the Count's bedroom. Albert turned away his head with a sigh and went to his own apartments. He cast one lingering look on all the luxuries which had rendered life so easy and so happy since his infancy, he looked at the pictures, whose faces seemed to smile, and the landscapes, which appeared painted in brighter colors. Then he took away his mother's portrait, with its oaken frame, leaving the gilt frame from which he took it black and empty. Then he arranged all his beautiful Turkish arms, his fine English guns, his Japanese china, his cups mounted in silver. His artistic bronzes by Fouquier's and Barry examined the cupboards, and placed the key in each, threw into a drawer of his secretary, which he left open, all the pocket money he had about him, and with it the thousand fancy jewels from his vases and his jewel boxes, then he made an exact inventory of everything, and placed it in the most conspicuous part of the table, after putting aside the books and papers which had collected there. At the beginning of this work, his servant, notwithstanding orders to the contrary, came to his room. What do you want? asked he, with a more sorrowful than angry tone. Pardon me, sir, replied the valet, you had forbidden me to disturb you, but the Count of Morcerf has called me, well, said Albert, I did not like to go to him without first seeing you, why, because the Count is doubtless aware that I accompanied you to the meeting this morning, it is probable, said Albert, and since he has sent for me, it is doubtless to question me on what happened there. What must I answer, the truth, 
Then I shall say the duel did not take place. You will say I apologize to the Count of Monte Cristo. Go. The valet bowed and retired, and Albert returned to his inventory. As he was finishing this work, the sound of horses prancing in the yard, and the wheels of a carriage shaking his window, attracted his attention. He approached the window, and saw his further get into it, and drive away. The door was scarcely closed when Albert bent his steps to his mother's room, and, no one being there to announce him, he advanced to her bedchamber, and distressed by what he saw and guessed, stopped for one moment at the door. As if the same idea had animated these two beings, Mercedes was doing the same in her apartments that he had just done in his. Everything was in order, laces, dresses, jewels, linen, money, all were arranged in the drawers, and the countess was carefully collecting the keys. Albert saw all these preparations and understood them, and exclaiming, My mother! He threw his arms around her neck. The artist who could have depicted the expression of these two countenances would certainly have made of them a beautiful picture. All these proofs of an energetic resolution, which Albert did not fear on his own account, alarmed him for his mother. What are you doing? asked he, what were you doing? replied she, oh, my mother! exclaimed Albert, so overcome he could scarcely speak, it is not the same with you and me, you cannot have made the same resolution I have, for I have come to warn you that I bid adieu to your house, and, to you, I also, replied Mercedes, am going, and I acknowledge I had depended on your accompanying me, have I deceived myself, mother, said Albert with firmness, I cannot make you share the fate I have planned for myself, I must live henceforth without rank and fortune, and to begin this hard apprenticeship I must borrow from a friend the loaf I shall eat until I have earned one, so, my dear mother, I am going at once to ask Franz to lend me the small sum I shall require to supply my present wants, you, my poor child, suffer poverty and hunger? Oh, do not say so, it will break my resolutions. But not mine, mother, replied Albert. I am young and strong, I believe I am courageous, and since yesterday I have learned the power of will. Alas, my dear mother, some have suffered so much, and yet live, and have raised a new fortune on the ruin of all the promises of happiness which heaven had made them, on the fragments of all the hope which God had given them. I have seen that, mother, I knows that from the gulf in which their enemies have plunged them they have risen with so much vigor and glory that in their turn they have ruled their former conquerors, and have punished them. No. Mother, from this moment I have done with the past, and accept nothing from it, not even a name, because you can understand that your son cannot bear the name of a man who ought to blush for it before another. Albert, my child, said Mercedes, if I had a stronger heart that is the counsel I would have given you, your conscience has spoken when my voice became too weak listen to its dictates. You had friends, Albert. Break off their acquaintance. But do not despair, you have life before you, my dear Albert, for you are yet scarcely twenty-two years old, and as a pure heart like yours wants a spotless name, take my father's, it was Herrera. I am sure, my dear Albert, whatever may be your career, you will soon render that name illustrious. Then, my son, return to the world still more brilliant because of your former sorrows, and if I am wrong, still let me cherish these hopes for I have no future to look forward to. For me the grave opens when I pass the threshold of this house, I will fulfill all your wishes, my dear mother, said the young man. Yes, I share your hopes, the anger of heaven will not pursue us, since you are pure and I am innocent. But, since our resolution is formed, let us act promptly. M. De Morcerf went out about half an hour ago, the opportunity is favorable to avoid an explanation, I am ready, my son, said Mercedes. Albert ran to fetch a carriage. He recollected that there was a small furnished house to let in the Rue de Saints Paris, where his mother would find a humble but decent lodging, and thither he intended conducting the countess. As the carriage stopped at the door, and Albert was alighting, a man approached and gave him a letter. Albert recognized the bearer. From the Count, said Batasio. Albert took the letter, opened, and read it, then looked round for Batasio, but he was gone. He returned to Mercedes with tears in his eyes and heaving breast and without uttering a word he gave her the letter. Mercedes read, dash, Albert, while showing you that I have discovered your plans, I hope also to convince you of my delicacy. You are free, you leave the Count's house, and you take your mother to your home, but reflect, Albert, you owe her more than your poor noble heart can pay her. Keep the struggle for yourself, bear all the suffering, but spare her the trial of poverty which must accompany your first efforts, for she deserves not even the shadow of the misfortune which has this day fallen on her and Providence is not willing that the innocent should suffer for the guilty. I know you are going to leave the Rue du Helder without taking anything with you. 
Do not seek to know how I discovered it, I know it, it is sufficient. Now, listen, Albert. Twenty-four years ago I returned, proud and joyful, to my country. I had a betrothed, Albert, a lovely girl whom I adored, and I was bringing to my betrothed a hundred and fifty louis, painfully amassed by ceaseless toil. This money was for her, I destined it for her, and, knowing the treachery of the sea I buried our treasure in the little garden of the house my father lived in at Marseille, on the alleys de Milan. Your mother, Albert, knows that poor house well. A short time since I passed through Marseille, and went to see the old place, which revived so many painful recollections, and in the evening I took a spade and dug in the corner of the garden where I had concealed my treasure. The iron box was there, no one had touched it, under a beautiful fig tree my father had planted the day I was born, which overshadowed the spot. Well, Albert, this money, which was formerly designed to promote the comfort and tranquility of the woman I adored, may now, through strange and painful circumstances, be devoted to the same purpose. Oh, feel for me, who could offer millions to that poor woman, but who return her only the piece of black bread forgotten under my poor roof since the day I was torn from her I loved. You are a generous man, Albert, but perhaps you may be blinded by pride or resentment, if you refuse me, if you ask another for what I have a right to offer you. I will say it is ungenerous of you to refuse the life of your mother at the hands of a man whose father was allowed by your father to die in all the horrors of poverty and despair. Albert stood pale and motionless to hear what his mother would decide after she had finished reading this letter. Mercedes turned her eyes with an ineffable look towards heaven. I accept it, said she. He has a right to pay the dowry, which I shall take with me to some convent. Putting the letter in her bosom, she took her son's arm and with a firmer step than she even herself expected she went downstairs. Chapter 92 The Suicide Meanwhile Monte Cristo had also returned to town with Emmanuel and Maximilian. Their return was cheerful. Emmanuel did not conceal his joy at the peaceful termination of the affair, and was loud in his expressions of delight. Moral, in a corner of the carriage, allowed his brother-in-law's gaiety to expend itself in words, while he felt equal inward joy, which, however, betrayed itself only in his countenance. At the barrier du trône Matt Batasio, who was waiting there, motionless as a sentinel at his post. Monte Cristo put his head out of the window, exchanged a few words with him in a low tone, and the steward disappeared. Count, said Emmanuel, when they were at the end of the place royale, put me down at my door, that my wife may not have a single moment of needless anxiety on my account or yours. If it were not ridiculous to make a display of our triumph, I would invite the Count to our house. Besides that, he doubtless has some trembling heart to comfort. So we will take leave of our friend, and let him hasten home. Stop a moment, said Monte Cristo, do not let me lose both my companions. Return, Emmanuel, to your charming wife, and present my best compliments to her, and do you, Moral, accompany me to the Champs Elysees? Willingly, said Maximilian, particularly as I have business in that quarter, shall we wait breakfast for you? Asked Emmanuel. No, replied the young man. The door was closed and the carriage proceeded. See what good fortune I brought you, said Morrill, when he was alone with the Count. Have you not thought so? Yes, said Monte Cristo, for that reason I wish to keep you near me, it is miraculous. Continued Morrill, answering his own thoughts. What? said Monte Cristo, what has just happened? Yes, said the Count, you are right, it is miraculous, for Albert is brave, resumed Morrill. Very brave, said Monte Cristo, I have seen him sleep with a sword suspended over his head, and I know he has fought two duels, said Morrill. How can you reconcile it with his conduct this morning? All owing to your influence, replied Monte Cristo, smiling. It is well for Albert he is not in the army, said Morrill. Why, an apology on the ground, said the young captain, shaking his head. Come, said the Count mildly, do not entertain the prejudices of ordinary men, Morrill. Acknowledge, that if Albert is brave, he cannot be a coward. He must then have had some reason for acting as he did this morning, and confess that his conduct is more heroic than otherwise. Doubtless, doubtless, said Morrill, but I shall say, like the Spaniard, he has not been so brave today as he was yesterday. You will breakfast with me, will you not, Morrill? said the Count, to turn the conversation. No, I must leave you at ten o'clock. Your engagement was for breakfast, then? said the Count. Morrill smiled, and shook his head. Still you must breakfast somewhere. But if I am not hungry? said the young man. Oh, said the Count, I only know two things which destroy the appetite, grief, and as I am happy to see you very cheerful, it is not that, and love. Now after what you told me this morning of your heart, I may believe dash, well, 
Count, replied Morrow gaily, I will not dispute it. But you will not make me your confidant, Maximilian? said the Count, in a tone which showed how gladly he would have been admitted to the secret. I showed you this morning that I had a heart. Did I not, Count? Monte Cristo only answered by extending his hand to the young man. Well, continued the latter, since that heart is no longer with you in the boys of Vincennes, it is elsewhere, and I must go and find it. Go, said the Count deliberately, go, dear friend, but promise me if you meet with any obstacle to remember that I have some power in this world, that I am happy to use that power in the behalf of those I love, and that I love you, moral. I will remember it, said the young man, as selfish children recollect their parents when they wanted their aid. When I need your assistance, and the moment arrives, I will come to you, Count. Well, I rely upon your promise. Goodbye, then, goodbye, till we meet again. They had arrived in the champs Elysees. Monte Cristo opened the carriage door, Morrel sprang out on the pavement, but Hussio was waiting on the steps. Morrel disappeared down the Avenue de Marigny, and Monte Cristo hastened to join Batasio. Well? asked he. She is going to leave her house, said the steward, and her son, Florentin. His valet, thinks he is going to do the same. Come this way. Monte Cristo took Batasio into his study, wrote the letter we have seen, and gave it to the steward. Go, oh, said he quickly. But first, let Hayde be informed that I have returned. Here I am, said the young girl who at the sound of the carriage had run downstairs and whose face was radiant with joy at seeing the Count return safely. But Hussio left. Every transport of a daughter finding a father, or the delight of a mistress seeing an adored lover, were felt by Hayde during the first moments of this meeting, which she had so eagerly expected. Doubtless, although less evident, Monte Cristo's joy was not less intense. Joy to hearts which have suffered long is like the dew on the ground after a long drought. Both the heart and the ground absorb that beneficent moisture falling on them, and nothing is outwardly apparent. Monte Cristo was beginning to think, what he had not for a long time dared to believe, that there were two Mercedes in the world, and he might yet be happy. His eye, elate with happiness, was reading eagerly the tearful gaze of Hayde, when suddenly the door opened. The Count knit his brow. M. de Morcerf, said Baptistin, as if that name sufficed for his excuse. In fact, the Count's face brightened. Which, asked he, the Viscount or the Count, the Count, oh, exclaimed Hayde, is it not yet over, I know not if it is finished, my beloved child, said Monte Cristo, taking the young girl's hands, but I do know you have nothing more to fear, but it is the wretched dash, that man cannot injure me, Hayde, said Monte Cristo, it was his son alone that there was cause to fear, and what I have suffered, said the young girl, you shall never know, my lord, Monte Cristo smiled, by my father's tomb, said he, extending his hand over the head of the young girl, I swear to you, Hayde, that if any misfortune happens, it will not be to me, I believe you, my lord, as implicitly as if God had spoken to me, said the young girl, presenting her forehead to him. Monte Cristo pressed on that pure beautiful forehead a kiss which made two hearts throb at once, the one violently, the other heavily. Oh, murmured the Count, shall I then be permitted to love again? Ask him. De Morcerf into the drawing room, said he to Baptistin, while he led the beautiful Greek girl to a private staircase. We must explain this visit, which although expected by Monte Cristo, is unexpected to our readers. While Mercedes, as we have said, was making a similar inventory of her property to Albert's, while she was arranging her jewels, shutting her drawers, collecting her keys, to leave everything in perfect order, she did not perceive a pale and sinister face at a glass door which threw light into the passage, from which everything could be both seen and heard. He who was thus looking, without being heard or seen, probably heard and saw all that passed in Madame de Morcerf's apartments. From that glass door the pale-faced man went to the Count's bedroom and raised with a constricted hand the curtain of a window overlooking the courtyard. He remained the ten minutes, motionless and dumb, listening to the beating of his own heart. For him those ten minutes were very long. It was then Albert, returning from his meeting with the Count, perceived his father watching for his arrival behind a curtain, and turned aside. The Count's eye expanded, he knew Albert had insulted the Count dreadfully, and that in every country in the world such an insult would lead to a deadly duel. Albert returned safely, then the Count was revenged. An indescribable ray of joy illumined the wretched countenance like the last ray of the sun before it disappears behind the clouds which bear the aspect, not of a downy couch, but of a tomb. But as we have said, he waited in vain for his son to come to his apartment with the account of his triumph. He easily understood why his son did not come to see him before he went to avenge his father's honor, but when that was done, 
Why did not his son come and throw himself into his arms? It was then, when the Count could not see Albert, that he sent for his servant, who he knew was authorized not to conceal anything from him. Ten minutes afterwards, General Morserf was seen on the steps in a black coat with a military collar, black pantaloons, and black gloves. He had apparently given previous orders, for as he reached the bottom step his carriage came from the coach house ready for him. The valet threw into the carriage his military cloak, in which two swords were wrapped, and, shutting the door, he took his seat by the side of the coachman. The coachman stooped down for his orders, to the champs Elysee, said the general, the Count of Monte Cristo's. Hurry! The horses bounded beneath the whip, and in five minutes they stopped before the Count's door. M. De Morcerf opened the door himself, and as the carriage rolled away he passed out the walk, rang, and entered the open door with his servant. A moment afterwards, Baptistin announced the Count of Morcerf to Monte Cristo, and the latter, leading Hade aside, ordered that Morcerf be asked into the drawing room. The general was pacing the room the third time when, in turning, he perceived Monte Cristo at the door. Ah, it is M. de Morcerf, said Monte Cristo quietly, I thought I had not heard aright. Yes, it is I, said the Count, whom a frightful contraction of the lips prevented from articulating freely. May I know the cause which procures me the pleasure of seeing M. de Morcerf so early? Had you not a meeting with my son this morning? Asked the General. I had, replied the Count, and I know my son had good reasons to wish to fight with you, and to endeavour to kill you. Yes, sir. He had very good ones, but you see that in spite of them he has not killed me, and did not even fight, yet he considered you the cause of his father's dishonor, the cause of the fearful ruin which has fallen on my house, it is true, sir, said Monte Cristo with his dreadful calmness, a secondary cause, but not the principal, doubtless you made, then, some apology or explanation, I explained nothing, and it is he who apologized to me, but to what do you attribute this conduct, to the conviction, probably, that there was one more guilty than I, and who was that? His father, that may be, said the Count, turning pale, do you know the guilty do not like to find themselves convicted, I know it, and I expected this result, you expected my son would be a coward? cried the Count, M. Albert de Morcerf is no coward, said Monte Cristo, a man who holds a sword in his hand, and sees a mortal enemy within reach of that sword, and does not fight, is a coward. Why is he not here that I may tell him so, sir? replied Monte Cristo coldly, I did not expect that you had come here to relate to me your little family affairs. Go and tell M. Albert that, and he may know what to answer you. Oh, no, no, said the general, smiling faintly, I did not come for that purpose, you are right. I came to tell you that I also look upon you as my enemy. I came to tell you that I hate you instinctively, that it seems as if I had always known you, and always hated you, and, in short, since the young people of the present day will not fight, it remains for us to do so. Do you think so, sir? Certainly. And when I told you I had foreseen the result, it is the honor of your visit I alluded to, so much the better. Are you prepared? Yes, sir. You know that we shall fight till one of us is dead, said the general, whose teeth were clenched with rage. Until one of us dies, repeated Monte Cristo, moving his head slightly up and down. Let us start, then, we need no witnesses, very true said Monte Cristo, it is unnecessary, we know each other so well, on the contrary, said the Count, we know so little of each other, indeed, said Monte Cristo, with the same indomitable coolness, let us see, are you not the soldier Fernand who deserted on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo? Are you not the Lieutenant Fernand who served as guide and spy to the French army in Spain? Are you not the Captain Fernand who betrayed, sold, and murdered his benefactor, Ali? And have not all these Fernands, united, made Lieutenant General, the Count of Morcerf, peer of France? Oh, cried the General, is it branded with a hot iron, wretch, to reproach me with my shame when about, perhaps, to kill me? No, I did not say I was a stranger to you. I know, well, demon, that you have penetrated into the darkness of the past, and that you have read, by the light of what torch I know not, every page of my life, but perhaps I may be more honorable in my shame than you under your pompous coverings. No, no. I am aware you know me, but I know you only as an adventurer sewn up in gold and jewelry. You call yourself in Paris the Count of Monte Cristo, in Italy, Sinbad the Sailor, in Malta, I forget what. But it is your real name I want to know, in the midst of your hundred names, that I may pronounce it when we meet to fight, at the moment when I plunge my sword through your heart. The Count of Monte Cristo turned dreadfully pale, as I seemed to burn with a devouring fire. 
he leapt towards a dressing room near his bedroom, and in less than a moment, tearing off his cravat, his coat and waistcoat, he put on a sailor's jacket and hat, from beneath which rolled his long black hair. He returned thus, formidable and implacable, advancing with his arms crossed on his breast, towards the general, who could not understand why he had disappeared, but who on seeing him again, and feeling his teeth chatter and his legs sink under him, drew back and only stopped when he found a table to support his clenched hand. Finand, cried he, of my hundred names I need only tell you one, to overwhelm you. But you guess it now, do you not, or, rather, you remember it? For, notwithstanding all my sorrows and my tortures, I show you today a face which the happiness of revenge makes young again, a face you must often have seen in your dreams since your marriage with Mercedes, my betrothed. The general, with his head thrown back, hands extended, gaze fixed, looked silently at this dreadful apparition, then seeking the wall to support him, he glided along close to it until he reached the door, through which he went out backwards, uttering this single mournful, lamentable, distressing cry, Edmund Dantes. Then, with sighs which were unlike any human sound, he dragged himself to the door, reeled across the courtyard, and falling into the arms of his valley, he said in a voice scarcely intelligible, Home, home. The fresh air and the shame he felt at having exposed himself before his servants, partly recalled his senses, but the ride was short, and as he drew near his house all his wretchedness revived. He stopped at a short distance from the house and alighted. The door was wide open, a hackney coach was standing in the middle of the yard, a strange sight before so noble a mansion, the Count looked at it with terror, but without daring to inquire its meaning, he rushed towards his apartment. Two persons were coming down the stairs he had only time to creep into an alcove to avoid them. It was Mercedes leaning on her son's arm and leaving the house. They passed close by the unhappy being, who, concealed behind the damask curtain, almost felt Mercedes' dress brush past him, and his son's warm breath, pronouncing these words, Courage, mother! Come, this is no longer our home. The words died away, the steps were lost in the distance. The general drew himself up, clinging to the curtain, he uttered the most dreadful sob which ever escaped from the bosom of a father abandoned at the same time by his wife and son. He soon heard the clatter of the iron step of the hackney coach, then the coachman's voice, and then the rolling of the heavy vehicle shook the windows. He darted to his bedroom to see once more all he had loved in the world, but the hackney coach drove on and the head of neither Mercedes nor her son appeared at the window to take a last look at the house or the deserted father and husband. And at the very moment when the wheels of that coach crossed the gate where report was heard, and a thick smoke escaped through one of the panes of the window, which was broken by the explosion. Chapter 93 Valentine We may easily conceive where Morrell's appointment was. On leaving Monte Cristo he walked slowly towards Vilfort's, we say slowly, for Morrell had more than half an hour to spare to go five hundred steps, but he had hastened to take leave of Monte Cristo because he wished to be alone with his thoughts. He knew his time well, the hour when Valentine was giving Noyertia his breakfast and was sure not to be disturbed in the performance of this pious duty. Noyertia and Valentine had given him leave to go twice a week, and he was now availing himself of that permission. He had arrived, Valentine was expecting him. Uneasy and almost grazed, she seized his hand and led him to her grandfather. This uneasiness, amounting almost to frenzy, arose from the report Morcerf's adventure had made in the world, for the affair at the opera was generally known. No one at Vilfort's doubted that a duel would ensue from it. Valentine, with her woman's instinct, guessed that Morrel would be Monte Cristo's second, and from the young man's well-known courage and his great affection for the Count, she feared that he would not content himself with the passive part assigned to him. We may easily understand how eagerly the particulars were asked for, given, and received, and Morrel could read an indescribable joy in the eyes of his beloved, when she knew that the termination of this affair was as happy as it was unexpected. Now, said Valentine, motioning to Morrel to sit down near her grandfather, while she took her seat on his footstool, now let us talk about our own affairs. You know, Maximilian, Grandpapa once thought of leaving this house, and taking an apartment away from M. de Vilfords. Yes, said Maximilian, I recollect the project, of which I highly approved. Well, said Valentine, you may approve again, for Grandpapa is again thinking of it. Bravo, said Maximilian, and do you know, said Valentine, what reason Grandpapa gives for leaving this house? Noyertia looked at Valentine to impose silence, but she did not notice him, her looks, her eyes, her smile, are all for Morrel, oh, whatever may be M. Noyertia's reason, answered Morrel, I can readily believe it to be a good one, an excellent one, said Valentine. 
He pretends the air of the Faubourg Street on Aura is not good for me, indeed, said Morrill, in that M. Noyertia may be right, you have not seemed to be well for the last fortnight, not very, said Valentine. And Grandpapa has become my physician, and I have the greatest confidence in him, because he knows everything, do you then really suffer? asked Morrill quickly, oh, it must not be called suffering, I feel a general uneasiness, that is all. I have lost my appetite, and my stomach feels as if it were struggling to get accustomed to something. Noyertia did not lose a word of what Valentine said. And what treatment do you adopt for this singular complaint? A very simple one, said Valentine. I swallow every morning a spoonful of the mixture prepared for my grandfather. When I say one spoonful, I began by one, now I take four. Grandpapa says it is a panacea. Valentine smiled, but it was evident that she suffered. Maximilian, in his devotedness, gazed silently at her. She was very beautiful, but her usual pallor had increased, her eyes were more brilliant than ever, and her hands, which were generally white like mother of pearl, now more resembled wax, to which time was adding a yellowish hue. From Valentine the young man looked towards Noyertia. The latter watched with strange and deep interest the young girl, absorbed by her affection, and he also, like Morrill, followed those traces of inward suffering which were so little perceptible to a common observer that they escaped the notice of everyone but the grandfather and the lover. But, said Morrill, I thought this mixture, of which you now take four spoonfuls, was prepared for M. Noyertia? I know it is very bitter, said Valentine, so bitter, that all I drink afterwards appears to have the same taste. Noyertia looked inquiringly at his granddaughter. Yes, grandpapa, said Valentine, it is so. Just now, before I came down to you, I drank a glass of sugared water, I left half, because it seemed so bitter. Noyertia turned pale, and made a sign that he wished to speak. Valentine rose to fetch the dictionary. Noyertia watched her with evident anguish. In fact, the blood was rushing to the young girl's head already, her cheeks were becoming red. Oh, cried she, without losing any of her cheerfulness, this is singular. I can't see. Did the sun shine in my eyes? And she leaned against the window. The sun is not shining, said Morrill, more alarmed by Noyertia's expression than by Valentine's indisposition. He ran towards her. The young girl smiled. Cheer up, said she to Noyertia. Do not be alarmed, Maximilian, it is nothing, and has already passed away. But listen. Do I not hear a carriage in the courtyard? She opened Noyertia's door, ran to a window in the passage, and returned hastily. Yes, said she, it is Madame Danglars and her daughter, who have come to call on us. Goodbye, I must run away, for they would send here for me, or, rather, farewell till I see you again. Stay with Grandpapa, Maximilian. I promise you not to persuade them to stay, Morrill watched her as she left the room. He heard her ascend the little staircase which led both to Madame de Vilfort's apartments and to hers. As soon as she was gone, Noyertia made a sign to Morrill to take the dictionary. Morrill obeyed, guided by Valentine. He had learned how to understand the old man quickly. Accustomed, however, as he was to the work, he had to repeat most of the letters of the alphabet and to find every word in the dictionary so that it was ten minutes before the thought of the old man was translated by these words, fetch the glass of water and the decanter from Valentine's room. Morrill rang immediately for the servant who had taken Barrois's situation, and in Noyertia's name gave that order. The servant soon returned. The decanter and the glass were completely empty. Noyertia made a sign that he wished to speak. Why are the glass and decanter empty? Asked he, Valentine said she only drank half the glass full. The translation of this new question occupied another five minutes. I do not know, said the servant. But the housemaid is in Mademoiselle Valentine's room. Perhaps she has emptied them. Ask her, said Morrill, translating Noyertia's thought this time by his look. The servant went out, but returned almost immediately. Mademoiselle Valentine passed through the room to go to Madame de Vilfort's, said he, and in passing, as she was thirsty, she drank what remained in the glass, as for the decanter. Master Edward had emptied that to make a pond for his ducks. Noyertia erased his eyes to heaven, as a gambler does who stakes his all on one stroke. From that moment the old man's eyes were fixed on the door, and did not quit it. It was indeed Madame Danglars and her daughter whom Valentine had seen, they had been ushered into Madame de Vilfort's room, who had said she would receive them there. That is why Valentine passed through the room, which was on a level with Valentine's, and only separated from it by Edward's. The two ladies entered the drawing-room with that sort of official stiffness which preludes a formal communication. Among worldly people manner is contagious. 
Madame de Vilfort received them with equal solemnity. Valentine entered at this moment, and the formalities were resumed. My dear friend, said the Baroness, while the two young people were shaking hands, I and Eugenie are come to be the first to announce to you the approaching marriage of my daughter with Prince Cavalcanti. Dandler's kept up the title of Prince. The popular banker found that it answered better than Count. Allow me to present to you my sincere congratulations, replied Madame de Vilfort. Prince Cavalcanti appears to be a young man of rare qualities. Listen, said the Baroness, smiling, speaking to you as a friend I can say that the Prince does not yet appear all he will be. He has about him a little of that foreign manner by which French persons recognize, at first sight, the Italian or German nobleman. Besides, he gives evidence of great kindness of disposition, much keenness of wit, and as to suitability, M. Dantlers assures me that his fortune is majestic, that is his word, and then, said Eugenie, while turning over the leaves of Madame de Vilfort's album, add that you have taken a great fancy to the young man, and, said Madame de Vilfort, I need not ask you if you share that fancy, I? replied Eugenie with her usual candor. Oh, not the least in the world, Madame. My wish was not to confine myself to domestic cares, or the caprices of any man, but to be an artist, and consequently free in heart, in person, and in thought. Eugenie pronounced these words with so firm a tone that the color mounted to Valentine's cheeks. The timid girl could not understand that vigorous nature which appeared to have none of the timidities of woman. At any rate, said she, since I am to be married whether I will or not, I ought to be thankful to Providence for having released me from my engagement with M. Albert de Morcerf, or I should this day have been the wife of a dishonored man, it is true, said the Baroness, with that strange simplicity sometimes met with amongst fashionable ladies, and of which plebeian intercourse can never entirely deprive them, it is very true that had not the Morcerfs hesitated, my daughter would have married Monsieur Albert. The general depended much on it. He even came to force M. Dandler's. We have had a narrow escape, but, said Valentine, timidly, does all the father's shame revert upon the son? Monsieur Albert appears to me quite innocent of the treason charged against the general. Excuse me, said the implacable young girl, Monsieur Albert claims and well deserves his share. It appears that after having challenged M. de Monte Cristo at the opera yesterday, he apologized on the ground today. Impossible, said Madame de Vilfort. Ah! My dear friend, said Madame Dandlers, with the same simplicity we before noticed, it is a fact. I heard it from M. D. Bray, who was present at the explanation. Valentine also knew the truth, but she did not answer. A single word had reminded her that Morel was expecting her in M. Neuertier's room. Deeply engaged with a sort of inward contemplation, Valentine had ceased for a moment to join in the conversation. She would, indeed, have found it impossible to repeat what had been said the last few minutes, when suddenly Madame Dandler's hand, rest on her arm, aroused her from her lethargy, what is it? said she, starting at Madame Dandler's touch as she would have done from an electric shock. It is, my dear Valentine, said the Baroness, that you are, doubtless, suffering, I? said the young girl, passing her hand across her burning forehead, yes, look at yourself in that glass, you have turned pale and then red successively, three or four times in one minute, indeed, cried Eugenie, you are very pale, oh, do not be alarmed, I have been so for many days, artless as she was, the young girl knew that this was an opportunity to leave, and besides, Madame de Vilfort came to her assistance, retire, Valentine, said she, you are really suffering, and these ladies will excuse you, drink a glass of pure water, it will restore you, Valentine kissed Eugenie, bowed to Madame Dandler's, who had already risen to take her leave, and went out. That poor child, said Madame de Vilfort when Valentine was gone, she makes me very uneasy, and I should not be astonished if she had some serious illness. Meanwhile, Valentine, in a sort of excitement which she could not quite understand, had crossed Edward's room without noticing some trick of the child, and through her own had reached the little staircase. She was within three steps of the bottom, she already heard Morrill's voice, when suddenly a cloud passed over her eyes. Her stiffened foot missed the step, her hands had no power to hold the baluster, and falling against the wall she lost her balance wholly and troubled to the floor. Morrill bounded to the door, opened it, and found Valentine stretched out at the bottom of the stairs. Quick as a flash, he raised her in his arms and placed her in a chair. Valentine opened her eyes. Oh, what a clumsy thing I am, said she with feverish volubility, I don't know my way. I forgot there were three more steps before the landing. You have hurt yourself, perhaps, said Morrill. What can I do for you, 
Valentine? Valentine looked around her. She saw the deepest terror depicted in Noyertia's eyes. Don't worry, dear Grandpapa, said she, endeavoring to smile. It is nothing, it is nothing, I was giddy, it is all. Another attack of giddiness, said Morrill, clasping his hands. Oh, attend to it, Valentine, I entreat you, but no, said Valentine, no, I tell you it is all past, and it was nothing. Now, let me tell you some news, Eugenie is to be married in a week, and in three days there is to be a grand feast, a betrothal festival. We are all invited, my father, Madame de Vilfort, and I, at least, I understood it so. When will it be our turn to think of these things? Oh, Valentine, you who have so much influence over your grandpapa, try to make him answer, soon, and do you, said Valentine, depend on me to stimulate the tardiness and arouse the memory of grandpapa? Yes, cried Morrill, make haste. So long as you are not mine, Valentine, I shall always think I may lose you. Oh, replied Valentine with a convulsive movement, oh, indeed, Maximilian, you are too timid for an officer for a soldier who, they say, never knows fear. Ah, ha, ha. She burst into a forced and melancholy laugh, her arms stiffened and twisted, her head fell back on her chair, and she remained motionless. The cry of terror which was stopped on Noyertia's lips, seemed to start from his eyes. Morrill understood it, he knew he must call assistance. The young man rang the bell violently, the housemaid who had been in Mademoiselle Valentine's room, and the servant who had replaced Barois ran in at the same moment. Valentine was so pale, so cold, so inanimate that without listening to what was said to them they were seized with the fear which pervaded that house, and they flew into the passage crying for help. Madame Dantlers and Eugenie were going out at that moment, they heard the cause of the disturbance. I told you so! exclaimed Madame de Vilfort. Poor child! Chapter 94 Maximilian's Avowal. At the same moment M. de Vilfort's voice was heard calling from his study, What is the matter? Morrill looked at Noyertia who had recovered his self-command, and with a glance indicated the closet where once before under somewhat similar circumstances, he had taken refuge. He had only time to get his hat and throw himself breathless into the closet when the procurer's footstep was heard in the passage. Vilfert sprang into the room, ran to Valentine, and took her in his arms. A physician, a physician, M. Devrini, cried Vilfert, or rather I will go for him myself. He flew from the apartment and Morrill at the same moment darted out to the other door. He had been struck to the heart by a frightful recollection, the conversation he had heard between the doctor and Vilford the night of Madame de saint Meron's death, recurred to him, these symptoms, to a less alarming extent, were the same which had preceded the death of Barrois. At the same time Monte Cristo's voice seemed to resound in his ear with the words he had heard only two hours before, Whatever you want, Morrill, come to me, I have great power. More rapidly than thought, he darted down the Rue Matignon, and thence to the Avenue des Champs-Élysées. Meanwhile M. de Vilfort arrived in a hired cabriolet at M. de Vrigny's door. He rang so violently that the porter was alarmed. Vilfort ran upstairs without saying a word. The porter knew him, and let him pass, only calling to him, in his study, Monsieur Procureur, in his study. Vilfort pushed, or rather forced, the door open. Ah, said the doctor, is it you? Yes, said Vilfort closing the door after him, it is I, who am come in my turn to ask you if we are quite alone. Doctor, my house is accursed. What? said the latter with apparent coolness, but with deep emotion. Have you another invalid? Yes, doctor, cried Vilfert, clutching his hair. Yes, the Vrini's look implied, I told you it would be so. Then he slowly uttered these words, who is now dying in your house? What new victim is going to accuse you of weakness before God? A mournful sob burst from Vilfert's heart, he approached the doctor, and seizing his arm, Valentine, said he, it is Valentine's turn, your daughter? cried de Vrigny with grief and surprise, you see you were deceived, murmured the magistrate, come and see her, and on her bed of agony entreat her pardon for having suspected her, each time you have applied to me, said the doctor, it has been too late, still I will go, but let us make haste, sir, with the enemies you have to do with there is no time to be lost. Oh, this time, doctor, you shall not have to reproach me with weakness. This time I will know the assassin, and will pursue him. Let us try first to save the victim before we think of revenging her, said de Vrigny. Come. The same cabriolet which had brought Vilfort took them back at full speed, and at this moment Morrill rapped at Monte Cristo's door. The Count was in his study and was reading with an angry look something which Batasio had brought in haste. 
Hearing the name of Morrill, who had left him only two hours before, Count raised his head, arose, and sprang to meet him. What is the matter, Maximilian? asked he, you are pale, and the perspiration rolls from your forehead. Morrill fell into a chair. Yes, said he, I came quickly, I wanted to speak to you, are all your family well? asked the Count, with an affectionate benevolence, whose sincerity no one could for a moment doubt. Thank you, Count, thank you, said the young man, evidently embarrassed how to begin the conversation. Yes, everyone in my family is well, so much the better, yet you have something to tell me? replied the Count with increased anxiety. Yes, said Morrill, it is true, I have but now left a house where death has just entered, to run to you, are you then come from them? The more serfs? asked Monte Cristo. No, said Morrill, is someone dead in his house? The general has just blown his brains out, replied Monte Cristo with great coolness. Oh, what a dreadful event! cried Maximilian. Not for the Countess, or for Albert, said Monte Cristo, a dead father or husband is better than a dishonored one. Blood washes out shame, poor Countess, said Maximilian, I pity her very much, she is so noble a woman, pity Albert also, Maximilian, for believe me he is the worthy son of the Countess. But let us return to yourself. You have hastened to me, can I have the happiness of being useful to you? Yes, I need your help, that is I thought like a madman that you could lend me your assistance in a case where God alone can succor me. Tell me what it is, replied Monte Cristo. Oh, said Morrill, I know not. Indeed, if I may reveal this secret to mortal ears, but fatality impels me, necessity constrains me, Count, Morrill hesitated. Do you think I love you? said Monte Cristo, taking the young man's hand affectionately in his. Oh, you encourage me, and something tells me there, placing his hand on his heart, that I ought to have no secret from you. You are right, Morrill, God is speaking to your heart, and your heart speaks to you. Tell me what it says, Count. Will you allow me to send Baptistin to inquire after someone you know? I am at your service, and still more my servants. Oh, I cannot live if she is not better. Shall I ring for Baptistin? No, I will go and speak to him myself. Morrill went out, called Baptistin, and whispered a few words to him. The valet ran directly. Well, have you sent? asked Monte Cristo, seeing Morrill return. Yes, and now I shall be more calm. You know I am waiting, said Monte Cristo, smiling. Yes, and I will tell you. One evening I was in a garden, a clump of trees concealed me, no one suspected I was there. Two persons passed near me, allow me to conceal their names for the present, they were speaking in an undertone, and yet I was so interested in what they said that I did not lose a single word. This is a gloomy introduction, if I may judge from your pallor and shuddering, moral. Oh, yes, very gloomy, my friend. Someone had just died in the house to which that garden belonged. One of the persons whose conversation I overheard was the master of the house. The other, a physician. The former was confiding to the latter his grief and fear, for it was the second time within a month that death had suddenly and unexpectedly entered that house which was apparently destined to destruction by some exterminating angel, as an object of God's anger. Ah, indeed, said Monte Cristo, looking earnestly at the young man, and by an imperceptible movement turning his chair, so that he remained in the shade while the light fell full on Maximilian's face. Yes, continued Morrill, Death had entered that house twice within one month, and what did the doctor answer? Asked Monte Cristo, he replied, he replied, that the death was not a natural one, and must be attributed dash, to what, to poison, indeed? Said Monte Cristo with a slight cough which in moments of extreme emotion helped him to disguise a blush, or his pallor, or the intense interest with which he listened, indeed, Maximilian, did you hear that? Yes, my dear Count, I heard it and the doctor added that if another death occurred in a similar way he must appeal to justice. Monte Cristo listened, or appeared to do so, with the greatest calmness. Well, said Maximilian, death came a third time, and neither the master of the house nor the doctor said a word. Death is now, perhaps, striking a fourth blow. Count, what am I bound to do, being in possession of this secret? My dear friend, said Monte Cristo, you appear to be relating an adventure which we all know by heart. I know the house where you heard it, or one very similar to it, a house with a garden, a master, a physician, and where there have been three unexpected and sudden deaths. Well, I have not intercepted your confidence, and yet I know all that as well as you, and I have no conscientious scruples. No, it does not concern me. You say an exterminating angel appears to have devoted that house to God's anger, well, who says your supposition is not reality? 
do not notice things which those whose interest it is to see them pass over. If it is God's justice, instead of his anger, which is walking through that house, Maximilian, turn away your face and let his justice accomplish its purpose. Morrell shuddered. There was something mournful, solemn, and terrible in the Count's manner. Besides, continued he, in so changed a tone that no one would have supposed it was the same person speaking. Besides, who says that it will begin again? It has returned, Count, exclaimed Morrell, that is why I hasten to you. Well, what do you wish me to do? Do you wish me, for instance, to give information to the procurer? Monte Cristo uttered the last words with so much meaning that Morrell, starting up, cried out, You know of whom I speak, Count, do you not? Perfectly well, my good friend, and I will prove it to you by putting the dots to the eye, or rather by naming the persons. You were walking one evening in M. de Vilfort's garden, from what you relate, I suppose it to have been the evening of Madame de Saint Meron's death. You heard M. de Vilfort talking to M. de Vriani about the death of M. de Saint Meron and that no less surprising, of the Countess. M. De Vrini said he believed they both proceeded from poison, and you, honest man, have ever since been asking your heart and sounding your conscience to know if you ought to expose or conceal this secret. Why do you torment them? Conscience, what hast thou to do with me? As Stern said, My dear fellow, let them sleep on, if they are asleep, let them grow pale in their drowsiness, if they are disposed to do so, and pray do you remain in peace. You have no remorse to disturb you. Deep grief was depicted on Morrell's features, he sees Monte Cristo's hand. But it is beginning again, I say. Well, said the Count, astonished at his perseverance, which he could not understand, and looking still more earnestly at Maximilian, let it begin again, it is like the house of the Atridae, God has condemned them, and they must submit to their punishment. They will all disappear, like the fabrics children build with cards, and which fall, one by one, under the breath of their builder even if there are two hundred of them. Three months since it was M. de saint Meron, Madame de saint Meron. two months since, the other day it was Barois, today, the old Neuertia, or young Valentine, in the old Greek legend the Atridae, or children of Atreus, were doomed to punishment because of the abominable crime of their father. The Agamemnon of Aeschylus is based on this legend, you knew it? cried Morrell, in such a paroxysm of terror that Monte Cristo started, he whom the falling heavens would have found unmoved you knew it, and said nothing, and what is it to me? replied Monte Cristo, shrugging his shoulders, do I know those people? and must I lose the one to save the other? faith, no, for between the culprit and the victim I have no choice, but I, cried Morrell, groaning with sorrow, I love her, you love, whom? cried Monte Cristo, starting to his feet, and seizing the two hands which Morrell was raising towards heaven, I love most fondly, I love madly, I love as a man who would give his life blood to spare her a tear, I love Valentine de Vilfort, who is being murdered at this moment. Do you understand me? I love her, and I ask God and you how I can save her? Monte Cristo uttered the cry which those only can conceive who have heard the roar of a wounded lion. Unhappy man, cried he, wringing his hands in his turn, you love Valentine, that daughter of an accursed race. Never had Morrell witnessed such an expression, never had so terrible an eye flashed before his face. Never had the genius of terror he had so often seen, either on the battlefield or in the murderous nights of Algeria, shaken around him more dreadful fire. He drew back terrified. As for Monte Cristo, after this abolition he closed his eyes as if dazzled by internal light. In a moment he restrained himself so powerfully that the tempestuous heaving of his breast subsided, as turbulent and foaming waves yield to the sun's genial influence when the cloud has passed. This silence, self-control, and struggle lasted about twenty seconds, then the Count raised his pallid face. See, said he, my dear friend, how God punishes the most thoughtless and unfeeling men for their indifference, by presenting dreadful scenes to their view. I, who was looking on, an eager and curious spectator, I, who was watching the working of this mournful tragedy, I, who like a wicked angel was laughing at the evil men committed protected by secrecy, a secret is easily kept by the rich and powerful. I am in my turn bitten by the serpent whose tortuous course I was watching, and bitten to the heart. Morrell groaned. Come, come, continued the Count, complaint Sarah unavailing, be a man, be strong, be full of hope, but I am here and will watch over you. Morrell shook his head sorrowfully. I tell you to hope. Do you understand me? cried Monte Cristo. Remember that I never uttered a falsehood and am never deceived. It is twelve o'clock, Maximilian, thank heaven that you came at noon rather than in the evening. Or tomorrow morning. Listen, Morrell, 
It is noon. If Valentine is not now dead, she will not die. How so? cried Morrill, when I left her dying. Monte Cristo pressed his hands to his forehead. What was passing in that brain, so loaded with dreadful secrets? What does the angel of light or the angel of darkness say to that mind, at once implacable and generous? God only knows, Monte Cristo raised his head once more, and this time he was calm as a child awaking from its sleep. Maximilian, said he, return home. I command you not to stir, attempt nothing, not to let your countenance betray a thought, and I will send you tidings. Go, oh, Count, you overwhelm me with that coolness. Have you, then, power against death? Are you superhuman? Are you an angel? And the young man, who had never shrunk from danger, shrank before Monte Cristo with indescribable terror. But Monte Cristo looked at him with so melancholy and sweet a smile, that Maximilian felt the tears filling his eyes. I can do much for you, my friend, replied the Count. Go, oh, I must be alone. Moral, subdued by the extraordinary ascendancy Monte Cristo exercised over everything around him, did not endeavor to resist it. He pressed the Count's hand and left. He stopped one moment at the door for Baptistin, whom he saw in the room at Hignan, and who was running. Meanwhile, Vilfert and Divini had made all possible haste, Valentine had not revived from her fainting fit on their arrival, and the doctor examined the invalid with all the care the circumstances demanded, and with an interest which the knowledge of the secret intensified twofold. Vilfert, closely watching his countenance and his lips, awaited the result of the examination. Noirtia, paler than even the young girl, more eager than Vilfert for the decision, was watching also intently and affectionately. At last Devrini slowly uttered these words, She is still alive, still, cried Vilfert, Oh, doctor, what a dreadful word is that. Yes, said the physician, I repeat it, she is still alive, and I am astonished at it, but is she safe? Asked the father, Yes, since she lives. At that moment Devrini's glance met Noirtia's eye. It glistened with such extraordinary joy, so rich and full of thought that the physician was struck. He placed the young girl again on the chair, her lips were scarcely discernible, they were so pale and white, as well as her whole face, and remained motionless, looking at Noirtia, who appeared to anticipate and commend all he did. Sir, said Devrini to Vilfert, call Mademoiselle Valentine's maid, if you please. Vilfert went himself to find her, and Devrini approached Noirtia. Have you something to tell me? asked he. The old man winked his eyes expressively, which we may remember was his only way of expressing his approval, privately, yes, well, I will remain with you. At this moment Vilfert returned, followed by the lady's maid, and after her came Madame de Vilfert. What is the matter, then, with this dear child? She has just left me, and she complained of being indisposed, but I did not think seriously of it. The young woman with tears in her eyes and every mark of affection of a true mother, approached Valentine and took her hand. Devrini continued to look at Noirtia. He saw the eyes of the old man dilate and become round, his cheeks turn pale and tremble, the perspiration stood in drops upon his forehead. Ah, said he, involuntarily following Noirtia's eyes, which were fixed on Madame de Vilfert, who repeated, This poor child would be better in bed. Come, Fanny, we will put her to bed. M. De Vrini, who saw that would be a means of his remaining alone with Noirtia, expressed his opinion that it was the best thing that could be done but he forbade that anything should be given to her except what he ordered. They carried Valentine away, she had revived, but could scarcely move or speak, so shaken was her frame by the attack. She had, however, just power to give one parting look to her grandfather, who in losing her seemed to be resigning his very soul. Devrini followed the invalid, wrote a prescription, ordered Vilford to take a cabriolet, go in person to a chemist's to get the prescribed medicine, bring it himself, and wait for him in his daughter's room. Then, Having renewed his injunction not to give Valentine anything, he went down again to Noirtia, shut the doors carefully, and after convincing himself that no one was listening, You, said he, know anything of this young lady's illness? Yes, said the old man, we have no time to lose, I will question, and do you answer me? Noirtia made a sign that he was ready to answer. Did you anticipate the accident which has happened to your granddaughter? Yes. Devrini reflected a moment, then approaching Noirtia. Pardon what I am going to say, added he, but no indication should be neglected in this terrible situation. Did you see poor Barrois die? Noirty erased his eyes to heaven. Do you know of what he died? asked Devrini, placing his hand on Noirty's shoulder. Yes, replied the old man. Do you think he died a natural death? 
a sort of smile was discernible on the motionless lips of Noyertia. Then you have thought that Barois was poisoned? Yes. Do you think the poison he fell a victim to was intended for him? No. Do you think the same hand which unintentionally struck Barois has now attacked Valentine? Yes. Then will she die too? Asked Avrini, fixing his penetrating gaze on Noyertia. He watched the effect of this question on the old man. No, replied he with an air of triumph which would have puzzled the most clever diviner. Then you hope? Said Devrini, with surprise. Yes, what do you hope? The old man made him understand with his eyes that he could not answer. Ah, yes, it is true, murmured Devrini. Then, turning to Noyertia, do you hope the assassin will be tried? No, then you hope the poison will take no effect on Valentine? Yes, it is no news to you, added Devrini, to tell you that an attempt has been made to poison her. The old man made a sign that he entertained no doubt upon the subject. Then how do you hope Valentine will escape? Noyertia kept his eyes steadfastly fixed on the same spot. Devrini followed the direction and saw that they were fixed on a bottle containing the mixture which he took every morning. Ah, indeed, said Devrini, struck with a sudden thought, as it occurred to you, Noyertia did not let him finish. Yes, said he, to prepare her system to resist poison, yes, by accustoming her by degrees dash, yes, 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 said Noyertia, delighted to be understood, of course. I had told you that there was brucine in the mixture I give you, yes, and by accustoming her to that poison, you have endeavoured to neutralise the effect of a similar poison? Noyertia's joy continued. And you have succeeded, exclaimed Devrini. Without that precaution Valentine would have died before assistance could have been procured. The dose has been excessive, but she has only been shaken by it, and this time, at any rate, Valentine will not die. A superhuman joy expanded the old man's eyes which were raised towards heaven with an expression of infinite gratitude. At this moment Vilfert returned. Here, doctor, said he, is what you sent me for, was this prepared in your presence? Yes, replied the procurer, have you not let it go out of your hands? No. Devrini took the bottle, poured some drops of the mixture it contained in a hollow of his hand, and swallowed them. Well, said he, let us go to Valentine, I will give instructions to everyone, and you, M. De Vilfert. Will yourself see that no one deviates from them? At the moment when Devrini was returning to Valentine's room, accompanied by Vilfert, an Italian priest, of serious demeanor and calm and firm tone, hired for his use the house adjoining the Hotel of M. De Vilfert. No one knew how the three former tenants of that house left it. About two hours afterwards its foundation was reported to be unsafe, but the report did not prevent the new occupant establishing himself with his modest furniture the same day at five o'clock. The lease was drawn up for three, six, or nine years by the new tenant, who, according to the rule of the proprietor, paid six months in advance. This new tenant, who, as we have said, was an Italian, was called Il Signor Giacomo Bersoni. Workmen were immediately called in, and that same night the passengers at the end of the Faubourg saw with surprise that carpenters and masons were occupied in repairing the lower part of the tottering house. Chapter 95 Father and Daughter we saw in a preceding chapter how Madame d'Anglers went formally to announce to Madame de Vilfert the approaching marriage of Eugenie d'Anglers and M. Andrea Cavalcanti. This announcement, which implied or appeared to imply the approval of all the persons concerned in this momentous affair, had been preceded by a scene to which our readers must be admitted. We beg them to take one step backward, and to transport themselves, the morning of that day of great catastrophes, into the showy, gilded salon we have before shown them and which was the pride of its owner, Baron Dantlers. In this room, at about ten o'clock in the morning, the banker himself had been walking to and fro for some minutes thoughtfully and in evident uneasiness, watching both doors, and listening to every sound. When his patience was exhausted, he called his valet. He shine, said he, see why Mademoiselle Eugenie has asked me to meet her in the drawing room, and why she makes me wait so long. Having given this vent to his ill humour, the Baron became more calm. Mademoiselle d'Antlers had that morning requested an interview with her father, and had fixed on the gilded drawing room as the spot. The singularity of this step, and above all its formality, had not a little surprised the banker, who had immediately obeyed his daughter by repairing first to the drawing room. He shine soon returned from his errand. Mademoiselle's lady's maid says, Sir, that Mademoiselle is finishing her toilette, and will be here shortly. D'Antlers nodded, to signify that he was satisfied. To the world and to his servants Danglers assumed the character of the good-natured man and the indulgent father. This was one of his parts in the popular comedy he was performing, 
a makeup he had adopted and which suited him about as well as the masks worn on the classic stage by paternal actors, who seen from one side, were the image of geniality, and from the other showed lips drawn down in chronic ill temper. Let us hasten to say that in private the genial side descended to the level of the other, so that generally the indulgent man disappeared to give place to the brutal husband and domineering father. Why the devil does that foolish girl, who pretends to wish to speak to me, not come into my study? And why on earth does she want to speak to me at all? He was turning this thought over in his brain for the twentieth time, when the door opened and Eugenie appeared, attired in a figured black satin dress, her hair dressed and gloves on, as if she were going to the Italian opera. Well, Eugenie, what is it you want with me? And why in this solemn drawing room when the study is so comfortable? I quite understand why you ask, sir, said Eugenie, making a sign that her father might be seated, and in fact your two questions suggest fully the theme of our conversation. I will answer them both, and contrary to the usual method, the last first, because it is the least difficult. I have chosen the drawing room, sir, as our place of meeting, in order to avoid the disagreeable impressions and influences of a banker's study. Those gilded cash books, drawers locked like gates of fortresses, heaps of bank bills, come from I know not where, the quantities of letters from England, Holland, Spain, India, China, and Peru, have generally a strange influence on a father's mind, and make him forget that there is in the world an interest greater and more sacred than the good opinion of his correspondents. I have, therefore, chosen this drawing room, where you see, smiling and happy in their magnificent frames, your portrait, mine, my mother's, and all sorts of rural landscapes and touching pastorals. I rely much on external impressions, perhaps, with regard to you, they are immaterial but I should be no artist if I had not some fancies. Very well, replied M. Dandlers, who had listened to all this preamble with imperturbable coolness, but without understanding a word, since like every man burdened with thoughts of the past, he was occupied with seeking the thread of his own ideas in those of the speaker. There is, then, the second point cleared up, or nearly so, said Eugenie, without the least confusion, and with that masculine pointedness which distinguished her gesture and her language and you appear satisfied with the explanation. Now, let us return to the first. You ask me why I have requested this interview, I will tell you in two words, sir, I will not marry Count Andrea Cavalcanti, Dandlers leapt from his chair and raised his eyes and arms towards heaven, yes, indeed, sir, continued Eugenie, still quite calm, you are astonished, I see, for since this little affair began, I have not manifested the slightest opposition, and yet I am always sure, when the opportunity arrives, to oppose a determined and absolute will to people who have not consulted me, and things which displease me. However, this time, my tranquillity, or passiveness as philosophers say, proceeded from another source, it proceeded from a wish, like a submissive and devoted daughter, a slight smile was observable on the purple lips of the young girl, to practice obedience, well? asked Dandlers, well, sir, replied Eugenie, I have tried to the very last and now that the moment has come. I feel in spite of all my efforts that it is impossible, but, said Dandlers, whose weak mind was at first quite overwhelmed with the weight of this pitiless logic, marking evident premeditation and force of will, what is your reason for this refusal, Eugenie? What reason do you assign, my reason? replied the young girl. Well, it is not that the man is more ugly, more foolish, or more disagreeable than any other, no, M. Andrea Cavalcanti may appear to those who look at men's faces and figures as a very good specimen of his kind. It is not, either, that my heart is less touched by him than any other, that would be a schoolgirl's reason, which I consider quite beneath me. I actually love no one, sir, you know it, do you not? I do not then see why, without real necessity, I should encumber my life with a perpetual companion. Has not some sage said, nothing too much? And another, I carry all my effects with me? I have been taught these two aphorisms in Latin and in Greek, one is, I believe, from Fae Idris, and the other from Bias. Well, my dear father, in the shipwreck of life, for life is an eternal shipwreck of our hopes, I cast into the sea my useless encumbrance, that is all, and I remain with my own will, disposed to live perfectly alone, and consequently perfectly free, unhappy girl, unhappy girl, murmured Dandlers, turning pale for he knew from long experience the solidity of the obstacle he had so suddenly encountered. Unhappy girl, replied Eugenie, unhappy girl, do you say, sir? No, indeed. The exclamation appears quite theatrical and affected. Happy, on the contrary, for what am I in want of? The world calls me beautiful. 
It is something to be well received. I like a favorable reception, it expands the countenance, and those around me do not then appear so ugly. I possess a share of wit, and a certain relative sensibility, which enables me to draw from life in general, for the support of mine, all I meet with that is good, like the monkey who cracks the nut to get at its contents. I am rich, for you have one of the first fortunes in France. I am your only daughter, and you are not so exacting as the fathers of the Porte Saint Martin and Gay Art, who disinherit their daughters for not giving them grandchildren. Besides, the provident law has deprived you of the power to disinherit me, at least entirely, as it has also of the power to compel me to marry Monsieur this or Monsieur that. And so, being, beautiful, witty, somewhat talented, as the comic operas say, and rich, and that is happiness, sir, why do you call me unhappy? Dandlers, seeing his daughter smiling, and proud even to insolence, could not entirely repress his brutal feelings, but they betrayed themselves only by an exclamation. Under the fixed and inquiring gaze leveled at him from under those beautiful black eyebrows, he prudently turned away, and calmed himself immediately, daunted by the power of a resolute mind. Truly, my daughter, replied he with a smile, you are all you boast of being, excepting one thing, I will not too hastily tell you which. I would rather leave you to guess it. Eugenie looked at Dandler's, much surprised that one flower of her crown of pride, with which she had so superbly decked herself, should be disputed. My daughter, continued the banker, you have perfectly explained to me the sentiments which influence a girl like you, who is determined she will not marry. Now it remains for me to tell you the motives of a father like me, who has decided that his daughter shall marry. Eugenie bowed, not as a submissive daughter, but as an adversary prepared for a discussion. My daughter, continued Dandler's, when a father asks his daughter to choose a husband, he has always some reason for wishing her to marry. Some are affected with the mania of which you spoke just now, that of living again in their grandchildren. This is not my weakness, I tell you at once, family joys have no charm for me. I may acknowledge this to a daughter whom I know to be philosophical enough to understand my indifference, and not to impute it to me as a crime. This is not to the purpose, said Eugenie, let us speak candidly, sir, I admire candor, oh, said Dantlers, I can, when circumstances render it desirable, adopt your system, although it may not be my general practice. I will therefore proceed. I have proposed to you to marry, not for your sake, for indeed I did not think of you in the least at the moment, you admire candor, and will now be satisfied, I hope, because it suited me to marry you as soon as possible, on account of certain commercial speculations I am desirous of entering into. Eugenie became uneasy, it is just as I tell you, I assure you and you must not be angry with me, for you have sought this disclosure. I do not willingly enter into arithmetical explanations with an artist like you, who fears to enter my study lest she should imbibe disagreeable or antipoetic impressions and sensations. But in that same banker's study, where you very willingly presented yourself yesterday to ask for the thousand francs I give you monthly for pocket money, you must know, my dear young lady, that many things may be learned, useful even to a girl who will not marry. There one may learn, for instance, what, out of regard to your nervous susceptibility, I will inform you of in the drawing room, namely, that the credit of a banker is his physical and moral life, that credit sustains him as breath animates the body, and dem. De Monte Cristo once gave me a lecture on that subject, which I have never forgotten. For we may learn that as credit sinks, the body becomes a corpse, and this is what must happen very soon to the banker who is proud to own so good a logician as you for his daughter. But Eugenie, instead of stooping, drew herself up under the blow. Ruined? said she. Exactly, my daughter, it is precisely what I mean, said Dantlers, almost digging his nails into his breast, while he preserved on his harsh features the smile of a heartless though clever man. Ruined, yes, that is it, ah, said Eugenie, yes, ruined. Now it is revealed, this secret so full of horror, as the tragic poet says. Now, my daughter, learn from my lips how you may alleviate this misfortune so far as it will affect you, oh, cried Eugenie, you are a bad physiognomist, if you imagine I deplore on my own account the catastrophe of which you warn me. I ruined? And what will that signify to me? Have I not my talent left? Can I not, like Pasta, Bolibran, Brissy, acquire for myself what you would never have given me, whatever might have been your fortune, a hundred or a hundred and fifty thousand livres per annum, for which I shall be indebted to no one but myself, and which, instead of being given as you gave me those poor twelve thousand francs, with sour looks and reproaches for my prodigality, will be accompanied with acclamations, with bravos, and with flowers. And if I do not possess that talent, 
which your smiles prove to me you doubt, should I not still have that ardent love of independence, which will be a substitute for wealth, and which in my mind supersedes even the instinct of self-preservation? No, I grieve not on my own account, I shall always find a resource, my books, my pencils, my piano, all the things which cost but little, and which I shall be able to procure, will remain my own. Do you think that I sorrow for Madame Danglars? Undeceive yourself again, either I am greatly mistaken, or she has provided against the catastrophe which threatens you, and, which will pass over without affecting her. She has taken care for herself, at least I hope so, for her attention has not been diverted from her projects by watching over me. She has fostered my independence by professedly indulging my love for liberty. Oh, no, sir, from my childhood I have seen too much, and understood too much, of what has passed around me, for misfortune to have an undue power over me. From my earliest recollections, I have been beloved by no one, so much the worse, but has naturally led me to love no one, so much the better, now you have my profession of faith. Then, said Danglars, pale with anger, which was not at all due to offended paternal love, then, Mademoiselle, you persist in your determination to accelerate my ruin. Your ruin? I accelerate your ruin? What do you mean? I do not understand you, so much the better, I have a ray of hope left, listen, I am all attention, said Eugenie, looking so earnestly at her father that it was an effort for the latter to endure her unrelenting gaze, M. Cavalcanti, continued Dandlers, is about to marry you, and will place in my hands his fortune, amounting to three million livres, that is admirable, said Eugenie with sovereign contempt, smoothing her gloves out one upon the other, you think I shall deprive you of those three millions, said Dandlers, but do not fear it, they are destined to produce at least ten. I and a brother banker have obtained a grant of a railway, the only industrial enterprise which in these days promises to make good the fabulous prospects that law once held out to the eternally deluded Parisians, in the fantastic Mississippi scheme. As I look at it, a millionth part of the railway is worth fully as much as an acre of waste land on the banks of the Ohio. We make in our case a deposit, on a mortgage, which is an advance, as you see, since we gain at least ten. 15, 20, or a hundred livres worth of iron in exchange for our money. Well, within a week I am to deposit four millions for my share, the four millions, I promise you, will produce ten or twelve, but during my visit to you the day before yesterday, sir, which you appear to recollect so well, replied Eugenie, I saw you arranging a deposit, is not that the term, of five millions and a half, you even pointed it out to me in two drafts on the treasury and you were astonished that so valuable a paper did not dazzle my eyes like lightning. Yes, but those five millions and a half are not mine, and are only a proof of the great confidence placed in me. My title of popular banker has gained me the confidence of charitable institutions, and the five millions and a half belong to them. At any other time I should not have hesitated to make use of them. The great losses I have recently sustained are well known, and, as I told you, my credit is rather shaken. That deposit may be at any moment withdrawn and if I had employed it for another purpose, I should bring on me a disgraceful bankruptcy. I do not despise bankruptcies, believe me, but they must be those which enrich, not those which ruin. Now, if you marry M. Cavalcanti, and I get the three millions, or even if it is thought I am going to get them, my credit will be restored, and my fortune, which for the last month or two has been swallowed up in gulfs which have been opened in my path by an inconceivable fatality, will revive. Do you understand me? perfectly, you pledge me for three millions, do you not? The greater the amount, the more flattering it is to you, it gives you an idea of your value, thank you. One word more, sir, do you promise me to make what use you can of the report of the fortune M. Cavalcanti will bring without touching the money? This is no act of selfishness, but of delicacy. I am willing to help rebuild your fortune, but I will not be an accomplice in the ruin of others. But since I tell you, cried Dunklers, that with these three million dash, do you expect to recover your position, sir, without touching those three million? I hope so. If the marriage should take place and confirm my credit, shall you be able to pay M. Cavalcanti the five hundred thousand francs you promise for my dowry? He shall receive them on returning from the mayor's, the performance of the civil marriage. Very well. What next? What more do you want? I wish to know if, in demanding my signature, you leave me entirely free in my person? Absolutely. Then, as I said before, sir, very well, I am ready to marry M. Cavalcanti, but what are you up to? Ah, that is my affair. What advantage should I have over you, if knowing your secret I were to tell you mine? Dandlers bit his lips. Then, said he, 
you are ready to pay the official visits, which are absolutely indispensable. Yes, replied Eugenie. And to sign the contract in three days? Yes. Then, in my turn, I also say, very well. Dandler's pressed his daughter's hand in his. But, extraordinary to relate, the father did not say, thank you, my child, nor did the daughter smile at her father. Is the conference ended? Asked Eugenie, rising. Dandler's motioned that he had nothing more to say. Five minutes afterwards the piano resounded to the touch of Mademoiselle Darmley's fingers, and Mademoiselle Dandler's was singing Brabantio's malediction on Desdemona. At the end of the PC Shine entered, and announced to Eugenie that the horses were in the carriage, and that the Baroness was waiting for her to pay her visits. We have seen them at Vilfort's, they proceeded then on their course. Chapter 96 The Contract Three days after the scene we have just described, namely, towards five o'clock in the afternoon of the day fixed for the signature of the contract between Mademoiselle Eugenie Dantlers and Andrea Cavalcanti, the banker persisted in calling Prince, a fresh breeze was stirring the leaves in the little garden in front of the Count of Monte Cristo's house, and the Count was preparing to go out. While his horses were impatiently pawing the ground, held in by the coachman, who had been seated a quarter of an hour on his box, the elegant phaeton with which we are familiar rapidly turned the angle of the entrance gate, and cast out on the doorsteps M. Andrea Cavalcanti, as decked up and gay as if he were going to marry a princess. He inquired after the Count with his usual familiarity, and ascending lightly to the second story met him at the top of the stairs. The Count stopped on seeing the young man. As for Andrea, he was launched, and when he was once launched nothing stopped him. Ah, good morning, my dear Count, said he. Ah, M. Andrea, said the latter, with his half-jesting tone, how do you do, charmingly, as you see. I am come to talk to you about a thousand things, but, first tell me, were you going out or just returned? I was going out, sir. Then, in order not to hinder you, I will get up with you if you please in your carriage, and Tom shall follow with my phaeton in tow. No, said the Count, with an imperceptible smile of contempt, for he had no wish to be seen in the young man's society. No, I prefer listening to you here, my dear M. Andrea, we can chat better indoors, and there is no coachman to overhear our conversation. The Count returned to a small drawing room on the first floor, sat down, and crossing his legs motioned to the young man to take a seat also. Andrea assumed his guest manner. You know, my dear Count, said he, the ceremony is to take place this evening. At nine o'clock the contract is to be signed at my father-in-law's. Ah, indeed? said Monte Cristo. What? Is it news to you? As not M. Dandler's informed you of the ceremony? Oh, yes, said the Count, I received a letter from him yesterday, but I do not think the hour was mentioned, possibly my father-in-law trusted to its general notoriety. Well, said Monte Cristo, you are fortunate, M. Cavalcanti, it is a most suitable alliance you are contracting, and Mademoiselle Dandler's is a handsome girl. Yes, indeed she is, replied Cavalcanti, in a very modest tone, above all. She is very rich, at least, I believe so, said Monte Cristo, very rich. Do you think? replied the young man, doubtless, it is said M. Dandler's conceals at least half of his fortune, and he acknowledges fifteen or twenty millions, said Andrea with a look sparkling with joy, without reckoning, added Monte Cristo, that he is on the eve of entering into a sort of speculation already in vogue in the United States and in England, but quite novel in France. Yes, yes, I know what you mean, the railway? of which he has obtained the grant, is it not, precisely, it is generally believed he will gain ten millions by that affair, ten millions. Do you think so? It is magnificent, said Cavalcanti, who was quite confounded at the metallic sound of these golden words. Without reckoning, replied Monte Cristo, that all his fortune will come to you, and justly too, since Mademoiselle Danglas is an only daughter. Besides, your own fortune, as your father assured me, is almost equal to that of your betrothed. But enough of money matters. Do you know, M. Andrea, I think you have managed this affair rather skillfully, not badly, by any means, said the young man, I was born for a diplomatist. Well, you must become a diplomatist. Diplomacy, you know, is something that is not to be acquired, it is instinctive. Have you lost your heart? Indeed, I fear it, replied Andrea, in the tone in which he had heard Durante or Valier reply to Alceste at the Théâtre Français. Is your love returned? In Molière's comedy, Le Misanthrope, I suppose so, said Andrea with a triumphant smile, since I am accepted. But I must not forget one grand point, which, that I have been singularly assisted, nonsense, I have, indeed, 
by circumstances? No. By you? By me? Not at all, Prince, said Monte Cristo laying a marked stress on the title. What have I done for you? Not your name, your social position, and your merit sufficient? No, said Andrea. No, it is useless for you to say so, Count. I maintain that the position of a man like you has done more than my name, my social position, and my merit. You are completely mistaken, sir, said Monte Cristo coldly, who felt the perfidious maneuver of the young man, and understood the bearing of his words. You only acquired my protection after the influence and fortune of your father had been ascertained, for, after all, who procured for me, who had never seen neither you or your illustrious father, the pleasure of your acquaintance, two of my good friends, Lord Wilmore and the Abbe Ibsoni. What encouraged me not to become your surety, but to patronize you, your father's name, so well known in Italy and so highly honored? Personally, I do not know you. This calm tone and perfect ease made Andrea feel that he was, for the moment, restrained by a more muscular hand than his own, and that the restraint could not be easily broken through. Oh, then my father has really a very large fortune, Count? It appears so, sir, replied Monte Cristo. Do you know if the marriage settlement he promised me has come? I have been advised of it. But the three millions? The three millions are probably on the road. Then I shall really have them? Oh, well, said the Count, I do not think you have yet known the want of money. Andrea was so surprised that he pondered the matter for a moment. Then, arousing from his reverie, Now, sir, I have one request to make to you, which you will understand, even if it should be disagreeable to you. Proceed, said Monte Cristo. I have formed an acquaintance thanks to my good fortune, with many noted persons, and have, at least for the moment, a crowd of friends. But marrying, as I am about to do, before all Paris, I ought to be supported by an illustrious name, and in the absence of the paternal hand some powerful one ought to lead me to the altar, now, my father is not coming to Paris, is he? He is old, covered with wounds, and suffers dreadfully, he says, in travelling, indeed, well, I am come to ask a favour of you, of me, yes, of you. And pray what may it be, well, to take his part, ah, my dear sir. What, after the varied relations I have had the happiness to sustain towards you, can it be that you know me so little as to ask such a thing? Ask me to lend you half a million and, although such a loan is somewhat rare, on my honour, you would annoy me less. No, then, what I thought I had already told you, that in participation in this world's affairs, more especially in their moral aspects, the Count of Monte Cristo has never ceased to entertain the scruples and even the superstitions of the East. I, who have a seraglio at Cairo, one at Smyrna, and one at Constantinople, preside at a wedding, never, then you refuse me, decidedly, and were you my son or my brother I would refuse you in the same way. But what must be done? said Andrea, disappointed, you said just now that you had a hundred friends, very true, but you introduced me at M. Dandler's, not at all. Let us recall the exact facts. You met him at a dinner party at my house, and you introduced yourself at his house, that is a totally different affair, yes, but, by my marriage, you have forwarded that, I, not in the least, I beg you to believe. Recollect what I told you when you asked me to propose you. Oh, I never make matches, my dear prince, it is my subtle principle. Andrea bit his lips, but, at least, you will be there, will all Paris be there, oh, certainly, well. Like all Paris, I shall be there too, said the Count, and will you sign the contract? I see no objection to that. My scruples do not go thus far. Well, since you will grant me no more, I must be content with what you give me. But one word more, Count, what is it? Advice. Be careful, advice is worse than a service. Oh, you can give me this without compromising yourself. Tell me what it is. Is my wife's fortune five hundred thousand livres? That is the sum M. Dandler's himself announced, must I receive it, or leave it in the hands of the notary? This is the way such affairs are generally arranged when it is wished to do them stylishly. Your two solicitors appoint a meeting, when the contract is signed, for the next or the following day, then they exchange the two portions, for which they each give a receipt, then, when the marriage is celebrated, they place the amount at your disposal as the chief member of the alliance, because, said Andrea, with a certain ill-concealed uneasiness. I thought I heard my father-in-law say that he intended embarking our property in that famous railway affair of which you spoke just now. Well, replied Monte Cristo, it will be the way, everybody says, of trebling your fortune in twelve months. Baron Danglars is a good father, and knows how to calculate. In that case, said Andrea, everything is all right, excepting your refusal, 
which quite grieves me. You must attribute it only to natural scruples under similar circumstances. Well, said Andrea, let it be as you wish. This evening, then, at nine o'clock, adieu till then. Notwithstanding a slight resistance on the part of Monte Cristo, whose lips turned pale, but who preserved his ceremonious smile, Andrea seized the Count's hand, pressed it, jumped into his phaeton, and disappeared. The four or five remaining hours before nine o'clock arrived, Andrea employed in riding, paying visits, designed to induce those of whom he had spoken to appear at the bankers in their gayest equipages, dazzling them by promises of shares in schemes which have since turned every brain, and in which Dan Glers was just taking the initiative. In fact, at half past eight in the evening the grand salon, the gallery adjoining, and the three other drawing rooms on the same floor, were filled with a perfumed crowd, who sympathized but little in the event, but who all participated in that love of being present wherever there is anything fresh to be seen. An academician would say that the entertainments of the fashionable world are collections of flowers which attract inconstant butterflies, famished bees, and buzzing drones. No one could deny that the rooms were splendidly illuminated, the light streamed forth on the gilt mouldings and the silk hangings, and all the bad taste of decorations, which had only their richness to boast of, shone in its splendor. Mademoiselle Eugenie was dressed with elegant simplicity in a figured white silk dress, and a white rose half concealed in her jet black hair was her only ornament, unaccompanied by a single jewel. Her eyes, however, betrayed that perfect confidence which contradicted the girlish simplicity of this modest attire. Madame Danglars was chatting at a short distance with Debray, Beecham, and Chatterie Nord. Debray was admitted to the house for this grand ceremony, but on the same plane with everyone else, and without any particular privilege. M. Danglars, surrounded by deputies and the men connected with the revenue, was explaining a new theory of taxation which he intended to adopt when the course of events had compelled the government to call him into the ministry. Andrea, on whose arm hung one of the most consummate dandies of the opera, was explaining to him rather cleverly, since he was obliged to be bold to appear at ease, his future projects, and the new luxuries he meant to introduce to Parisian fashions with his 175,000 livres per annum. The crowd moved to and fro in the rooms like an ebb and flow of turquoises, rubies, emeralds, opals, and diamonds. As usual, the oldest women were the most decorated, and the ugliest the most conspicuous. If there was a beautiful lily, or a sweet rose, you had to search for it, concealed in some corner behind a mother with a turban, or an aunt with a bird of paradise, at each moment, in the midst of the crowd, the buzzing, and the laughter. The doorkeeper's voice was heard announcing some name well known in the financial department, respected in the army, or illustrious in the literary world, and which was acknowledged by a slight movement in the different groups. But for one whose privilege it was to agitate that ocean of human waves, how many were received with a look of indifference or a sneer of disdain? At the moment when the hand of the massive timepiece, representing Endymion asleep, pointed to nine on its golden face, and the hammer, the faithful type of mechanical thought, struck nine times, the name of the Count of Monte Cristo resumed it in its turn, and as if by an electric shock all the assembly turned towards the door. The Count was dressed in black and with his habitual simplicity. His white waistcoat displayed his expansive noble chest and his black stock was singularly noticeable because of its contrast with the deadly paleness of his face. His only jewellery was a chain, so fine that the slender gold thread was scarcely perceptible on his white waistcoat. A circle was immediately formed around the door. The Count perceived at one glance Madame Dandler's at one end of the drawing-room, M. Dandler's at the other, and Eugenie in front of him. He first advanced towards the Baroness, who was chatting with Madame de Vilfort, who had come alone, Valentine being still an invalid, and without turning aside, so clear was the road left for him. He passed from the Baroness to Eugenie, whom he complimented in such rapid and measured terms, that the proud artist was quite struck. Near her was Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly, who thanked the Count for the letters of introduction he had so kindly given her for Italy, which she intended immediately to make use of. On leaving these ladies he found himself with Dandlers, who had advanced to meet him. Having accomplished these three social duties, Monte Cristo stopped, looking around him with that expression peculiar to a certain class, which seems to say, I have done my duty, now let others do theirs. Andrea, who was in an adjoining room, had shared in the sensation caused by the arrival of Monte Cristo, and now came forward to pay his respects to the Count. He found him completely surrounded. All were eager to speak to him, as is always the case with those whose words are few and weighty. The solicitors arrived at this moment and arranged their scrawled papers on the velvet cloth embroidered with gold which covered the table prepared for the signature, it was a gilt table supported on lion's claws. One of the notaries sat down, 
The other remained standing. They were about to proceed to the reading of the contract, which half Paris assembled was to sign. All took their places, or rather the ladies formed a circle, while the gentlemen, more indifferent to the restraints of what Boiler calls the energetic style, commented on the feverish agitation of Andrea, on M. Dandler's riveted attention, Eugenie's composure, and the light and sprightly manner in which the Baroness treated this important affair. The contract was read during a profound silence. But as soon as it was finished, the buzz was redoubled through all the drawing rooms, the brilliant sums, the rolling millions which were to be at the command of the two young people, and which crowned the display of the wedding presents and the young ladies' diamonds, which had been made in a room entirely appropriated for that purpose, had exercised to the full their delusions over the envious assembly. Mademoiselle Dandler's charms were heightened in the opinion of the young men, and for the moment seemed to outvie the sun in splendor. As for the ladies, it is needless to say that while they coveted the millions, they thought they did not need them for themselves, as they were beautiful enough without them. Andrea, surrounded by his friends, complimented, flattered, beginning to believe in the reality of his dream, was almost bewildered. The notary solemnly took the pen, flourished it above his head, and said, Gentlemen, we are about to sign the contract. The Baron was to sign first, then the representative of M. Cavalcanti, senior, then the Baroness, afterwards the future couple, as they are styled in the abominable phraseology of legal documents. The Baron took the pen and signed, then the representative. The Baroness approached, leaning on Madame de Vilfort's arm. My dear, said she, as she took the pen, is it not vexatious? An unexpected incident, in the affair of murder and theft at the Count of Monte Cristo's, in which he nearly fell a victim, deprives us of the pleasure of seeing M. de Vilfort, indeed, said M. Dandler's, in the same tone in which he would have said, Oh, well, what do I care, as a matter of fact, said Monte Cristo, approaching. I am much afraid that I am the involuntary cause of his absence. What, you, Count? said Madame Dandler's, signing, If you are, take care, for I shall never forgive you. Andrea pricked up his ears, but it is not my fault, as I shall endeavour to prove. Everyone listened eagerly. Monte Cristo, who so rarely opened his lips, was about to speak. You remember, said the Count, during the most profound silence, that the unhappy wretch who came to rob me died at my house. The supposition is that he was stabbed by his accomplice, on attempting to leave it. Yes, said Dantlers, in order that his wounds might be examined he was undressed, and his clothes were thrown into a corner, where the police picked them up, with the exception of the waistcoat, which they overlooked. Andrea turned pale, and drew towards the door, he saw a cloud rising in the horizon, which appeared to forebode a coming storm. Well, this waistcoat was discovered today, covered with blood, and with a hole over the heart. The ladies screamed and two or three prepared to faint. It was brought to me. No one could guess what the dirty rag could be, I alone suspected that it was the waistcoat of the murdered man. My valet, in examining this mournful relic, felt a paper in the pocket and drew it out. It was a letter addressed to you, Baron, to me? cried Dantlers. Yes, indeed, to you, I succeeded in deciphering your name under the blood with which the letter was stained, replied Monte Cristo, amid the general outburst of amazement, but asked Madame Dandler's, looking at her husband with uneasiness, how could that prevent M. de Vilfort dash, in this simple way? Madame, replied Monte Cristo, the waistcoat and the letter were both what is termed circumstantial evidence, I therefore sent them to the king's attorney. You understand, my dear Baron, that legal methods are the safest in criminal cases, it was, perhaps, some plot against you. Andrea looked steadily at Monte Cristo and disappeared in the second drawing room, possibly, said Dantlers, was not this murdered man an old galley slave? Yes, replied the Count, a felon named Cadraus. Dantlers turned slightly pale, Andrea reached the anteroom beyond the little drawing room, but go on signing, said Monte Cristo, I perceive that my story has caused a general emotion, and I beg to apologize to you, Baroness, and to Mademoiselle Dantlers. The Baroness, who had signed, returned the pen to the notary. Prince Cavalcanti, said the latter, Prince Cavalcanti, where are you? Andrea, Andrea, repeated several young people, who were already on sufficiently intimate terms with him to call him by his Christian name, call the prince, inform him that it is his turn to sign, cried Dantlers to one of the floor keepers, but at the same instant the crowd of guests rushed in alarm into the principal's salon as if some frightful monster had entered the apartments, Guerin's Camdeverit. There was, indeed, reason to retreat, to be alarmed, and to scream. An officer was placing two soldiers at the door of each drawing room and was advancing towards Dandler's, who 
preceded by a commissary of police, girded with his scarf. Madame Dandlers uttered a scream and fainted. Dandlers, who thought himself threatened, certain consciences are never calm. Dandlers even before his guests showed a countenance of abject terror. What is the matter, sir? asked Monte Cristo, advancing to meet the commissioner. Which of you gentlemen, asked the magistrate, without replying to the count, answers to the name of Andrea Cavalcanti. A cry of astonishment was heard from all parts of the room. They searched, they questioned. But who then is Andrea Cavalcanti? asked Dandlers in amazement. A galley slave, escaped from confinement at Toulon. And what crime has he committed? He is accused, said the commissary with his inflexible voice, of having assassinated the man named Cadraus, his former companion in prison, at the moment he was making his escape from the house of the Count of Monte Cristo. Monte Cristo cast a rapid glance around him. Andrea was gone. Chapter 97 The Departure for Belgium A few minutes after the scene of confusion produced in the salons of M. Dandlers by the unexpected appearance of the brigade of soldiers, by the disclosure which had followed, the mansion was deserted with as much rapidity as if a case of plague or of cholera morbus had broken out among the guests. In a few minutes, through all the doors, down all the staircases, at every exit, everyone hastened to retire, or rather to fly, for it was a situation where the ordinary condolences, which even the best friends are so eager to offer in great catastrophes, seemed to be utterly futile. There remained in the banker's house only Dandler's, closeted in his study, and making his statement to the officer of gendarmes, Madame Dandler's, terrified, in the boudoir with which we are acquainted, and Eugenie, who with haughty air and disdainful lip had retired to her room with her inseparable companion, Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly. As for the numerous servants, more numerous that evening than usual, for their number was augmented by cooks and butlers from the Café de Paris, venting on their employers their anger at what they termed the insult to which they had been subjected. They collected in groups in the hall, in the kitchens, or in their rooms, thinking very little of their duty, which was thus naturally interrupted. Of all this household, only two persons deserve our notice. These are Mademoiselle Eugénie Dandlers and Mademoiselle Louise d'Armilly. The betrothed had retired, as we said, with haughty air, disdainful lip, and the demeanour of an outraged queen, followed by her companion, who was paler and more disturbed than herself. On reaching her room Eugenie locked her door, while Louise fell on a chair. Ah, what a dreadful thing, said the young musician, who would have suspected it. M. Andrea Cavalcanti a murderer, a galley slave escaped, a convict. An ironical smile curled the lip of Eugenie. In truth I was fated, said she. I escaped the more surf only to fall into the Cavalcanti. Oh, do not confound the two, Eugenie, hold your tongue. The men are all infamous, and I am happy to be able now to do more than detest them. I despise them, what shall we do? asked Louise, what shall we do? Yes, why, the same we had intended doing three days since, set off, what, although you are not now going to be married, you intend still dash, listen, Louise, I hate this life of the fashionable world, always ordered, measured, ruled, like our music paper, what I have always wished for, desired, and coveted, is the life of an artist, free and independent, relying only on my own resources, and accountable only to myself. Remain here? What for, that they may try, a month hence, to marry me again, and to whom, M. D. Bray, perhaps, as it was once proposed. No, Louise, no. This evening's adventure will serve for my excuse. I did not seek one, I did not ask for one. God sends me this, and I hail it joyfully, how strong and courageous you are, said the fair, frail girl to her brunette companion. Did you not yet know me? Come, Louise, let us talk of our affairs. The post chaise dash, was happily bought three days since, have you had it sent where we are to go for it? Yes, our passport, here it is, and Eugenie, with her usual precision, opened a printed paper, and read, dash, M. Leon Darmely, twenty years of age, profession, artist, hair black, eyes black, travelling with his sister, capital. How did you get this passport, when I went to ask M. De Monte Cristo for letters to the directors of the theatres at Rome and Naples, I expressed my fears of travelling as a woman, he perfectly understood them, and undertook to procure for me a man's passport, and two days after I received this, to which I have added with my own hand, travelling with his sister, well, said Eugenie cheerfully, we have then only to pack up our trunks, we shall start the evening of the signing of the contract, instead of the evening of the wedding, that is all. But consider the matter seriously, Eugenie. Oh, I am done with considering. 
I am tired of hearing only of market reports, of the end of the month, of the rise and fall of Spanish funds, of Haitian bonds. Instead of that, Louise, do you understand, air, liberty, melody of birds, plains of Lombardy, Venetian canals, Roman palaces, the Bay of Naples. How much have we, Louise? The young girl to whom this question was addressed drew from an inlaid secretary a small portfolio with a lock, in which she counted twenty-three bank notes. Twenty-three thousand francs, said she, and as much, at least, in pearls, diamonds, and jewels, said Eugenie. We are rich. With forty-five thousand francs we can live like princesses for two years, and comfortably for four, before six months, you with your music, and I with my voice, we shall double our capital. Come, you shall take charge of the money, I of the jewel box, so that if one of us had the misfortune to lose her treasure, the other would still have hers left. Now, the portmanteau, let us make haste, the portmanteau, stop, said Louise, going to listen at Madame Dangler's door, what do you fear, that we may be discovered, the door is locked, they may tell us to open it, they may if they like, but we will not, you are a perfect Amazon, Eugenie, and the two young girls began to heap into a trunk all the things they thought they should require. There now, said Eugenie, while I change my costume do you lock the portmanteau? Louise pressed with all the strength of her little hands on the top of the portmanteau. But I cannot, said she, I am not strong enough, do you shut it? Ah, you do well to ask, said Eugenie, laughing, I forgot that I was Hercules, and you only the pale and fail. And the young girl, kneeling on the top, pressed the two parts of the portmanteau together and Mademoiselle d'Armelie passed the bolt of the padlock through. When this was done, Eugenie opened a drawer, of which she kept the key, and took from it a wadded violet silk travelling cloak. Here, said she, you see I have thought of everything, with this cloak you will not be cold. But you, oh, I am never cold, you know. Besides, with these men's clothes dash, will you dress here? Certainly, shall you have time? Do not be uneasy, you little coward. All our servants are busy discussing the grand affair. Besides, what is there astonishing, when you think of the grief I ought to be in, that I shut myself up, tell me, no, truly, you comfort me, come and help me, from the same drawer she took a man's complete costume, from the boots to the coat, and a provision of linen, where there was nothing superfluous, but every requisite. Then, the promptitude which indicated that this was not the first time she had amused herself by adopting the garb of the opposite sex, Eugenie drew on the boots and pantaloons, tied her cravat, buttoned her waistcoat up to the throat, and put on a coat which admirably fitted her beautiful figure. Oh, that is very good, indeed, it is very good, said Louise, looking at her with admiration, but that beautiful black hair, those magnificent braids, which made all the ladies sigh with envy. Will they go under a man's hat like the one I see down there? You shall see, said Eugenie. And with her left hand seizing the thick mass, which her long fingers could scarcely grasp, she took in her right hand a pair of long scissors, and soon the steel met through the rich and splendid hair, which fell in a cluster at her feet as she leaned back to keep it from her coat. Then she grasped the front hair, which she also cut off, without expressing the least regret. On the contrary, her eyes sparkled with greater pleasure than usual under her ebony eyebrows, Oh, the magnificent hair, said Louise, with regret, and am I not a hundred times better this? cried Eugenie, smoothing the scattered curls of her hair, which had now quite a masculine appearance, and do you not think me handsomer so? Oh, you are beautiful, always beautiful, cried Louise. Now, where are you going, to Brussels, if you like, it is the nearest frontier. We can go to Brussels, Liege, Aix-la-Chapelle, then up the Rhine to Strasbourg. We will cross Switzerland and go down into Italy by the St. Gothard. Will that do? Yes, what are you looking at? I am looking at you. Indeed you are adorable like that. One would say you were carrying me off, and they would be right, Hardy. Oh, I think you swore, Eugenie. And the two young girls, whom everyone might have thought plunged in grief, the one on her own account, the other from interest in her friend, burst out laughing, as they cleared away every visible trace of the disorder which have naturally accompanied the preparations for their escape. Then, Having blown out the lights, the two fugitives, looking and listening eagerly, with outstretched necks, opened the door of a dressing room which led by a side staircase down to the yard, Eugenie going first, and holding with one arm the portmanteau, which by the opposite handle Mademoiselle d'Armelie scarcely raised with both hands. The yard was empty, the clock was striking twelve. The porter was not yet gone to bed. Eugenie approached softly, and saw the old man sleeping soundly in an armchair in his lodge. 
she returned to Louise, took out the portmanteau, which she had placed for a moment on the ground, and they reached the archway under the shadow of the wall. Eugenie concealed Louise in an angle of the gateway, so that if the porter chanced to awake he might see but one person. Then placing herself in the full light of a lamp which lit the yard, Gate! cried she, with her finest contralto voice, and rapping at the window. The porter got up as Eugenie expected, and even advanced some steps to recognize the person who was going out, but seeing a young man striking his boot impatiently with his riding whip, he opened it immediately. Louise slid through the half-open gate like a snake, and bounded lightly forward. Eugenie, apparently calm, although in all probability her heart beat somewhat faster than usual, went out in her turn. A porter was passing and they gave him the portmanteau, then the two young girls, having told him to take it to number 36, Rue de la Victoire, walked behind this man, whose presence comforted Louise. As for Eugenie, she was as strong as a Judith or a Delilah. They arrived at the appointed spot. Eugenie ordered the porter to put down the portmanteau, gave him some pieces of money, and having wrapped the shutter sent him away. The shutter where Eugenie had wrapped was that of a little laundress, who had been previously warned, and was not yet gone to bed. She opened the door, Mademoiselle, said Eugenie, let the porter get the post chaise from the coach house, and fetch some post horses from the hotel. Here are five francs for his trouble, indeed, said Louise, I admire you, and I could almost say respect you. The laundress looked on in astonishment, but as she had been promised twenty louis, she made no remark. In a quarter of an hour the porter returned with the postboy and horses, which were harnessed, and put in the post chaise in a minute, while the porter fastened the portmanteau on with the assistance of a cordon strap. Here is the passport, said the postillion. Which way are we going, young gentleman, de Fontainebleau, replied Eugenie with an almost masculine voice. What do you say? said Louise. I am giving them the slip, said Eugenie. This woman to whom we have given twenty louis may betray us for forty, we will soon alter our direction. And the young girl jumped into the britska, which was admirably arranged for sleeping in, without scarcely touching the step. You are always right, said the music teacher, seating herself by the side of her friend. A quarter of an hour afterwards the postillion, having been put in the right road, passed with a crack of his whip through the gateway of the barrier Saint Martin. Ah, said Louise, breathing freely, here we are out of Paris. Yes, my dear, the abduction is an accomplished fact, replied Eugenie. Yes, and without violence, said Louise, I shall bring that forward as an extenuating circumstance, replied Eugenie. These words were lost in the noise which the carriage made in rolling over the pavement of Lavalette. M. Dandler's no longer had a daughter, Chapter 98 The Bell and Bottle Tavern, and now let us leave Mademoiselle Dandler's and her friend pursuing their way to Brussels, and return to poor Andrea Cavalcanti so inopportunely interrupted in his rise to fortune. Notwithstanding his youth, Master Andrea was a very skillful and intelligent boy. We have seen that on the first rumour which reached the salon he had gradually approached the door, and crossing two or three rooms at last disappeared. But we have forgotten to mention one circumstance, which nevertheless ought not to be omitted. In one of the rooms he crossed, the trousseau of the bride-elect was on exhibition. There were caskets of diamonds, cashmere shawls, balanchine lace, English veilings, and in fact all the tempting things, the bare mention of which makes the hearts of young girls bound with joy, and which is called the corbel. Now, in passing through this room, Andrea proved himself not only to be clever and intelligent, but also provident, for he helped himself to the most valuable of the ornaments before him, literally, the basket, because wedding gifts were originally brought in such a receptacle, furnished with this blunder, Andrea leapt with a lighter heart from the window, intending to slip through the hands of the gendarmes tall and well proportioned as an ancient gladiator, and muscular as a Spartan. He walked for a quarter of an hour without knowing where to direct his steps, actuated by the sole idea of getting away from the spot where if he lingered he knew that he would surely be taken. Having passed through the room on Tarnablink, guided by the instinct which leads thieves always to take the safest path, he found himself at the end of the Rue Lafayette. There he stopped, breathless and panting. He was quite alone, on one side was the vast wilderness of the saint Lazare on the other, Paris enshrouded in darkness. Am I to be captured? He cried, no, not if I can use more activity than my enemies. My safety is now a mere question of speed. At this moment he saw a cab at the top of the Faubourg Poissier. The dull driver, smoking his pipe, was plodding along toward the limits of the Faubourg Saint Denis, where no doubt he ordinarily had his station. Ha, friend! said Benedetto, what do you want, sir? asked the driver. Is your horse tired, 
Tired? Oh, yes, tired enough, he has done nothing the whole of this blessed day. Four wretched fares, and twenty sous over, making in all seven francs, are all that I have earned, and I ought to take ten to the owner, will you add these twenty francs to the seven you have? With pleasure, sir, twenty francs are not to be despised. Tell me what I am to do for this, a very easy thing, if your horse isn't tired, I tell you he'll go like the wind, only tell me which way to drive, towards the louvers, ah, I know the way, you get good sweetened rum over there, exactly so, I merely wish to overtake one of my friends, with whom I am going to hunt tomorrow at Chapelle and Serval. He should have waited for me here with the cabriolet till half past eleven, it is twelve, and, tired of waiting, he must have gone on, it is likely, well, will you try and overtake him? Nothing I should like better, if you do not overtake him before we reach Begint you shall have twenty francs, if not before Louvers, thirty, and if we do overtake him, forty, said Andrea, after a moment's hesitation, at the end of which he remembered that he might safely promise. That's all right, said the man, hop in, and we're off. Who o o p la? Andrea got into the cab, which passed rapidly through the Faubourg Saint Denis, along the Faubourg Saint Martin, crossed the barrier and threaded its way through the interminable villette. They never overtook the chimerical friend, yet Andrea frequently inquired of people on foot whom he passed and at the inns which were not yet closed, for a green cabriolet and bay horse, and as there are a great many cabriolets to be seen on the road to the low countries, and as nine-tenths of them are green, the inquiries increased at every step. Everyone had just seen it pass, it was only five hundred, two hundred, one hundred steps in advance, at length they reached it, but it was not the friend. Once the cab was also passed by a calash rapidly whirled along by two post-horses. Ah, said Cavalcanti to himself, if I only had that Britska, those two good post-horses, and above all the passport that carries them on. And he sighed deeply. The calash contained Mademoiselle d'Anglers and Mademoiselle d'Armilly. Hurry, hurry, said Andrea, we must overtake him soon. And the poor horse resumed the desperate gallop it had kept up since leaving the barrier, and arrived steaming at Louvers, certainly said Andrea, I shall not overtake my friend, but I shall kill your horse, therefore I had better stop. Here are thirty francs, I will sleep at the red horse, and will secure a place in the first coach. Good night, friend. And Andrea, after placing six pieces of five francs each in the man's hand, leapt lightly onto the pathway. The cabman joyfully pocketed the sum, and turned back on his road to Paris. Andrea pretended to go towards the red horse inn. But after leaning an instant against the door, and hearing the last sound of the cab, which was disappearing from view, he went on his road, and with a lusty stride soon traversed the space of two leagues. Then he rested, he must be near Chapelle and Serval, where he pretended to be going. It was not fatigue that stayed Andrea here, it was that he might form some resolution, adopt some plan. It would be impossible to make use of a diligence, equally so to engage post-horses, to travel either way a passport was necessary. It was still more impossible to remain in the department of the Oies, one of the most open and strictly guarded in France, this was quite out of the question, especially to a man like Andrea, perfectly conversant with criminal matters. He sat down by the side of the moat, buried his face in his hands and reflected. Ten minutes after he raised his head, his resolution was made. He threw some dust over the top coat, which he had found time to unhook from the antechamber and button over his ball costume and going to Chapelle and Serval he knocked loudly at the door of the only inn in the place. The host opened. My friend, said Andrea, I was coming from Montefontaine to Senlis, when my horse, which is a troublesome creature, stumbled in through me. I must reach Compton tonight, or I shall cause deep anxiety to my family. Could you let me hire a horse of you? An innkeeper has always a horse to let, whether it be good or bad. The host called the stable boy, and ordered him to saddle Whitey, then he awoke his son a child of seven years, whom he ordered to ride before the gentleman and bring back the horse. Andrea gave the innkeeper twenty francs, and in taking them from his pocket dropped a visiting card. This belonged to one of his friends at the Café de Paris, so that the innkeeper, picking it up after Andrea had left, was convinced that he had let his horse to the Count of Morley on, 25 Rue Saint-Dominique, that being the name and address on the card. Whitey was not a fast animal, but he kept up an easy, steady pace. In three hours and a half Andrea had traversed the nine leagues which separated him from Kumpkin, and four o'clock struck as he reached the place where the coaches stop. There is an excellent tavern at Kumpkin, well remembered by those who have ever been there. Andrea, who had often stayed there in his rides about Paris, recollected the Bell and Bottle Inn, he turned round, 
saw the sign by the light of a reflected lamp, and having dismissed the child, giving him all the small coin he had about him, he began knocking at the door, very reasonably concluding that having now three or four hours before him he had best fortify himself against the fatigues of the morrow by a sound sleep and a good supper. A waiter opened the door. My friend, said Andrea, I have been dining at St. Gino Boys, and expected to catch the coach which passes by at midnight, but like a fool I have lost my way, and have been walking for the last four hours in the forest. Show me into one of those pretty little rooms which overlook the court, and bring me a cold fowl and a bottle of Bordeaux. The waiter had no suspicions, Andrea spoke with perfect composure. He had a cigar in his mouth, and his hands in the pocket of his top coat, his clothes were fashionably made, his chin smooth, his boots irreproachable, he looked merely as if he had stayed out very late, that was all. While the waiter was preparing his room, the hostess arose, Andrea assumed his most charming smile, and asked if he could have number three, which he had occupied on his last stay at Kumpkin. Unfortunately, Number three was engaged by a young man who was traveling with his sister. Andrea appeared in despair, but consoled himself when the hostess assured him that number seven, prepared for him, was situated precisely the same as number three, and while warming his feet and chatting about the last races at Chantilly, he waited until they announced his room to be ready. Andrea had not spoken without cause of the pretty rooms looking out upon the court of the Bell Tavern, which with its triple galleries like those of a theater, with the jessamine and clematis twining round the light columns forms one of the prettiest entrances to an inn that you can imagine. The fowl was tender, the wine old, the fire clear and sparkling, and Andrea was surprised to find himself eating with as good an appetite as though nothing had happened. Then he went to bed and almost immediately fell into that deep sleep which is sure to visit men of twenty years of age, even when they are torn with remorse. Now, here we are obliged to own that Andrea ought to have felt remorse, but that he did not. This was the plan which had appealed to him to afford the best chance of his security before daybreak he would awake, leave the inn after rigorously paying his bill, and reaching the forest, he would, under pretense of making studies in painting, test the hospitality of some peasants, procure himself the dress of a woodcutter and a hatchet, casting off the lion's skin to assume that of the woodman, then, with his hands covered with dirt, his hair darkened by means of a leaden comb, his complexion embrowned with a preparation for which one of his old comrades had given him the recipe, he intended, by following the wooded districts, to reach the nearest frontier, walking by night and sleeping in the day in the forests and quarries, and only entering inhabited regions to buy a loaf from time to time. Once past the frontier, Andrea proposed making money of his diamonds, and by uniting the proceeds to ten bank notes he always carried about with him in case of accident, he would then find himself possessor of about fifty thousand levers, which he philosophically considered as no very deplorable condition after all. Moreover, he reckoned much on the interest of the Dandlers to hush up the rumor of their own misadventures. These were the reasons which, added to the fatigue, caused Andrea to sleep so soundly. In order that he might awaken early he did not close the shutters, but contented himself with bolting the door and placing on the table an unclasped and long-pointed knife, whose temper he well knew, and which was never absent from him. About seven in the morning Andrea was awakened by a ray of sunlight, which played, warm and brilliant, upon his face in all well-organized brains, the predominating idea, and there always is one, is sure to be the last thought before sleeping, and the first upon waking in the morning. Andrea had scarcely opened his eyes when his predominating idea presented itself, and whispered in his ear that he had slept too long. He jumped out of bed and ran to the window. The gendarme was crossing the court. The gendarme is one of the most striking objects in the world, even to a man void of uneasiness, but for one who has a timid conscience, and with good cause too. The yellow, blue, and white uniform is really very alarming. Why is that gendarme there? asked Andrea of himself. Then, all at once, he replied, with that logic which the reader has, doubtless, remarked in him, there is nothing astonishing in seeing a gendarme at an inn, instead of being astonished, let me dress myself. And the youth dressed himself with a facility his valet de chamber had failed to rob him of during the two months of fashionable life he had led in Paris. Now then, said Andrea, while dressing himself, I'll wait till he leaves, and then I'll slip away. And, saying this, Andrea, who had now put on his boots and cravat, stole gently to the window, and a second time lifted up the muslin curtain. Not only was the first gendarme still there, but the young man now perceived a second yellow, blue, and white uniform at the foot of the staircase, the only one by which he could descend, while a third, on horseback, holding a musket in his fist, posted as a sentinel at the great street door which alone afforded the means of egress. 
The appearance of the third gendarme settled the matter, for a crowd of curious loungers was extended before him, effectually blocking the entrance to the hotel. They're after me, was Andrea's first thought. The devil. A pallor overspread the young man's forehead, and he looked around him with anxiety. His room, like all those on the same floor, had but one outlet to the gallery in the sight of everybody. I am lost, was his second thought, and, indeed, for a man in Andrea's situation, an arrest meant the assizes, trial, and death, death without mercy or delay. For a moment he convulsively pressed his head within his hands, and during that brief period he became nearly mad with terror, but soon a ray of hope glimmered in the multitude of thoughts which bewildered his mind, and a faint smile played upon his white lips and pallid cheeks. He looked around and saw the objects of his search upon the chimney piece. They were a pen, ink, and paper. With forced composure he dipped the pen in the ink, and wrote the following lines upon a sheet of paper, dash, I have no money to pay my bill, but I am not a dishonest man, I leave behind me as a pledge this pin, worth ten times the amount. I shall be excused for leaving at daybreak, for I was ashamed. He then drew the pin from his cravat and placed it on the paper. This done, instead of leaving the door fastened, he drew back the bolts and even placed the door ajar, as though he had left the room, forgetting to close it and slipping into the chimney like a man accustomed to that kind of gymnastic exercise, having effaced the marks of his feet upon the floor, he commenced climbing the only opening which afforded him the means of escape. At this precise time, the first gendarme Andrea had noticed walked upstairs, preceded by the commissary of police, and supported by the second gendarme who guarded the staircase and was himself reinforced by the one stationed at the door. Andrea was indebted for this visit to the following circumstances. At daybreak, the telegraphs were set at work in all directions, and almost immediately the authorities in every district had exerted their utmost endeavours to arrest the murderer of Kadraus. Kumpkin, that royal residence and fortified town, is well furnished with authorities, gendarmes, and commissaries of police, they therefore began operations as soon as the telegraphic dispatch arrived, and the Bell and Bottle being the best known hotel in the town, they had naturally directed their first inquiries there. Now, Besides the reports of the sentinels guarding the Hotel de Ville, which is next door to the Bell and Bottle, it had been stated by others that a number of travellers had arrived during the night. The sentinel who was relieved at six o'clock in the morning, remembered perfectly that just as he was taking his post a few minutes past for a young man arrived on horseback, with a little boy before him. The young man, having dismissed the boy and horse, knocked at the door of the hotel, which was opened, and again closed after his entrance. This late arrival had attracted much suspicion, and the young man being no other than Andrea, the commissary and gendarme, who was a brigadier, directed their steps towards his room. They found the door ajar. Oh, ha, said the brigadier, thoroughly understood the trick, a bad sign to find the door open. I would rather find it triply bolted. And, indeed, the little note and pin upon the table confirmed, or rather corroborated, the sad truth. Andrea had fled. We say corroborated because the brigadier was too experienced to be convinced by a single proof. He glanced around, looked in the bed, shook the curtains, opened the closets, and finally stopped at the chimney. Andrea had taken the precaution to leave no traces of his feet in the ashes, but still it was an outlet, and in this light was not to be passed over without serious investigation. The brigadier sent for some sticks and straw, and having filled the chimney with them, set a light to it. The fire crackled, and the smoke ascended like the dull vapor from a volcano but still no prisoner fell down, as they expected. The fact was, that Andrea, at war with society ever since his youth, was quite as deep as a gendarme, even though he were advanced to the rank of brigadier, and quite prepared for the fire, he had climbed out on the roof and was crouching down against the chimney pots. At one time he thought he was saved, but he heard the brigadier exclaim in a loud voice, to the two gendarmes, he is not here. But venturing to peep, he perceived that the latter, instead of retiring, as might have been reasonably expected upon this announcement, were watching with increased attention. It was now his turn to look about him, the Hotel de Ville, a massive sixteenth-century building, was on his right, anyone could descend from the openings in the tower, and examine every corner of the roof below, and Andrew expected momentarily to see the head of a gendarme appear at one of these openings. If once discovered, he knew he would be lost, for the roof afforded no chance of escape, he therefore resolved to descend, not through the same chimney by which he had come up, by a similar one conducting to another room. He looked around for a chimney from which no smoke issued, and having reached it, he disappeared through the orifice without being seen by anyone. At the same minute, one of the little windows of the Hotel de Ville was thrown open, 
and the head of a gendarme appeared. For an instant it remained emotionless as one of the stone decorations of the building, then after a long sigh of disappointment the head disappeared. The brigadier, calm and dignified as the law he represented, passed through the crowd, without answering the thousand questions addressed to him, and re-entered the hotel. Well? asked the two gendarmes. Well, my boys, said the brigadier, brigand must really have escaped early this morning. But we will send to the villas Coterets and Noyan Roads, and search the forest, when we shall catch him, no doubt. The honorable functionary had scarcely expressed himself thus, in that intonation which is peculiar to brigadiers of the gendarmerie, when a loud scream, accompanied by the violent ringing of a bell, resounded through the court of the hotel. Ah, what is that? cried the brigadier. Some traveller seems impatient, said the host. What number was it that rang? Number three, run, waiter. At this moment the screams and ringing were redoubled. Ah, said the brigadier, stopping the servant, the person who is ringing appears to want something more than a waiter, we will attend upon him with a gendarme. Who occupies number three, the little fellow who arrived last night in a post chaise with his sister, and who asked for an apartment with two beds? The bell here rang for the third time, then other shriek of anguish. Follow me, Mr. Commissary, said the brigadier, tread in my steps. Wait an instant, said the host. Number three has two staircases, inside and outside. Good, said the brigadier. I will take charge of the inside one. Are the carbines loaded? Yes, brigadier. Well, you guard the exterior, and if he attempts to fly, fire upon him. He must be a great criminal, from what the telegraph says. The brigadier, followed by the commissary, disappeared by the inside staircase, accompanied by the noise which his assertions respecting Andrea had excited in the crowd. This is what had happened. Andrea had very cleverly managed to descend two-thirds of the chimney, but then his foot slipped, and notwithstanding his endeavours, he came into the room with more speed and noise than he intended. It would have signified little had the room been empty, but unfortunately it was occupied. Two ladies, sleeping in one bed, were awakened by the noise, and fixing their eyes upon the spot whence the sound proceeded. They saw a man. One of these ladies, the fair one, uttered those terrible shrieks which resounded through the house, while the other, rushing to the bell rope, rang with all her strength. Andrea, as we can see, was surrounded by misfortune, for pity's sake, he cried, pale and bewildered, without seeing whom he was addressing, for pity's sake do not call assistance. Save me, I will not harm you, Andrea, the murderer, cried one of the ladies, Eugenie. Mademoiselle Danglas, exclaimed Andrea, stupefied. Help, help! cried Mademoiselle Darmely, taking the bell from her companion's hand, and ringing it yet more violently. Save me, I am pursued! said Andrea, clasping his hands. For pity, mercy's sake do not deliver me up, it is too late, they are coming, said Eugenie. Well, conceal me somewhere, you can say you were needlessly alarmed, you can turn their suspicions and save my life. The two ladies, pressing closely to one another, and drawing the bedclothes tightly around them, Mained silent to this supplicating voice, repugnance and fear taking possession of their minds. Well, be it so, at length said Eugenie, return by the same road you came, and we will say nothing about you, unhappy wretch. Here he is, here he is, cried a voice from the landing, here he is. I see him. The brigadier had put his eye to the keyhole, and had discovered Andrea in a posture of entreaty. A violent blow from the butt end of the musket burst open the lock, two more forced out the bolts and the broken door fell in. Andrea ran to the other door, leading to the gallery, ready to rush out, but he was stopped short, and he stood with his body a little thrown back, pale, and with a useless knife in his clenched hand. Fly, then! cried Mademoiselle Darmely, whose pity returned as her fears diminished. Fly, or kill yourself! said Eugenie, in a tone which a vestal in the amphitheatre would have used, when urging the victorious gladiator to finish his vanquished adversary. Andrea shuddered and looked on the young girl with an expression which proved how little he understood such ferocious honour. Kill myself? He cried, throwing down his knife, why should I do so? Why, you said, answered Mademoiselle Danglas, that you would be condemned to die like the worst criminals. Bah, said Cavalcanti, crossing his arms, one has friends. The brigadier advanced to him, sword in hand. Come, come, said Andrea, sheathe your sword, my fine fellow, there is no occasion to make such a fuss since I give myself up, and he held out his hands to be manacled. The girls looked with horror upon this shameful metamorphosis, the man of the world shaking off his covering and appearing as a galley slave. Andrea turned towards them, and with an impertinent smile asked, Have you any message for your father, 
Mademoiselle Danplers, for in all probability I shall return to Paris? Eugenie covered her face with her hands. Oh, ho, oh, said Andrea, you need not be ashamed, even though you did post after me. Was I not nearly your husband? And with this raillery Andrea went out, leaving the two girls a prey to their own feelings of shame, and to the comments of the crowd. An hour after they stepped into their calash, both dressed in feminine attire. The gate of the hotel had been closed to screen them from sight, but they were forced, when the door was open, to pass through a throng of curious glances and whispering voices. Eugenie closed her eyes, but though she could not see, she could hear, and the sneers of the crowd reached her in the carriage. Oh, why is not the world a wilderness? she exclaimed, throwing herself into the arms of Mademoiselle Darnley, her eyes sparkling with the same kind of rage which made Nero wish that the Roman world had but one neck, that he might sever it at a single blow. The next day they stopped at the Hotel de Flandre, at Brussels. The same evening Andrea was incarcerated in the Consigiery, Chapter 99 The Law. We have seen how quietly Mademoiselle d'Anglers and Mademoiselle d'Armely accomplished their transformation and flight the fact being that everyone was too much occupied in his or her own affairs to think of theirs. We will leave the banker contemplating the enormous magnitude of his debt before the phantom of bankruptcy, and follow the baroness, who after being momentarily crushed under the weight of the blow which had struck her, had gone to seek her usual adviser, Lucien de Bray. The baroness had looked forward to this marriage as a means of ridding her of a guardianship which, over a girl of Eugenie's character, could not fail to be rather a troublesome undertaking in the tacit relations which maintain the bond of family union. The mother, to maintain her ascendancy over her daughter, must never fail to be a model of wisdom and a type of perfection. Now, Madame d'Anglers feared Eugenie's sagacity and the influence of Mademoiselle d'Armely, she had frequently observed the contemptuous expression with which her daughter looked upon de Bray, an expression which seemed to imply that she understood all her mother's amorous and pecuniary relationships with the intimate secretary. Moreover, she saw that Eugenie detested de Bray, not only because he was a source of dissension and scandal under the paternal roof, but because she had at once classed him in that catalogue of bipeds whom Plato endeavours to withdraw from the appellation of men, and whom Diogenes designated as animals upon two legs without feathers. Unfortunately, in this world of ours, each person views things through a certain medium, and so is prevented from seeing in the same light as others, and Madame Danglars, therefore, very much regretted that the marriage of Eugenie had not taken place not only because the match was good, and likely to injure the happiness of her child, but because it would also set her at liberty. She ran therefore to Debray, who, after having like the rest of Paris witnessed the contract scene and the scandal attending it, had retired in haste to his club, where he was chatting with some friends upon the events which served as a subject of conversation for three-fourths of that city known as the capital of the world, at the precise time when Madame Danglars, dressed in black and concealed in a long veil, was ascending the stairs leading to Debray's apartments, notwithstanding the assurances of the concierge that the young man was not at home, Debray was occupied in repelling the insinuations of a friend, who tried to persuade him that after the terrible scene which had just taken place he ought, as a friend of the family, marry Mademoiselle d'Anglers and her two millions. Debray did not defend himself very warmly, for the idea had sometimes crossed his mind, still, when he recollected the independent, proud spirit of Eugenie he positively rejected it as utterly impossible, though the same thought again continually recurred and found a resting place in his heart. Tea, play, and the conversation, which had become interesting during the discussion of such serious affairs, lasted till one o'clock in the morning. Meanwhile Madame Danglars, veiled and uneasy, awaited the return of Debray in the little green room, seated between two baskets of flowers, which she had that morning sent, and which, it must be confessed, Debray had himself arranged and watered with so much care that his absence was half excused in the eyes of the poor woman. At twenty minutes of twelve, Madame Danglars, tired of waiting, returned home. Women of a certain grade are like prosperous grisettes in one respect. They seldom return home after twelve o'clock. The Baroness returned to the hotel with as much caution as Eugenie used in leaving it. She ran lightly upstairs, and with an aching heart entered her apartment, contiguous, as we know, to that of Eugenie. She was fearful of exciting any remark, and believed firmly in her daughter's innocence and fidelity to the paternal roof. She listened at Eugenie's door, and hearing no sound tried to enter, but the bolts were in place. Madame d'Anglers then concluded that the young girl had been overcome with the terrible excitement of the evening, and had gone to bed and to sleep. She called the maid and questioned her. Mademoiselle Eugenie, said the maid, retired to her apartment with Mademoiselle Darmely, they then took tea together, after which they desired me to leave saying that they needed me no longer. 
Since then the maid had been below, and like everyone else she thought the young ladies were in their own room, Madame Dunkler's, therefore, went to bed without a shadow of suspicion, and began to muse over the recent events. In proportion as her memory became clearer, the occurrences of the evening were revealed in their true light, what she had taken for confusion was a tumult, what she had regarded as something distressing, was in reality a disgrace. And then the Baroness remembered that she had felt no pity for poor Mercedes, who had been afflicted with a severe blow through her husband and son, Eugenie, she said to herself, is lost, and so are we. The affair, as it will be reported, will cover us with shame, for in a society such as ours satire inflicts a painful and incurable wound. How fortunate that Eugenie is possessed of that strange character which has so often made me tremble. And her glance was turned towards heaven, where a mysterious providence disposes all things, and out of a fault, nay, even a vice, sometimes produces a blessing. And then her thoughts, cleaving through space like a bird in the air, rested on Cavalcanti. This Andrea was a wretch, a robber, an assassin, and yet his manners showed the effects of a sort of education, if not a complete one. He had been presented to the world with the appearance of an immense fortune, supported by an honourable name. How could she extricate herself from this labyrinth? To whom would she apply to help her out of this painful situation? De Bray, to whom she had run, with the first instinct of a woman towards the man she loves, and who yet betrays her, De Bray could but give her advice, she must apply to some one more powerful than he. The Baroness then thought of M. De Vilfert. It was M. De Vilfert who had remorselessly brought misfortune into her family, as though they had been strangers. But, no, on reflection, the procurer was not a merciless man, and it was not the magistrate, slave to his duties, but the friend, a loyal friend, who roughly but firmly cut into the very core of the corruption, it was not the executioner, but the surgeon, who wished to withdraw the honour of Dandlers from ignominious association with a disgraced young man they had presented to the world as their son-in-law. And since Vilfert, the friend of Dandlers, had acted in this way, no one could suppose that he had been previously acquainted with, or had lent himself to, any of Andrea's intrigues. Vilfert's conduct, therefore, upon reflection, appeared to the Baroness as if shaped for their mutual advantage. But the inflexibility of the procurer should stop there, she would see him the next day, and if she could not make him fail in his duties as a magistrate, she would, at least, obtain all the indulgence he could allow. She would invoke the past, recall old recollections, she would supplicate him by the remembrance of guilty, yet happy days. M. De Vilfert would stifle the affair, he had only to turn his eyes on one side, and allow Andrea to fly, and follow up the crime under that shadow of guilt called contempt of court. And after this reasoning she slept easily. At nine o'clock next morning she arose, and without ringing for her maid or giving the least sign of her activity, she dressed herself in the same simple style as on the previous night, then running downstairs, she left the hotel walked to the Rue de Provence, called a cab, and drove to M. de Vilfert's house. For the last month this wretched house had presented the gloomy appearance of a lazaretto infected with the plague. Some of the apartments were closed, within and without, the shutters were only open to admit a minute's air, showing the scared face of a footman, and immediately afterwards the window would be closed, like a gravestone falling on a sepulchre, and the neighbours would say to each other in a low voice, Will there be another funeral today at the procurer's house? Madame Dandler's involuntarily shuddered at the desolate aspect of the mansion, ascending from the cab, she approached the door with trembling knees, and rang the bell. Three times did the bell ring with a dull, heavy sound, seeming to participate, in the general sadness, before the concierge appeared and peeped through the door, which he opened just wide enough to allow his words to be heard. He saw a lady, a fashionable, elegantly dressed lady, and yet the door remained almost closed. Do you intend opening the door? said the Baroness. First. Madame, who are you, who am I? You know me well enough, we no longer know anyone. Madame, you must be mad, my friend, said the Baroness, where do you come from? Oh, this is too much. Madame, these are my orders, excuse me. Your name? The Baroness Dandlers, you have seen me twenty times, possibly. Madame. And now, what do you want? Oh, how extraordinary. I shall complain to M. de Vilfert of the impertinence of his servants. Madame. This is precaution, not impertinence, no one enters here without an order from M. of Rhiney, or without speaking to the procurer, well, I have business with the procurer, is it pressing business, you can imagine so, since I have not even brought my carriage out yet, but enough of this, here is my card, take it to your master, madam will await my return, yes, go. The concierge closed the door, leaving madam Dantler's in the street. 
She had not long to wait, directly afterwards the door was opened wide enough to admit her, and when she had passed through, it was again shut. Without losing sight of her for an instant, the concierge took a whistle from his pocket as soon as they entered the court, and blew it. The valet de chamber appeared on the doorsteps. You will excuse this poor fellow, madame, he said, as he preceded the baroness, but his orders are precise, and dem. De Vilfert begged me to tell you that he could not act otherwise. In the court showing his merchandise, was a tradesman who had been admitted with the same precautions. The baroness ascended the steps, she felt herself strongly infected with a sadness which seemed to magnify her own, and still guided by the valet de chamber, who never lost sight of her for an instant, she was introduced to the magistrate's study. Preoccupied as Madame Dantler's had been with the object of her visit, the treatment she had received from these underlings appeared to her so insulting, that she began by complaining of it. But Vilfert, raising his head, bowed down by grief, looked up at her with so sad a smile that her complaints died upon her lips. Forgive my servants, he said, for a terror I cannot blame them for, from being suspected they have become suspicious. Madame Dandler's had often heard of a terror to which the magistrate alluded, but without the evidence of her own eyesight she could never have believed that the sentiment had been carried so far. You too, then, are unhappy? She said. Yes, madame, replied the magistrate, then you pity me, sincerely. Madame, and you understand what brings me here? You wish to speak to me about the circumstance which has just happened? Yes, sir, a fearful misfortune. You mean a mischance, a mischance? Repeated the baroness. Alas, madame, said the procurer with his imperturbable calmness of manner, I consider those alone misfortunes which are irreparable, and do you suppose this will be forgotten? Everything will be forgotten. Madame, said Vilfert. Your daughter will be married tomorrow, if not today, in a week if not tomorrow, and I do not think you can regret the intended husband of your daughter, Madame Dantler's gazed on Vilfert, stupefied to find him so almost insultingly calm. Am I come to a friend? She asked in a tone full of mournful dignity. You know that you are. Madame, said Vilfert, pale cheeks became slightly flushed as he gave her the assurance. And truly this assurance carried him back to different events from those now occupying the Baroness and him. Well, then, be more affectionate, my dear Vilfert, said the Baroness. Speak to me not as a magistrate, but as a friend, and when I am in bitter anguish of spirit, do not tell me that I ought to be gay. Vilfert bowed. When I hear misfortunes named, Madame, he said, I have within the last few months contracted the bad habit of thinking of my own, and then I cannot help drawing up an egotistical parallel in my mind. That is the reason that by the side of my misfortunes yours appear to me mere mischances that is why my dreadful position makes yours appear enviable. But this annoys you, let us change the subject. You were saying, Madame Dash, I came to ask you, my friend, said the Baroness, what will be done with this imposter, imposter, repeated Vilfert, certainly. Madame, you appear to extenuate some cases, and exaggerate others. Imposter, indeed, M. Andrea Cavalcanti, or rather M. Benedetto, is nothing more nor less than an assassin, sir. I do not deny the justice of your correction, but the more severely you arm yourself against that unfortunate man, the more deeply will you strike our family. Come, forget him for a moment, and instead of pursuing him let him go, you are too late. Madame, the orders are issued, well, should he be arrested? Do they think they will arrest him? I hope so, if they should arrest him, I know that sometimes prisoners afford means of escape, will you leave him in prison? The procurer shook his head. At least keep him there till my daughter be married impossible. Madame, justice has its formalities. What, even for me? said the Baroness, half jesting, half in earnest. For all, even for myself among the rest, replied Vilfert. Ah, exclaimed the Baroness, without expressing the ideas which the exclamation betrayed. Vilfert looked at her with a piercing glance which reads the secrets of the heart. Yes, I know what you mean, he said, you refer to the terrible rumours spread abroad in the world the deaths which have kept me in mourning for the last three months, and from which Valentine has only escaped by a miracle, have not happened by natural means, I was not thinking of that, replied Madame Dantler's quickly. Yes, you were thinking of it, and with justice. You could not help thinking of it, and saying to yourself, you, who pursue crime so vindictively, answer now, why are there unpunished crimes in your dwelling? The Baroness became pale. You were saying this, were you not? Well, I own it. I will answer you. Vilfert drew his armchair nearer to Madame Dandler's, then resting both hands upon his desk he said in a voice more hollow than usual, 
There are crimes which remain unpunished because the criminals are unknown, and we might strike the innocent instead of the guilty, but when the culprits are discovered, Vilfert here extended his hand toward a large crucifix placed opposite to his desk, when they are discovered, I swear to you, by all I hold most sacred, that whoever they may be they shall die. Now, after the oath I have just taken, and which I will keep. Madame, dare you ask for mercy for that wretch, but, sir, are you sure he is as guilty as they say? Listen, this is his description, Benedetto, condemned, at the age of sixteen, for five years to the galleys for forgery. He promised well, as you see, first a runaway, then an assassin, and who is this wretch, who can tell, a vagabond, a Corsican. Has no one owned him, no one, his parents are unknown, but who is the man who brought him from Lucca, another rascal like himself, perhaps his accomplice. The Baroness clasped her hands. Vilfert, she exclaimed in her softest and the most captivating manner, for heaven's sake. Madame, said Vilfert, the firmness of expression not altogether free from harshness, for heaven's sake, do not ask pardon of me for a guilty wretch. What am I? The law. Has the law any eyes to witness your grief? Has the law is to be melted by your sweet voice? Has the law a memory for all those soft recollections you endeavor to recall? No. Madame, the law has commanded, and when it commands it strikes. You will tell me that I am a living being, and not a code, a man, and not a volume. Look at me. Madame, look around me. Have mankind treated me as a brother? Have they loved me? Have they spared me? Has anyone shown the mercy towards me that you now ask at my hands? No. Madame, they struck me, always struck me, woman, siren that you are. Do you persist in fixing on me that fascinating eye, which reminds me that I ought to blush? Well, be it so, let me blush for the faults you know, and perhaps, perhaps for even more than those. But having sinned myself, and maybe more deeply than others, I never rest till I have torn the disguises from my fellow creatures, and found out their weaknesses. I have always found them, and more, I repeat it with joy, with triumph, I have always found some proof of human perversity or error. Every criminal I condemn seems to me living evidence that I am not a hideous exception to the rest. Alas, 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 all the world is wicked, let us therefore strike at wickedness. Vilfert pronounced these last words with a feverish rage, which gave a ferocious eloquence to his words. But said Madame Dunkler's, resolving to make a last effort, this young man, though a murderer, is an orphan, abandoned by everybody, so much the worse, or rather, so much the better, it has been so ordained that he may have none to weep his fate, but this is trampling on the weak, sir, the weakness of a murderer, his dishonor reflects upon us, is not death in my house, oh, sir, exclaimed the baroness, you are without pity for others, well, then, I tell you they will have no mercy on you, be it so, said Vilfert, raising his arms to heaven, at least, delay the trial till the next assizes, we shall then have six months before us. No, madame, said Vilfert, instructions have been given. There are yet five days left, five days are more than I require. Do you not think that I also long for forgetfulness? While working night and day, I sometimes lose all recollection of the past, and then I experience the same sort of happiness I can imagine the dead feel, still, it is better than suffering, but, sir, he was fled, let him escape, inaction is a pardonable offence. I tell you it is too late, early this morning the telegraph was employed, and at this very minute dash, sir, said the valet de chamber, entering the room, a dragoon has brought this dispatch from the minister at the interior. Vilfert seized the letter, and hastily broke the seal. Madame Dangles trembled with fear, Vilfert started with joy. Arrested. He exclaimed, he was taken at Kumpkin, and all is over. Madame Dangles rose from her seat, pale and cold. Adieu, sir, she said. Adieu, madame, replied the king's attorney, as in an almost joyful manner he conducted her to the door. Then, turning to his desk, he said, striking the letter with the back of his right hand, Come, I had a forgery, three robberies, and two cases of arson, I only wanted a murder, and here it is. It will be a splendid session. Chapter 100 The Apparition As the procurer had told Madame Dandler's, Valentine was not yet recovered. Bowed down with fatigue, she was indeed confined to her bed and it was in her own room, and from the lips of Madame de Vilfert, that she heard all the strange events we have related, we mean the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Andrea Cavalcanti, or other Benedetto, together with the accusation of murder pronounced against him. But Valentine was so weak that this recital scarcely produced the same effect it would have done had she been in her usual state of health. Indeed, 
her brain was only the seat of vague ideas, and confused forms, mingled with strange fancies, alone presented themselves before her eyes. During the daytime Valentine's perceptions remained tolerably clear, owing to the constant presence of M. Noyertia, who caused himself to be carried to his granddaughter's room, and watched her with his paternal tenderness. Vilfert also, on his return from the law courts, frequently passed an hour or two with his father and child. At six o'clock Vilfert retired to his study, at eight m. Devryani himself arrived, bringing the night draft prepared for the young girl, and then M. Noyertia was carried away. A nurse of the doctor's choice succeeded them, and never left till about ten or eleven o'clock, when Valentine was asleep. As she went downstairs she gave the keys of Valentine's room to M. de Vilfert, so that no one could reach the sick room excepting through that of Madame de Vilfert and little Edward. Every morning Morrell called on Noyertia to receive news of Valentine, and, extraordinary as it seemed, each day found him less uneasy. Certainly, though Valentine still labored under dreadful nervous excitement, she was better, and moreover, Monte Cristo had told him when, half distracted, he had rushed to the Count's house, that if she were not dead in two hours she would be saved. Now four days had elapsed, and Valentine still lived. The nervous excitement of which we speak pursued Valentine even in her sleep, or rather in that state of somnolence which succeeded her waking hours, it was then, in the silence of night, in the dim light shed from the alabaster lamp on the chimney piece, that she saw the shadows pass and repass which hover over the bed of sickness, and fan the fever with their trembling wings. First she fancied she saw her stepmother threatening her, then Morrell stretched his arms towards her, sometimes mere strangers, like the Count of Monte Cristo came to visit her, even the very furniture, in these moments of delirium, seemed to move, and this state lasted till about three o'clock in the morning, when a deep, heavy slumber overcame the young girl, from which she did not awake till daylight. On the evening of the day on which Valentine had learned of the flight of Eugenie and the arrest of Benedetto, Vilfert having retired as well as Noyertia and Devrini, her thoughts wandered in a confused maze, alternately reviewing her own situation and the events she had just heard. Eleven o'clock had struck. The nurse, having placed the beverage prepared by the doctor within reach of the patient, and locked the door, was listening with terror to the comments of the servants in the kitchen, and storing her memory with all the horrible stories which had for some months past amused the occupants of the antechambers in the house of the king's attorney. Meanwhile an unexpected scene was passing in the room which had been so carefully locked. Ten minutes had elapsed since the nurse had left, Valentine, who for the last hour had been suffering from the fever which returned nightly, incapable of controlling her ideas, was forced to yield to the excitement which exhausted itself in producing and reproducing a succession and recurrence of the same fancies and images. The night lamp threw out countless rays, each resolving itself into some strange form to her disordered imagination, when suddenly by its flickering light Valentine thought she saw the door of her library, which was in the recess by the chimney piece, open slowly, though she in vain listened for the sound of the hinges on which it turned. At any other time Valentine would have seized the silken bell pull and summoned assistance, but nothing astonished her in her present situation. Her reason told her that all the visions she beheld were but the children of her imagination, and the conviction was strengthened by the fact that in the morning no traces remained of the nocturnal phantoms, who disappeared with the coming of daylight. From behind the door a human figure appeared, but the girl was too familiar with such apparitions to be alarmed, and therefore only stared, hoping to recognize Morrell. The figure advanced towards the bed and appeared to listen with profound attention. At this moment a ray of light glanced across the face of the midnight visitor. It is not he, she murmured, and waited, in the assurance that this was but a dream, for the man to disappear or assume some other form. Still, she felt her pulse and finding it throb violently she remembered that the best method of dispelling such illusions was to drink, for a draught of the beverage prepared by the doctor to allay her fever seemed to cause a reaction of the brain, and for a short time she suffered less. Valentine therefore reached her hand towards the glass, but as soon as her trembling arm left the bed the apparition advanced more quickly towards her, and approached the young girl so closely that she fancied she heard his breath, and felt the pressure of his hand, this time the illusion, or rather the reality surpassed anything Valentine had before experienced, she began to believe herself really alive and awake, and the belief that her reason was this time not deceived made her shudder. The pressure she felt was evidently intended to arrest her arm, and she slowly withdrew it. Then the figure, from whom she could not detach her eyes, and who appeared more protecting than menacing, took the glass, and walking towards the nightlight held it up, as if to test its transparency. This did not seem sufficient, the man, or rather the ghost, but he trod so softly that no sound was heard, 
then poured out about a spoonful into the glass, and drank it. Valentine witnessed this scene with a sentiment of stupefaction. Every minute she had expected that it would vanish and give place to another vision, but the man, instead of dissolving like a shadow, again approached her, and said in an agitated voice, Now you may drink. Valentine shuddered. It was the first time one of these visions had ever addressed her in a living voice, and she was about to utter an exclamation. The man placed his finger on her lips. The Count of Monte Cristo. She murmured. It was easy to see that no doubt now remained in the young girl's mind as to the reality of the scene. Her eyes started with terror, her hands trembled, and she rapidly drew the bedclothes closer to her. Still, the presence of Monte Cristo at such an hour, is mysterious, fanciful, and extraordinary entrance into her room through the wall, might well seem impossibilities to her shattered reason. Do not call anyone, do not be alarmed, said the Count, do not let a shade of suspicion or uneasiness remain in your breast, the man standing before you, Valentine, for this time it is no ghost, is nothing more than the tenderest father and the most respectful friend you could dream of, Valentine could not reply, the voice which indicated the real presence of a being in the room, alarmed her so much that she feared to utter a syllable, still the expression of her eyes seemed to inquire, if your intentions are pure, why are you here? The Count's marvellous sagacity understood all that was passing in the young girl's mind, listen to me, he said, or, rather, look upon me, look at my face, paler even than usual, and my eyes, red with weariness, for four days I have not closed them, for I have been constantly watching you, to protect and preserve you for Maximilian. The blood mounted rapidly to the cheeks of Valentine, for the name just announced by the Count dispelled all the fear with which his presence had inspired her. Maximilian! she exclaimed, and so sweet did the sound appear to her, she repeated it, Maximilian, has he then owned all to you, everything? He told me your life was his, and I have promised him that you shall live, you have promised him that I shall live, yes, but, sir, you spoke of vigilance and protection. Are you a doctor? Yes, the best you could have at the present time, believe me. But you say you have watched? said Valentine uneasily, where have you been, I have not seen you. The Count extended his hand towards the library. I was hidden behind the door, he said, which leads into the next house, which I have rented. Valentine turned her eyes away, and, with an indignant expression of pride and modest fear, exclaimed, Sir, I think you have been guilty of an unparalleled intrusion, and that what you call protection is more like an insult, Valentine, he answered, during my long watch over you, all I have observed has been what people visited you, what nourishment was prepared and what beverage was served, then, when the latter appeared dangerous to me, I entered, as I have now done, and substituted, in the place of the poison, a healthful draught, which, instead of producing the death intended, caused life to circulate in your veins, poison, death, exclaimed Valentine, half believing herself under the influence of some feverish hallucination, what are you saying, sir, hush, my child, said Monte Cristo, again placing his finger upon her lips, I did say poison and death. But drink some of this, and the Count took a bottle from his pocket, containing a red liquid, of which he poured a few drops into the glass. Drink this, and then take nothing more tonight. Valentine stretched out her hand, but scarcely had she touched the glass when she drew back in fear. Monte Cristo took the glass, drank half its contents, and then presented it to Valentine, who smiled and swallowed the rest. Oh, yes, she exclaimed. I recognize the flavor of my nocturnal beverage which refreshed me so much, and seemed to ease my aching brain. Thank you, sir, thank you, this is how you have lived during the last four nights, Valentine, said the Count. But, oh, how I passed that time. Oh, the wretched hours I have endured. The torture to which I have submitted when I saw the deadly poison poured into your glass, and how I trembled lest you should drink it before I could find time to throw it away, sir, said Valentine, at the height of her terror. You say you endured tortures when you saw the deadly poison poured into my glass, but if you saw this, you must also have seen the person who poured it, yes. Valentine raised herself in bed, and drew over her chest, which appeared whiter than snow. The embroidered cambric, still moist with the cold dews of delirium, to which were now added those of terror. You saw the person? Repeated the young girl. Yes, repeated the Count, what you tell me is horrible, sir. You wish to make me believe something too dreadful. What, attempt to murder me in my father's house, in my room, on my bed of sickness? Oh, leave me, sir, you are tempting me, you make me doubt the goodness of providence, it is impossible, 
It cannot be. Are you the first that this hand has stricken? Have you not seen M. de Saint Meron, Madame de Saint Meron, Arois, all fall? Would not M. Noyertier also have fallen a victim, had not the treatment he has been pursuing for the last three years neutralized the effects of the poison? Oh, heaven, said Valentine, is this the reason why Grandpapa has made me share all his beverages during the last month? And have they all tasted of a slightly bitter flavor, like that of dried orange peel? Oh, yes, yes, then that explains all, said Monte Cristo. Your grandfather knows, then, that a poisoner lives here, perhaps he even suspects the person. He has been fortifying you, his beloved child, against the fatal effects of the poison, which has failed because your system was already impregnated with it. But even this would have availed little against a more deadly medium of death employed four days ago, which is generally but too fatal. But who, then, is this assassin? This murderer, let me also ask you a question. Have you never seen anyone enter your room at night? Oh, yes, I have frequently seen shadows pass close to me, approach, and disappear, but I took them for visions raised by my feverish imagination, and indeed when you entered I thought I was under the influence of delirium. Then you do not know who it is that attempts your life? No, said Valentine, who could desire my death. You shall know it now, then, said Monte Cristo, listening. How do you mean? said Valentine, looking anxiously around, because you are not feverish or delirious tonight, but thoroughly awake, midnight is striking, which is the hour murderers choose, oh, heavens, exclaimed Valentine, wiping off the drops which ran down her forehead, midnight struck slowly and sadly, every hour seemed to strike with leaden weight upon the heart of the poor girl, Valentine, said the Count, summon up all your courage, still the beatings of your heart, do not let a sound escape you, and faint to be asleep, then you will see. Valentine seized the Count's hand. I think I hear a noise, she said, leave me, goodbye, the present, replied the Count, walking upon tiptoe towards the library door, and smiling with an expression so sad and paternal that the young girl's heart was filled with gratitude. Before closing the door he turned around once more, and said, not a movement, not a word, let them think you asleep, or perhaps you may be killed before I have the power of helping you and with this fearful injunction the Count disappeared through the door, which noiselessly closed after him.